But... Well, hi there. Greetings and salutations. It's Dave Duford here at DeFord Insurance Group. We're doing it live. Hope you guys have had a fantastic morning. Welcome. You are on my uh, final expense face-to-face -face training spectacular where I will be giving and teaching you my entire final expense face-to-face -face training. And I'm super excited to have you all here. Thank you so much for taking time on your busy Friday to be here to learn more about how to sell final expense successfully. So a couple of things I want to get into before we get started. This is kind of like a new type of training that I'm doing. Um, I've done courses in the past where I would basically charge you guys a fee to come attend. And now what I've done or kind of testing with is, is turning the monetization model over to vendors and sponsors to have them foot the bill for my time to teach you and make the training free and available to whether or not you're in my agency or not. So uh, I want to make sure to thank our special sponsors here before we get started today. We're going to go over the itinerary, what to expect. This is going to be literally everything that I teach my agents and my agency. I'm going to give you everything without pulling any stops. So again, if you're interested in selling final expense or you are selling final expense, you're frustrated selling final expense and you need some advice and some training because your IMO or agency just doesn't provide it, then this is the training for you. So a couple of uh, uh, thank yous here. First of all, uh, thank you specifically to iLife, Trinity Family Benefit Life, as well as Security National Life for sponsoring this uh, wonderful training you're about to get into. So please make sure to check out their stuff their websites, all of what they have to offer. We will have some sponsorship segments to give me a breather uh, that we've pre-recorded that will play that will last about 20 to 30 minutes uh, in length. So that will be coming. Those will be great education on the how the products and carriers work. So make sure you stick around for that. A couple other things, very, very important here. Um, I have some material to share with you just to get started. So uh, we're gonna be doing, like I said, a deep dive into the scripting, the training, and basically everything. And I wanna make sure that you guys have all of the resources uh, at your uh, ready uh, as we go into it. So um, again, like I said, I'm giving literally all of it away. So I want you to, for those of you who are alive, check out the chat. You're gonna go to davidduford.com forward slash scripts. Uh, if you go there, you should see a pop-up that comes up. If you put in your email, you'll get access to everything that we're gonna see today. Again, the full, face-to-face -face presentation, appointment setting script, door knocking script, resources that we actually use in the presentation. There's probably some other stuff. I think like the inflation talk, we'll get into that more later. Literally everything that I have available to my agents is gonna be at that link. There's nothing to buy. Yes, you gotta put your email in. Um, but in exchange, you're gonna get something of worth. So again, that's davidduford.com forward slash scripts and then you will uh, get access to the information there. Is this recorded? Hey, uh, Dio, uh, yes it is. So actually, am I actually recording this on my, I'm not recording it here, but YouTube's recording it. So the cool thing is, is we're gonna go over exactly what we're gonna cover here um, in a moment, uh, but this is something, if you gotta pop off and come back, 100% fine to come back and watch at a later date. It is all going to be recorded and indefinitely available on YouTube as well. So this isn't something that, I'm just recording or they're doing live and they're gonna pull off. It's absolutely gonna be available for as long as YouTube exists. Thank you, Mark, Rich, Mark, uh, appreciate you. Yeah, I'm dressed up for this event, I have to be. This is a very special one. So uh, don't ask me what I'm wearing for pants though. <laughs> it might be a little surprising. <laughs> okay, last thing I'll, I'll say here. Now this is something that's totally optional. You do not have to do this, but I'm going to make it uh, something that is uh, available if you feel the urge to do it. There's something on YouTube called Super Chats. If you feel like you would like to pay me for uh, as a way to say thank you for some amount of money, if you look at the bottom of the chat, you'll see the dollar sign. You can click that sign and then decide how much money you want to give me in exchange for saying thanks for the information. Uh, I'll make sure to answer your comment that you have along with that uh, money you're providing. Uh, again, completely optional. I don't need your money, but if you'd like to, I just wanted to make it available to you uh, as we go through the training. Thank you very much, Mark, Lear, and everybody else. 
Um, and then there's also, for those who are watching the record today, what's called Super Thanks. You can essentially do the same thing. Uh, give me your money and then leave a comment, okay? All right, so now let's get to the, uh, you're welcome, Andy. Thanks for being here, appreciate you, man. So let's get to what we're gonna cover here. Um, I don't have preset notions of the time that's going to take for each of these modules. The kind of way I'm going into this is that I'm just gonna take as much time as I feel in the moment that we need to cover this material. And then kind of base, thank you, Mark, appreciate it. Mark is uh, show, showing the example of what to expect here. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, I'm gonna take as much time as, as I think is necessary to explain the concepts, to walk through the details, and just as importantly, answer your questions at the end of each segment. We will probably take, I don't know if so much in the beginning, but we'll probably take little breaks here and there just to kind of give ourselves a breather. Um, again, if you if you need to go over this, which is great, it's all recorded, right? So if you just save this link and come back to it, yeah, you can absolutely watch it. So yeah, David, I won't be able to watch first three hours come work, no problem. Just come back to this exact same link that you're on, everybody here, and you'll be able to watch it at your leisure. So um, that's how we're gonna do it. And then a couple hours in, every couple hours, we're gonna play one of the sponsors' uh, videos so that you guys can watch that. That'll give me a little <clears throat> break. I already losing my voice, I hope not. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lewis. I hope you're doing all right. Um, and then, yeah, so we'll just kind of work through this. I'm figuring we'll be done around six Eastern. So about approximately seven hours and 50 minutes from now, maybe a little earlier, maybe a little longer. I mean, I don't care. My kids are out of the house. My wife's doing something tonight. My mother-in-law is watching the little ones. So you're mine or I'm yours, I guess. So, uh, there we have it. Wonderful. Uh, let's see what else did I want to cover? Something else important, but it just escaped my mind. Uh, I've, I've solicited you for money, check. You've got davidduford.com forward slash scripts, right? That's uh, pretty critical, so make sure that you have that available. Um, I think that's probably the, oh yeah, the, what are we gonna actually talk about? That's, <laughs> that's also pretty important. So let's go over this really quickly. Um, and then what I'll do, by the way, in the recording of this, if you're watching this in the beginning, either in the comments or the descriptions, I'm going to have a um, time slot for each of the segments. So let's say you don't care about listening to appointment setting. You want to listen to door knocking. You can just click that and then watch that and then skip the rest, right? So you'll be able to conveniently work through this stuff. I'm doing it live, so I can't do that right now because you know I already told you. I don't know how long it's going to go. It goes as long as it needs to. So, uh, But look for that if you're watching recording to kind of get to the point of what it is that you had to actually want to watch more than others. Of course, watch the whole thing. I think it, this in its entirety is going to be extremely useful to, to you. So, okay, let's get started. So here's what we're going to be starting with first. First of all, we're going to be doing appointment setting. Okay, so this the focus of this training is face-to-face -face training. Um, what matters most to me in this particular training, this, um, I don't module, this thing we're doing today, is really focusing on the betterment and the improvement of the skill set for the face-to-face -face final expense agent. If you're a telesales agent, some of this stuff won't be relevant, and it's going to be the stuff right in the beginning. But coming back as we get into the presentation, business retention strategies, et cetera, it's absolutely relevant and uh, something you can directly uh, use and implement in your final expense telesales business. But I want to be upfront, uh, kind of just to clarify for anybody jumping on this call, what to exactly to expect. This is going to be a conversation geared towards predominantly the final expense face-to-face -face agent, although 80% plus of this is absolutely going to be relevant to telesales. Wonderful. Yeah, if you get some, if you're getting, um, if you're getting like uh, blank pages on the scripts thing, that happens to some people. I don't know what it is. Try to see if you can put your spam blocker off and see if you can access it that way. If you can't, do me a favor. Go to uh, email me at support at com. And what I'll do in between these segments, I'll pull up your email and I'll or I'll get somebody else to email you the actual scripting so you can bypass the opt-in there. Um, so again, if you're not getting access to those scripts, David uh, uh, support at davidduford.com uh, will get your messages and in between segments, it may take a little bit, I will make sure personally that you get all this material for free. Yeah, check your email, Lear. Sometimes it may not refresh on your screen. Um, but it will be sent to your email, okay? All right, so here's what we're gonna be talking about today. The first segment we're gonna be going into detail about is the appointment setting. Uh, this is critically important as well as door knocking too. 
We're going to talk about scripting, proper scripting, tonality on the phone to get in the door, and uh, the common objections that you're going to hear. Uh, again, if you have davidufour.com forward slash scripts pulled up in your email or in front of you after you input your uh, email, you will see scripts. I'll share these on the screen too, guys, so um, make, I'll make sure to share it that way visually as well. So the goal of the appointment setting, of course, is to master the process of setting appointments to go sell people in person. And we're going to give you all the steps to do that successfully. Next, we're going to be looking at door knocking, which is very similar to appointment setting. Obviously, it's in person, not over the phone. Same strategy there. We'll talk about scripting, the common objections that you're going to hear, and then um, practicing it and giving you some advice on door knocking itself to get the most out of the business. Then we're going to go into a deep dive on the presentation. So I have what's called a four-stage uh, final expense face-to-face -face presentation. Um, I used to call it the Socratic diplomatic process because it's very open-ended, question-oriented. I think there's no better way to get somebody to buy than ask them questions and lead them to the obvious conclusion that they need to buy. So we're going to go break down in detail every single step of the presentation so that you have the competence and therefore the confidence to sell your prospects, offer them the best plan that's available, and then close them without ever having to apply any like nasty pressure or you know, uh, you know, uh, making them feel bad if they don't buy or something like you don't need to do that. You don't want to do that, as we'll talk about later. Specifically, we're going to talk about rapport building. We're going to go through the process of rapport building, how to build a connection with the prospect, what really matters. We're then going to talk about pre-qualifying, fact finding. This is the most important part of the script in the presentation. How do you gain somebody's, uh, understand somebody's why? What motivates them? Why now do they want to buy final expense? What happens if they don't to paint the picture? This is a very critical step that the vast majority of agents skip entirely. But mastering this part is going to make your business that much better. So we'll talk about that. Then we'll get into it underwriting. So one of the things we do is initially begin to underwrite our prospect with my methodology. We don't fully underwrite, but we do enough that will make sure to um, figure out if the client's eligible for first day full coverage or a graded product or something like that. We will also share with you uh, my much beloved final expense cheat sheet. Again, that's at davidufordcom forward slash scripts. Again, if you're not able to load that up on the page somehow, I'm, I apologize. It might be something like a, a pop-up blocker. Just shoot me a message at support at davidufordcom I'll personally make sure that you get it if you cannot pull it up like what I've described. So we'll have, your, we'll have a cheat sheet. We'll kind of show you how that works to figure out your client's information. We'll even do some sample cases with you so you can learn how to use the cheat sheet and navigate your way around so that you can figure out you know, which options are best for your clients. Uh, positioning. We're going to talk about scripting and training on how to position what it is that you do as being far superior, thus the obvious choice, relative to the crap that's uh, hustled by a lot of the uh, junk mail and TV commercial life insurance companies. So we'll go over um, what we're trying to accomplish, walk through the script, and kind of give you the mentality and the mindset and the training necessary to make it obvious to the client that buying from you is the best solution. Then we're gonna talk about closing, handling objections and cooling down. Of course, you gotta know how to present and close when it comes to final expense. You gotta know how to get their money with confidence and the client's confidence too. And you gotta know how to uh, rebuttal objections. You will hear those, even the best agents hear objections, and you have to be prepared for if that occurs and know what to say and how to say it. Again, we'll have scripting uh, available to you. We'll show it on the screen. We'll walk you through it and get you prepared. Uh, then we're going to go talk into replacement training. This is a critically important training, especially for those of you who are independent agents that broker multiple companies. You have to know how to do detective work on the policies that you review. Lots of people have garbage life insurance. It's either going to terminate at a certain age. It's either going to uh, explode in price because it's a universal life plan that is just properly underfunded, was many years ago. Uh, or they've been um, sold some bill of goods life insurance company that's five times more, maybe not that much more, but significantly more expensive than what it is that you have to offer. Maybe they were given something before their health conditions that they could do better with you. You've got to know how to overcome and find that stuff. And we want to make sure that uh, we give you the training necessary to uncover it and uh, be able to position the life insurance uh, successfully. So 
there will be that coming as well. Business retention strategies, one of the biggest concerns, complaints, frustrations in this business for the agent who's been around in the business is somebody who has, is dealing with chargebacks, right? I mean, I've had chargebacks. You probably have chargebacks if you've been in this business three months. Uh, it is a frustrating experience, but it is something you can deal with and you will learn how to minimize. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the process to minimize chargebacks, what happens when a lapse happens, and how to best manage that kind of uh, experience so that you can, as much as possible, you cannot eliminate chargebacks entirely, but marginalize or minimize them. We'll also talk about leads for final expense. If you're wondering about which leads are best for final expense agents, we'll have a segment on the different options out there, the pros and the cons of each, what you can expect for cost. I'll answer your questions, of course, on leads. Then we'll talk about um, scaling to 10000 a week uh, in final expense business. I'm going to give you my whole kind of perspective and strategy to do that um, and, and how to make it work, uh, why it's so important what to get or what to have with you out in the field, the prep work necessary uh, to make sure that you're never in a position where you can't write business because you don't have what's necessary to carry with you. And then last but not least, we will have our open mic Q&A call where if there's any more questions, which there probably will be, and that's completely fine, I will answer them for probably the hour, hour and a half. If my brain is not entirely fried uh, from this talk and somewhere in between all of this, We'll play some of these sponsor videos for you. Again, special thanks to Security National, iLife, and Trinity Family Benefit. And thank you guys so much. You have now, even within the first, what are we, 15 minutes of this call, I've reached the highest amount of live streamers I've ever had, of over 200 live streams. Let me yell at my son. Hey, Dave, we got 200 live streams. Got 200 viewers. Now, he, he might think it's impressive. I tried to impress my son a little bit. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, well, let me take a sip of coffee and we're going to get into appointment setting. So here it comes. All right, so appointment setting. I had this epiphany um, somewhere along the lines in the last six months. Uh, I, my training is a living, breathing document, okay? Like it's not static. It's not uh, prone to not adapting with the times. Or changing based off of what it is that I learn. And this is true for all of my training. Much of what I do today is even different than in my official guide to selling final expense life insurance book. But um, this one, um, this has changed for me a lot. And it's, it's reflective upon some observations, just training agents in my agency for many years on the appointment setting. Um, it's changed for me a lot on really just thinking about my father and his success in business. If you guys don't know, my father used to run and own what's called Dukem uh, back in the 90s and 2000s, and he sold out to Ecolab uh, for a lot, a lot of money uh, after really just giving his life for two decades to the cause and uh, made out very well, retired very wealthy at 48 or 49, I think dad was. And it was funny, one of the things I asked him in getting started in the sales business was the importance, like what matters the most when we look at sales as a whole. You know, there's different elements to the sales process. You've got the presentation, the fact finding, right? Um, and this is true no matter what it is that you sell. And Dave told, or dad told me, he said, Dave, he said, the most important thing, half the battle is won when you get in the door. And what he meant by that is that so much depends upon getting in the door of a prospect's business. In his case, these were food manufacturers that maybe had bacteria problems, you know, stuff that you don't probably or me want to know about in detail, but they needed stuff fixed and they needed the advice of a professional. And if they could get in the door, then every the opportunities were exponentially better. Even if the, the salesperson wasn't the greatest, they are in the door. They're in the ear of the prospect. The prospect is listening and they've obviously let them in. So there must be some kind of interest or need. And it's from that point, if the agent or the rep in this case with dad could go, just get in the door, so much more opportunity was actually prevalent in the ability to uh, sell, uh, in this case, uh, consultation and chemicals to clean the facility. And that's why for me, number one, appointment setting is critically the most foundational training you guys can do. We're gonna talk in detail about the presentation training. We're gonna talk in detail about other matters as well. But none of that, and I want you to, if you take a note here today, if there's one note to take, it's this. Nothing matters until you can get in the door, okay? 
I don't care if your presentation is better and more charismatic than Tony Robbins. If you cannot get in the door, it's all for nothing. So when you have this time spent on what it is that you're going to practice, you need to know everything we're talking about. It takes a long time to adapt and emulate and, and, and basically duplicate it. But some parts of the skill set that you need to learn are more important than others. It's just the way it is. And when we're talking about sales, specifically final expense face-to-face -face sales, you will get a lot more mileage, a ton, with practicing repetitively till you're bored to death, until your spouse drives you crazy after all the role playing you did with him or her, on the appointment setting and the door knocking process. The ability for you to be uh, incredibly successful in this business, to me, predominantly depends on your ability to be good on the phone, setting that appointment, or good in front of the prospect at the door and getting into an appointment. So this is what matters most, ladies and gentlemen. If you take anything from this, you should be practicing this. You should be doing role playing. Uh, you should have somebody critiquing or reviewing it. This is a big deal at the Ford Insurance Group. I want to hear this stuff because what happens is if you don't dial this in as perfect as possible as a new agent, nothing else matters. If you can't get in the door, you're not going to present or close a thing. Does it make sense, everybody? I hope it does. I, I want you really to understand how incredibly important this is. You've got to be good on the phone setting appointments or you got to be, and really, good door knocking. So with that said, uh, what we're going to be doing is actually pulling up the um, scripting now for the appointment setting. And uh, we're going to be going over the script itself, uh, what to say, how to say it, and then what objections that you're going to be experiencing. So I'm pulling this up on the screen here. So just give me a moment and uh, let's download this and play it here. And I will, uh, what's cool is I've got this new setup now where I can just press this button and boom, look at that, isn't that cool? Now I'm like a small screen. Uh, you can see the script, hopefully. Let me check on my lives channel here. Are we good here? Uh, you probably you'll see the chat and all the people on here. So I think I think it's good. I hope it is. So uh, let's see here. Yeah, cool. I think we're good. Yeah, beautiful. That's that's cool. That's awesome. Okay. So appointment setting. Let's talk about some big picture stuff here to, to begin first. Number one with appointment setting. The most critical element of appointment setting is understanding the objective of what it is you're trying to accomplish. Why are you even picking up the phone to begin with? Why are you wanting to talk to somebody over the phone to begin with, okay? If you don't understand why, then you'll have a hard time dealing with appointment setting. So one of the critical foundational fundamental things about appointment setting is this. You're setting an appointment to um, sell them the product. In other words, what we're not trying to do is set an appointment or sell them the product over the phone, then set them an appointment. So this is really important to understand. There's uh, some people think, well, they got to know the details of a product before they can make a decision on buying or at least meeting with me. Now, I would say that's definitely true to buy, but the problem with the setup on the front end where you're uh, trying to sell the product is that you don't understand the human psychology at play when it comes to setting an appointment. The objections that people have over the phone with setting an appointment aren't about the product. In most cases, sometimes I'm sure they are, but in most cases they're not. What the objections truly are about are about the concern of a stranger or a salesperson coming in their home, uh, pressuring them to buy, taking their money, and the head trash that comes with dealing with the unknown. And so it, the more that you try to sell them on the product, the problem is, is you haven't earned the right to sell them. You haven't built rapport, trust, or that kind of thing. And what happens is people's mindset isn't the same as it will be when you're in person with them after you've built sufficient rapport and trust with them. So the point here, guys, is very, very critical. If you're doing your script where you're trying to sell the client over the phone, then um, you are not doing the uh, right approach uh, to the business. 
So hopefully that makes sense so far. We're doing good here, wonderfully perfect, okay. So you are se selling the appointment because that's where the underlying objection truly lies. So remember that as we go through this script and kind of walk through it and think through the, the details of it, okay? So as far as what to say, we're gonna show you the script and then I'm gonna walk it back and kind of clarify the different elements of the script and then um, hopefully give you some ex explanation why we do it this way. Kind of as a side note, as you guys know, if you've watched my content a lot, I th I'm a big believer in not just telling you what to do, but explaining why, because if you have the belief, therefore you have the conviction and the understanding, you probably are more likely to actually do the thing. So um, as, this, and, and we, as you'll see on the screen, screen here, it's, it has direct mail lead script, Facebook lead script, et cetera. So um, yes, uh, you may be using another type of lead, but understand that's totally fine, okay? And again, we'll do a Q&A segment. So if you have some kind of fine tuning questions here at the end of this script discussion, then I'll definitely take the time to answer that. But let's actually look at the script in its entirety, and then we'll go break it down, and then we'll get to the objection handling part of the script. So here's how the script looks. Hey, Mrs. Jones, my name is David Duford, and I'm calling about the green postcard you sent off in the mail a few weeks ago requesting information on our new state-regulated final expense program. And the reason I'm calling, it's my job to deliver the information you requested and wondered if you're free tomorrow at 10 o'clock or 2 o'clock. So that's what I would use if I was using a direct mail lead, okay? Now, if I scroll down a little bit more, you can see the Facebook lead script, and I'll, I'll rehearse it really quick. It's almost the same, but there's a little few more modifications in here we'll explain in a minute. And here's the script. Hey, Mrs. Jones, my name is David Duford, and I'm calling about the information you requested on Facebook about our new state-regulated final expense programs. You said that your favorite hobby was fishing, and the reason I'm calling is it's my job to deliver the information you requested and wondered if you're free tomorrow at 10 o'clock or 2 o'clock. Okay. So the little modification there, so if you're using Facebook leads, most of your Facebook lead vendors out there should provide you some kind of like uh, memory jogging variable. Most likely it's a favorite hobby, favorite color, that kind of thing. And with Facebook leads, as some of you have worked them before, they have a short shelf life. We'll talk more about leads in a little while. But with Facebook leads, they don't recall as often as say a direct mail lead would. So we wanna remind them of something that they did that they can't deny and uh, lets them know that they actually did this thing. So that's why we reference the favorite hobby, okay? So this is the only script that you need to say to get into the door. It doesn't need to be any more complicated than this. Notice we haven't said really much about um, the specifics of this program. We haven't talked about it being whole life, never goes up in price, never canceled due to age or health. This isn't the greatest thing, we don't need to because that turns people off at this stage more than it turns, it turns them on. And, uh, but let's walk through sequence by sequence. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna walk sequence by sequence through this. And then based on, um, you know, uh, as we go through this, I'll kind of pause and I'll look in the chat to see if you guys got any questions. And then I'll try to address them just to make sure everybody's following. There's a lot of people here uh, and is on board and understands everything that's going on. So the first part is, is the opening, okay? So when the client says, hello, what do you say? Real easy, you say, hey, Mrs. Jones, or hey, Mrs. Prospect's last name. My name is David Dufour. So this is the opening of the script. A Couple of things here that I do and teach my agents currently that I think you guys should consider doing as well. First of all, if Mrs. Jones answers, I assume it's, uh, or if a Mrs. Jones answers, I assume it's Mrs. Jones. Instead of asking, hey, is this Mrs. Jones? Why don't I say that? Because it sounds like I'm a telemarketer, okay? What I want to avoid with a lot of this is falling into the typical traps an amateur telemarketer will fall into. Like asking, may I speak, please speak to Mrs. Jones? Or is this Mrs. Jones? Uh, if you start to do that, then people will be put on guard because they don't know what to expect. They're admitting who they are and they don't know who you are, okay? So what we presume to do is know that when a lady answers or a man answers, it's the Mr. or Mrs. that requested the information and we just roll with it. Worst case scenario, it says, oh, that's my mom. Let me go grab her and I'll tell her what it's about, okay? Uh, and continuing, I also say, my name is David Duford. I don't like to tell them I'm with an insurance company, okay? 
if I start to state that I'm with an insurance company this early on, then what I'm doing is like playing poker with my face cards up, right? Or my hand faced up. I'm letting them know really early on that I'm a salesperson. And that also instigates, it triggers them to, uh, you know, not want to listen to me because they know, they think they know the deal. So um, we don't want to reference the company we're with, not that we're trying to obfuscate or hide this stuff, guys. We're just, again, trying to play strategically through the script and reveal certain elements of what we're doing at specific times that give us the best leverage. So I find that if we say who we are or, rep or say a company we represent or whatever, it's more confusing than anything else. So um, I just don't do it because what I'm trying to get to after I introduce myself is to explain in stage two of the script why I'm calling, okay? I want them to know really quickly what the purpose and intent of my phone call is from the beginning. So it's pretty simple, right? I'm calling because about the new green postcard you sent off in the mail a few weeks ago requesting information on our new state regulated final expense program. Okay, so I'm trying to clarify with as little verbiage as possible what it is they did to prompt me originally to call them. So notice what I say here. I, I like to, with direct mail pieces, reference the color of the lead piece. Many of these lead pieces have different colors, pink, green, etc. So I'm calling about the green postcard you sent off in the mail a few weeks ago requesting information Again, requesting information, we specifically say that uh, because it's uh, not as uh, threatening as maybe, you know, uh, wanting a quote, right? Using the word quote is something that will trigger, again, the prospect thinking they're about to be sold. Requesting information on our new state regulated final expense program. Notice what word is missing from that uh, description. New state regulated final expense program. Uh, I call this, uh, we don't say the I word. You know what the I word is? Insurance. I picked this up a long time ago, um, driving as much as you do face to face, listening to a lot of radio. Um, I, I would listen to sometimes these annuity uh, shows that are on the radio. And what I noticed about the, the especially one in particular in Chattanooga here that would play, uh, has been on the radio for probably 15 years. He almost, the dude almost never says annuity. And I always found that interesting. At first, I thought, well, you're trying to deceive, maybe not with malice or contempt, but you're trying to withhold that information. And it, to me, I thought, well, that's a bad thing. But then I realized that annuity, like insurance or life insurance, has this kind of preconceived notion. It, it immediately causes people to re revolt, or not revolt, but revile, or just they don't want to engage once they hear that word. And they've got this idea of what annuity means and it's typically negative. And if you start saying certain words too soon in a conversation without building rapport and trust, then what happens is people start to jump to conclusions prematurely and assume that you're out to take advantage of them. All of this is to say, this is why when I use a lead card or any sort of lead that we purchase, I don't recommend that you actually use a lead, or I should say, uh, uh, say in the script that the lead is life insurance. If you do that, you're short-circuiting the critical thinking functions of your prospect and putting yourself in this position to be now on the defensive because then they're going to say all sorts of things like, oh, I don't need any more. You don't need to sell me a policy, that kind of thing. So what we do, and this is, again, this is not with the intent to deceive. It's with the intent to overcome inherent human reaction and behavior to certain things that we know will trigger a negative reaction prematurely. So what we do and what we teach is to describe what it is that we do without having to use the primary words. We use more words to describe something that could be simplified, but doesn't carry that negativity and, and baggage uh, that that particular word is like life insurance. So that's why we say our new state regulated final expense program. That describes what it is that we're doing, but without saying the word insurance. So we kind of hopefully uh, make them curious to see what this is about, but we totally avoid running into that obstacle early on that they feel like we're trying to sell them. Does that make sense, everybody? And I go through this explanation with you because I want you to understand a lot of people get hung up 
with not saying life insurance or saying state regulated final expense like we're trying to deceive them. That is not the case at all. And hopefully this explanation helps you understand all life insurance is state regulated. Life insurance that takes care of funeral expenses is final is a final expense program. So that's why we say that. And if you say that language, it's going to trigger in the mind of the prospect, it sounds like something I'm interested in without getting them defensive that we're trying to sell them life insurance. Hopefully that makes sense. So after that, then we go into the reason I'm calling. So now we explain how it's our job to deliver the information. We're now selling the appointment, okay? So remember how I talked about how we don't sell the product? Well, we have to sell the appointment, right? So we need to start a process to overcome objections that are occurring right on the spot. Sorry, guys, if I can't see that, hopefully it's a little better. We're now overcoming uh, the uh, inherent objections most people have because as I'm going through this, the sense in many of our prospects is that we might try to sell them something, okay? So they're going to start being defensive here if they haven't already. So what we're trying to do in the script is basically overcome the objection of the fear of a salesperson, all right? So this is why we sell the appointment. We're selling them on booking the appointment, in other words. So what do you say? Very simple. The reason I'm calling, it's my job to deliver the information you requested. And sometimes I'll throw in there, whatever you do with it's up to you. Kind of depends how I'm feeling. That's not wrong to say that. But at this point, I'm selling the point. It's, I'm just, just my job. So I'm doing a job like you did before you retired. We all do things in our jobs we don't want to do. So hopefully there's kind of an intuitive understanding there. And I'm delivering information they requested. And I uppercase these words because I want you to emphasize them in the script. It's my job to deliver the information you requested. Okay, So I'm just delivering information that you requested. I'm not going to sell you a policy. Okay. Uh, and then the close here is the last part. It's very simple, guys. We need to close the appointment. And the thing with um, closing is there's a right way to close, a wrong way, and a better way to close, okay? Um, the right way to close is just to ask some kind of question uh, that it, it gets you in the door, right? You, so the wrong way to close is not to close. Let me put it that way. A lot of people won't even ask this last point because they're so anxious-ridden, anxiety-ridden, that they're worried about the outcome. Now, some agents will say, hey, are you free tomorrow at 2 o'clock? Or can I come over at 2 o'clock tomorrow? The problem with that close, it is a close. It's an inferior close, though. Now, why is that the case? Because when you ask the client a question that has the option of both a yes or a no, can I come over at 2 tomorrow, what is the client most, the future client most likely going to say? No. If you give somebody an, an option to say no, they'll take it in a circumstance like this where they sense that they may be sold something. Okay, so how do you overcome this? Well, what's cool with you being in the sales business is that you have the frame of reference here in the sense that you can frame how the engagement to an extent is going to interact with your prospect. And so what we do and teach our agents and what we're about to teach you is that we close with what's using call or what's called the alternative close strategy. So what we do is say essentially, instead of can I come over at two, and where there's a yes, no option, we give them a yes option or a yes option and presume that we're going to get in the door. So the close looks something like this. Wondered if you're free tomorrow at 10 o'clock or does two work better? Notice I said, do you want to say yes to 10 o'clock or would you rather say yes to two o'clock? And when you frame your closing question in this fashion, it is incredibly powerful. There are all sorts of people that will let you in even if you have the most inferior close. There are all sorts of people that will never let you in no matter what it is that you say uh, the, with the best or the worst approach. But there's always this segment of the, the pie of prospects out there that we call on that may or may not meet with you depending on how they feel with your interaction and how they react. And this script captures more of that middle ground, that middle pie of the maybes it never gets the no's, people who flat out will decline, and you'll always get people who still shut you down even with a great script. But it captures more of that maybe pool of prospects so that you can book and convert more of your leads into actual appointments. So again, bottom line here, make sure that you are closing with uh, an alternate yes strategy. Would 10 o'clock work or does two work better? Okay. Now in a moment, we're gonna get into the um, objections here. I'm gonna go over to the other screen in just a second. 
I do want to uh, hit on a couple of things with the scripting here that's very important. Number one, notice that the script doesn't have any punctuation. It is literally a run-on sentence. So am I just like, you know, a failure at, at English? No, quite the opposite. This is intentional because what one thing you've got to really, really work on here, and please listen up, very, very important, is you have to say the script in a way that does not allow or minimizes the opportunity for the prospect to interject and start to take control. For example, this is why we don't say, hey, is this Mrs. Jones? Because then I'm asking them a question to where they could take control, okay? Um, and, and also notice like the Facebook script. You said that your favorite hobby is watching Jerry Springer, right? If I had asked it that way, then what happens is, is that they say, yeah, but I'm not interested. And before you can start selling against the anxiety they have of seeing it with you, seeing you, you, they've now taken control, made a statement, and you're now on the defensive. So one of the things I think's helped us a lot, a lot out with my agents nationally that sell face to face is we say the script in a way that does not allow for a pause to occur. And this is really important too. You and you'll hear me say this a million times today, but it's this critical. You got to record yourself going through the script. You should listen to how you're saying what you're saying to make sure that you're not pausing unnecessarily to where the client would interject prematurely. You don't want them to say anything after they say hello till you get to the bottom of the script and ask them what time you're coming, 10 o'clock or two. That's the only answer I care about. Every other answer, I don't. I don't care. I don't want to know anything until I've said my piece and said what I need to say to convert this into an appointment. Does that make sense, everybody? The other thing you want to manage here too as well with this appointment setting script is to, again, record yourself and listen to the pace in which you say it. For example, um, if you say this script like, and you're really nervous, you're really scared, you know, it's free, and that's normal if you are, it's completely normal. But if you start this process and you're like, uh, hey, Mr. Jones, my name is David Dufour and I'm calling about the green postcard you sent off in the mail a few weeks ago requesting, you're talking too fast. And the client's going to be, be hard to actually try to keep up. It's like, what? Huh? What are you talking about? And, the, and you're, you're talking too slow. Then you're going to have to repeat yourself. And the nerves are going to cause you to kind of like shut down, right? And you're not going to be as effective listening, reading, and reacting to what it is that you're hearing from the prospect. So make sure that you're deliberately slowing down what you're saying with each word that you're saying. You want to say it at a pace that's not slow, but not fast either. It should sound something like this. Hey, Mrs. Jones, my name is David Duford, and I'm calling about the green postcard you sent off in the mail a few weeks ago requesting information on our new state-regulated final expense program. That pace is pretty good. That might even could be turned down just a slight bit, but that pacing is perfect. I'm pretty close perfect. And the client's going to be able to better understand what you're saying. Now, as far last thing I'll say here, then I'll take questions on appointment setting. Um, there's two methodologies to reading the appointment. You can take the no bedside manner clinical approach, like the doctor, um, that you're just calling back, you're doing your job. There's kind of this air of authority, no BS in your voice. There's not a lot of inflections, kind of like this. Or you can say it like I did. You kind of have a little bit of energy, a little bit of enthusiasm, and uh, you, know, you sound like you're happy to talk to him. You don't want to go over the deep end, of course, but there's a dichotomy between both of those. Either of those strategies and methodologies work. So my, my advice is kind of reflect on your own personality. Are you more deadpan? <laughs> Are you more clinical in disposition? You, should, you, you can say this with that kind of straightforward, hey, I'm here because you requested this information. I'm getting back to you because it's my job to deliver the information. Uh, but if you like are a little more maybe extroverted, I don't know, uh, you can say the, the uh, version that has a little bit more pep to your step, if you will. Okay. So that's the first step of this. Let me go back to the screen here. Let me see if I got my... Uh, uh, stuff right here. Wonderful. I think I got it. Um, I'm going to, uh, 250. Good Lord. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching everybody, man. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, let's take a look at, um, some questions here and, uh, I'll do the best that I can. So let's see if there's any questions. This is a great time to ask questions about the appointment setting script and let's see what we got. Uh, da, 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 da. uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, let's see here. Again, looking at questions in the chat. Um, 
Yeah, the scripts, by the way, uh, I'll just drop this again. DavidDuford.com forward slash scripts. You can download the scripts from there. If you, if it do, please try to do that. If it doesn't work, just shoot me a message at support at DavidDuford.com. And then when I have a little break here, I'll get with you on it. Okay. What if it sounds like a male? <laughs> Look, if, if, if there's a, a deep voice lady, uh, probably not the first time that uh, that person was thought it was Mr. Jones when it was Mrs. Jones, they're probably not going to be offended. That's been my experience. It certainly has happened to me. I mean, I used to have people that telemarketed me when I was a kid. And, you know, this is before I hit puberty. And, hey, this is, hello. And they thought it was a young lady, but it was a, you know, 12-year-old boy me so don't don't worry about it too much uh yeah d this is all completely relevant for medicare over the phone 200 percent. like that's what's cool this script is like boilerplate works pretty much you just got to fine-tune a little things right like the state regulated final expense program i talk about something else i don't know i'm not on spot not thinking about it but you definitely want to do something a little bit different do you have a script for cold calling slimy and a lie you have to clarify what you mean by that um, oh, Dave. Oh, I see what you're saying, Mark. Karen, I've heard people use, I'm the field underwriter with the state of New Jersey who has been assigned to your case. I don't like that at all. Like, I, I know who does that. It, it's actually not who I'm thinking of, but they've done it. And they teach it, but a lot of people have taught that over the years. Field underwriter, I mean, technically you are a field underwriter, but you aren't with the state of New Jersey that's been assigned to your case. That that stuff sounds like, that's that's that that gray area, right? There's nuance in some of the scripting. Like it's not black and white, but to me, it just like you're with the state of New Jersey. I don't know. I wouldn't say that. I I feel better like with what we do because you know we don't say insurance. That's whole, what they're avoiding too. You know they're not saying insurance in the script, and I understand why. But I don't want to lie either. I I want to describe it in a different way that's still accurate. But I don't want to say I'm with the state of New Jersey. You know, it's more accurate and perhaps right to say I'm a licensed agent with the state of New Jersey or licensed with the state of New Jersey or something like this. Um, I, I don't really like it. Uh, thank you, Hydrix. Appreciate it. Thank you, Sam. All right. Probably match. A pro yeah, then there's going to be some of that too, Vision. It probably match the prospect's tone for sure. You know, you're going to be sitting there and somebody, some people are deadpan. But the thing is, it's going to be hard to catch that when all they've said is Hello. You know, people can brighten up right away. So kind of just do you is, is kind of how I'd say with the scripting. How would you come back with something like the customer comes back and says, is this life insurance? Great question. We're going to cover that, Sam, in a moment because we're going to get to objections. Uh, we have to cover objections uh, and we're going to cover that in detail. Um, would these scripts be somewhat similar to Telesales? Yes, Jennifer, they're very similar. The difference with Telesales is we don't close for an appointment, okay? Uh, little side note for the Telesales folks, real, real quick here. We're closing on what? We're closing to get into the presentation. We're not calling back. Uh, one principle I teach agents is the first call is the last call, okay? When you're telesales, you got one shot to close this. That's the mentality you got. So when they say, hello, you're in a presentation, they may not know it, but you got to get into the presentation and that means asking rapport building questions. So one of the things we talk about, if they say, hey, your favorite hobby is Jerry Springer, you know, after I sell the appointment, I'm going to say, hey, so what's your favorite Jerry Springer episode? You know, do you, is Steve still on the show? Blah, blah, blah. I'm going to start talking about their favorite hobby, right? And that's just like I would be if I was in their home, right? But now we're over the phone. So a little side note there for the telesales people. How about for the existing uh, clients in another area, for example, Medicare? I would just call and set an appointment. Say, hey, it's, it's, your, it's your Medicare agent, David DuFord. I'm calling because... Uh, we got some new products to help people with final expenses. I wanted to spend 10 minutes with you in person to talk more about it. Are you free tomorrow at 10 o'clock or 2? So the structure is very similar, but I would train, change a little bit, like I said. <clears throat> How do you feel about the, using the term benefits consultant? I, I guess. I don't know. I, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. you know. And for me, I, whenever I look at scripts, I think, okay, I want to say something that's, we want to stay honest. We don't want to lie, you know, and there's, there is going to be gray area and all of that. So at some level, you've got to decide what that is for you. But I like benefits consultant better than I'm from the state of New Jersey. Yeah, I'm with the state. Like that to me is a little on the dishonest side. Yeah, you're licensed with the state, but that's different than being with the state, right? For virtual appointments, I don't really do in-person appointments. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, you could do the same thing. I don't see how that would be any different. I'm licensed by the state of Florida Department of Financial Regulation. You could say that, yeah. Do, what do you say to someone who says they want to donate their body to science? Um, good question. I look at that as an objection. Uh, in the presentation or on the phone, we'll cover that in a minute. Thank you, Visionary. Hydrix, is this being recorded? Absolutely. This whole thing's going to be recorded. You'll be able to watch it later. I'm, Dude, I'm going for like eight hours here, but it's going to be recorded. Yeah, so um, once it's over, YouTube will probably spend a little time processing it, and then um, you can watch the recording. And then I'll have timestamps at the bottom eventually, so you can just jump to what it is you want to watch. And again, reminder, uh, daviddefore.com forward slash scripts if you want to get in on this script action uh, that we're talking about. And showing this seems like it will work better than my normal. You don't want to buy any life insurance, do you? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's actually funny. Um, you don't want to buy any life insurance, do you? The problem with that is that you're starting with a negative, right? You're assuming, and I used to do this crap, and I listen to it now, and I cringe like terribly. Like you don't want to buy any life insurance, do you? It just sounds pathetic, right? I mean, no offense to you, TK. I mean, it's just it does. Um, it it's, assumes a negative, right? So I don't like saying that. I used to say that. Don't do that. Um, you want to assume they're going to buy. Like that's the mentality that you'll see throughout the appointment setting, door knocking, and this presentation script is you assume yes. You assume and lead them positively that this is something you're going to do. Now, they may not do it. And we're not going to like aggressively push them around or really push them at all if they don't. That's not what we teach. But we want to kind of act as if in, in the appointment setting, act as if in the presentation because you are leading people across the finish line that are otherwise what we call world-class procrastinators that wait until the last feasible moment to buy a policy. Of course, you can't do that, right? So um, a good point there. Okay, great. Wonderful. Let's keep going. So we're going to uh, transition here now to handling the objections. Because as we know, it ain't ever this easy, Dave, right? I mean, we can say the script perfectly with enthusiasm, vigor, and all the wonderful nuance and, and say it perfectly. But guess what? Some people are going to say crap about uh, uh, and retort that they don't want to see you. So a couple of things here before we get to the script. Very, very important. Number one, what are people objecting to? This is very critical. Are they objecting? You know, what, what are some objections? Type them out in the chat, by the way, on the objections that you hear. Um, uh, the ones I can think of. I already got life insurance. Um, I'm broke. Um, donating my body to science. Um, I'm busy, right? These are the kind of things we hear a lot of, right? And I'm sure some of you will throw some more in here. Um, <clears throat> but here's the thing. What they're really objecting to in many cases is not what it is that they're saying. As much as we're on the spot thinking on our feet, uh, you know, going through our script, our prospects are reacting to us, okay? They're kind of on the defensive and they're saying things, I believe, that aren't necessarily reflective of reality. So when they say things like, I'm busy, I didn't send that back in, thank you, Andrea, I'm not interested, these aren't necessarily the truth. These are just what I would call lizard brain reactions to what it is that they're hearing when you call them up on the phone. In other words, they're not to be trusted. You can't, and this is hard, man, this is really hard for me. You cannot trust what people tell you on the phone when you're setting appointments. I need to talk to my pet rock. <laughs> That's at the close. Uh, we'll, we'll deal with the pet rock objection. Don't you worry. Um, but this is the thing. Like people are responding and thinking on their feet and they're not as well prepared as we are. But what they're saying in so many words when they say I'm not interested or I've already got life insurance is that they're afraid of you coming over and pushing them around and selling them on something. Okay. So you have to, and this is where I'm going with, you have to gear your objection rebuttal to the underlying real objection, the true objection, which is I'm, I don't know if I want to do this. I don't know who you are. I don't know if this is for me. I don't want to spend money. I don't think I do. That hasn't been verbally manifested. You have to think past what it is that they're saying in many cases and speak to the underlying fear that's underneath it all. Does that make sense, everybody? Very hard to do, but this is something you've got to train yourself on because this is how it actually occurs. Those of you who are experienced uh, in the business uh, very much know that there are plenty of opportunities to turn around people who say, I'm not interested, I already got life insurance, or I'm busy. And we're going to go over those in a minute. Where they said that, you rebutted, and they booked anyway. And they bought, 
even though they had claimed that you know they got enough life insurance or whatever okay so the, the first thing in understanding how to rebut objections correctly is to understand you can't trust what people are saying it may be true what they're saying but you don't know that until you rebut several times and then have them either hang up on you or book that's really the litmus test they eventually realize that they're in this never-ending loop of you rebutting them and their BS that they're saying, and they just give up and hang up, okay? That's how you know uh, the outcome is that they aren't going to get anywhere with them. Um, or they'll just book with you once they've exhausted all of their excuses. Hey, what's going on, Phil? You got it. So this is appointment setting objections, okay? So um, let's actually look at the objections uh, themselves and go over how to deal with them. Well, actually, before that, I want to go over, the, again, the uh, the process that we use. And then what I'll do after I go through the objections, I'm going to go through each of these posted in the chat to show you how this simple rebuttal strategy really works for everything, okay? With the right mindset and setup, okay? So appreciate everybody participating, give me some stuff to test this out on. So we call this the ASK method. This objection rebuttal strategy, this acronym appears setting appointments at the door in person. It appears throughout the sales call uh, when you experience some objections. It definitely appears at the end of the sales call too. And, and, and it's a it's a acronym because it represents what you would say and what you're accomplishing at each step of the objection rebuttal. So what does ask mean? Um, ask means this. A means answer the objection. S means sell, in this case for the appointment, sell the appointment. And C means close. Okay? So let's talk about each of these. So ask, or A, answer the objection. Now what's the answer has, has to be? It's very simple. The answer is simple. Okay, sure. No problem. So what your response to whatever their excuse is, is not a dissertation on why whole life is the best option or whatever it is. It's not an expl explanatory selling the product type of answer. It's a disarming, no big deal type of response that shows the client that you're not a threat. So I like to say in the answer, that's okay. No problem. That's fine. Okay. Something like that. They're not expecting that. When people push back and say no in so many words or object, they're expecting a fight. And when you refuse to engage them and start to get you know in with it with them, then they're going to disarm. They're going to listen a little bit because you're not you're not contesting them, right? Um, you're not escalating the argument in a sense. You're just agreeing to what they're saying. And many times it's hard to fight against somebody who's agreeing to what you're saying. Okay, so here's how we respond to this. You answer and say, "Hey, that's fine." Then we just go back into selling the appointment. All I need is five minutes to show you how this works, Mrs. Jones, and whatever you decide to do with this is entirely up to you. So that's back to selling the appointment. It's going to sound very similar to what you just said on the opening script to set the appointment. And then the final close is, is the exact same that you used earlier. The close being, would 10 o'clock, so does 10 work better or would you prefer to? Okay, the same alternate yes, yes, close. And that's it. It's that simple, and this is really, really important for you new agents out there, for those of you struggling to book appointments. One of the things about, and I'm sorry, y'all are gonna have to hear me talk about jujitsu a little bit today, because I'm pretty boring. When I'm not working, I'm either lifting weights, spending time with my family, or doing jujitsu. So I think in the terms of kind of like, it's funny to see relations and different things, different performance-based activities. So I'll reference jujitsu a lot. And jujitsu, uh, my instructor, uh, who's brilliant, uh, he should be on YouTube uh, and be doing this stuff. Um, he talks about, and this is true for firearms training, true for a lot of things in life. Um, there's a, there's a, a pension of people who think the best way to be good at jiu-jitsu uh, is to know like 25 different techniques, right? These obscure, weird techniques that, yes, are interesting to look at, um, but aren't necessarily effective against the best uh, opponents. There's another side of the, the story or, or of, of, of jiu-jitsu and techniques is where you need to know just a handful of techniques, like three to five attacks or submissions, and then spend your time getting better at them, then integrating them off of other techniques and getting good at misdirection, 
uh, deceit where you you feign with your opponent, think you're going to do one thing like a collar choke, but you move to an arm bar or triangle. Okay, and the combination of all this increases your capability to execute, and you're 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 going to be that much better because you've practiced these fundamental techniques uh, thousands of times versus the guy who's got 50 techniques. He's only practiced 500 times. So it's like the old Bruce Lee quote, I, I fear the opponent, and I'm butchering this, I fear the opponent that knows one kick and has practiced it 10,000 times versus the opponent that has 10,000 kicks he's only practiced once. So fundamentally speaking, why do I mention this? Because it's imperative to make sure that when you are in the process of learning a skill set and selling insurance, booking appointments is a skill set, if we have one technique that can cover a litany of problems. That is a valuable technique. Knowing one technique to cover no matter what objection comes up, or at least the major five or six ones, we'll cover those in a minute, it is extremely valuable. So why do why should you care? Because if you get good at this one objection and you get good at memorizing, scripting it, perfecting it, you're going to be really hard to handle on the phone from a prospect standpoint. They're not going to know how to deal with you and they're just going to say yes more often than not. Okay, you're going to book more appointments. Okay, so bottom line, what we're teaching here is very simple, but please don't don't confuse simple with ineffective. Simple is fundamentally sound and it's fundamental. And if it works in multiple ways, it is a very valuable skill to therefore spend a lot of time practicing. Okay, okay. Now with that said, now you know how to deal with this. I'm going to go through the objections <clears throat> that I go through that are most common, then I'll look at your objections, and then I'm actually gonna kinda do a reversal here and talk about what they do, what to do when they say yes to booking the appointment, okay? So I should be able to share my screen now. I'm gonna trust the system, and you guys can see, yes, my desktop, wonderful, okay. So here's one objection. I don't remember sending the card in. That's my signature, but I didn't fill it out, right? You'll hear that objection eventually if you haven't already. I didn't send that in, I don't remember it, that kind of thing. What do you say to that? Well, here's ASC, the ask methodology in action. That's okay, Mrs. Prospect. I have you listed here at 123 Hereford Street in Mason, Tennessee, and your age is 61, is that correct? Yep, perfect. All I need is five minutes to show you how these programs work, and whatever you do with the information is entirely up to you. How about I stop by at 10 o'clock, or does two work better? So you guys hear the ask methodology in play here? You've A, answered the objection, you've S, sold the appointment, and you see you've closed. Now the A can look different. Now the reason I said you don't remember sending the card in, the way the answer here, it's long. I referenced their address, their, their age, I missed out on the Ned's age, the spouse's age, um, because um, I'm answering the objection to jog their memory. If I'm working a Facebook lead, then what I would have said, that's okay, Mrs. Prospect. Again, I have you listed here as your email as 123 at abc.com and your favorite hobby is spelunking. All I need is five minutes to show you how this works and what you do with it's up to you. How about I come by at 10 o'clock or two tomorrow? So the strategy is exactly the same in answering it, okay? One thing that I will modify off of the script that I should have corrected, but I'm not perfect. Um, I would not ask, and I want you to think about this, based off of what we said, what's the problem with asking if their age is 75, is that correct? Take a moment to think about that while I take a sip of coffee. There's a bit of a delay here, so I'll give you kind of a minute to think. Why should I not ask them if that's correct? <clears throat> the reason is, is because I'm now asking them to engage and start to take control. Yes, it is, but I'm not interested, right? What you should stay instead Say and said, as I have you listed here at 123 Hereford Street and that your age is 61 and all I need is five minutes to show you how these programs work and whatever you do with it's entirely up to you. How about I stop by at 10 o'clock or two? So I shouldn't even confirm it. I know it. I don't need to ask a question I already know the answer to. I, I think that gives and seeds ground to the prospect to take back control. So this is something I need to correct. Objection two, I thought I was getting something in the mail or could you mail something to me? Answer is exactly the same. Hey, that's fine, Mr. Prospect. My job is just to show you how these programs work and what you need or what you do with it's entirely up to you. All I need is five minutes. How about I stop by at 10 o'clock or does two sound better? Same exact thing, same exact fundamental script, okay? 
oh, I'm not interested anymore. That's no problem, Mrs. Prospect. All I need is five minutes to show you how this program works and what you do with it's up to you. What works best tomorrow at 10 o'clock or two? Same exact thing. It's a good answer to that because remember, they're not. it's not that they're not interested. They're just saying this to avoid a potential confrontation in a sales call, okay? So we're speaking to that underlying fear that they're not, they're not manifesting in their words. Here's a good one we all, we all experience. I already got life insurance. Hey, that's fine, Mrs. Prospect. All I need is five minutes to show you how these programs work and whatever you decide to do with it's up to you. How about I stop by at 10 o'clock or does two work better? See how we're using the same process and how it answers in the same way? When you understand you're not answering what they're saying, you're answering what they're not saying that actually is what's driving them to say this, okay? Again, for example, how many people here have sold life insurance to people who already own life insurance? About half of my clientele in my entire life had a policy with another company. Just because they have life insurance doesn't mean they won't buy from you. And just because they have life insurance doesn't mean it's actually the best deal for them. So don't think when you hear this, this is bad. It's actually a good thing. I get excited when somebody has life insurance. Now, why would that be? Because they're buyers. They're not talkers who say, yeah, life insurance is important, but <laughs> I'm not spending any money on it. I want to deal with doers and, and people who take action. And people who own life insurance already are convinced it's important. I don't need to spend any time convincing them why it's important. I just need to convince them on the time of explaining um, why mine is better. So I want to hear these objections. You should get excited when you hear them. Okay. Objection number five, I'm busy tomorrow at doctor's appointments. Um, then uh, th That's not saying they're busy all day. That's just saying that they're busy at the times you gave them. So the real simple solution is saying, hey, no problem, Mrs. Jones. I work all day tomorrow. How about I come by tomorrow at four o'clock or six? Some people don't presume you're going to work late. How would they? You didn't tell them. So just alternate different times instead on the close. Okay. Now let me go back to the chat here. Whoops. Hold on. That was close. I almost, <laughs> I almost closed my computer down. Woo. That was close. One. All right. Let's go back to some of these objections and uh, deal with them uh, head on. All right. I didn't sign anything. No problem, Mrs. Jones. I have that you listed here. Your address is 123 Hereford Street and that um, your age is 61. All I need is five minutes to show you how this works, Andrea, and what you do with this is up to you. How about I come by at 10 o'clock or does two work better? I'm a veteran and my plot is already paid for. Hey, no problem, Mrs. Prospect. All I need is five minutes to show you how these programs work and what you decide to do with this is entirely up to you. Why don't I swing by at 10 o'clock or does two work better for you? Uh, I need to talk to my wife. Hey, that's fine. Um, why don't I come by tomorrow at, say, 6 o'clock or 8 o'clock when your spouse gets home? All I need is five minutes to show you how it works. Again, what works better, 6 o'clock or 8? So in that case, I might try to pivot to another time, although this is probably something you'll hear more on the back end when you book the appointment or when you're trying to close it. Um, what are you selling? Hey, great question. This is about the new state regulated final expense programs that take care of funeral and cremation expenses. It's my job to deliver this information. What you do with it's entirely up to you. How about I swing by at 10 o'clock or does two work better? Um, I don't plan on dying anytime soon. Hey, me neither. All I need is five minutes to show you how this works, Mrs. Prospect. And what you do with it's entirely up to you. Why don't I stop by at 10 o'clock or does two work better? We have enough insurance. Hey, that's fine. All I need is a few minutes to show you how my programs are totally different and how they work. And what you decide to do with this is just up to you. Why don't I stop by at 10 o'clock or does two work better? I'm all good. No problem, Mrs. Prospect. It's my job to deliver this information. All I need is five minutes to do that and I'll be out of your hair. Why don't I stop by at 10 o'clock or does two work better tomorrow? Can you mail me the information? Great question. It's my job to actually deliver the information to you, TK, and what you decide to do with it's up to you. I'm going to be in your area tomorrow. Would 10 o'clock or two work better? Can you just email it to me? Hey, great question. It's my job to deliver this information that uh, you requested. What you do with it's up to you. It'll just take five minutes and I'll be out of your hair. How about I stop by at 10 or does two work better? Yeah, Joe, Joe yeah. Do You always say 10 o'clock or two. No. Just so don't always say 10 or two because you'll eventually get people who say yes to that and you can't book those. So just trade nine to one or how about four? Just take two times that are free 
and book for one of those two times, okay? Appointment, uh, pretty sure he's using those three times for example, yep. Uh, Jedi mind trick, wave script, book appointment done. I wish it worked like that all the time. Of course, nothing's perfect, right? You're going to get people who never book no matter what. But we're, we're trying to take those people who are kind of on the, the precipice of agreeing and this kind of verbiage and, and, and um, presumptive language helps with that group of people. Yeah, TK, good point. I'm always leery of saying, uh, uh, of saying just need five minutes when obviously it's going to be longer than that. You can do a five minute appointment if you really want to. And again, it's not, the, the, the person knows they've got five minutes and that's kind of why we say it. I, out of the, how many appointments have I done? Probably several thousand. I've been kicked out of a house after five or 10 minutes like twice, okay? So it's very rare that that actually occurs that way. Now, I will say, um, if you don't like it, change it to 10 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. Again, think about how quickly you can do an abbreviated presentation. Um, bottom line, um, don't worry about it. Uh, it is something that uh, is not going to cause much of an, an issue. What if they say no to age and address? Well, they're just liars. <laughs> and it's hard to close somebody in who is a liar, but it, that's very rare. Again, Hydrix, my, my mistake here, I don't ask them to confirm that. I know they said that, so I don't ask. So the real script is, I see that you put your name down or you, you live at 123 Main Street and your age is 61. All I need is five minutes to show you how this works. So I just go right into the, uh, the selling script and then the close. Thank you very much, Rocket. Pretty much. I appreciate it. Um, da, 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 da. They take control of the conversation, 100% right. They can, so no, that's not right. Acknowledge the objection, move on. Exactly. Answer the objection, acknowledge the objection, 100% D'Angelo. I know with Medicare, people will ask, how long will this take? Uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Again, think about the most abbreviated presentation you can do. Here's the thing, though. Once you start listening to them and talking to them and you show them value, 99.99% .99 of your prospects will listen as long as it takes, up to like maybe the three-hour mark, you know, where they fall asleep on you. But it's a pretty true uh, that that the five minutes is all I need thing. For me, I can do a presentation in five minutes. Like, here's your quote. Here's how it works. This is it. If I had to. Um, so I'm okay with it. But if you're not, change that number to what you're interested in. I wouldn't say I'll, all I need is an hour. I wouldn't go beyond 20 minutes. And, and everybody here can do a, a presentation in 20 minutes. Uh, da, 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 da. Do you engage and inform on the call? Like how? No, 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 no. What do we call engaging and informing them about veterans plots? This is a fundamentally against what we're trying to accomplish. This is what's called selling the product. If you start selling the product, you're not going to get the appointment. Okay. You just acknowledge and agree. Hey, that's fine. And you just insist that your jobs deliver information, what they do with it's up to them. Okay. I would say at the appointment itself, yes, exactly. However, if they know it's free in the National Cemeteries, you might be hurting yourself. State cemeteries still can charge. Yeah. Again, just get in the door and have that conversation with them. That's what we're trying to emphasize here because even if you inform them over the phone in a side of 30 to 60 seconds, they, have, they don't know who you are. They don't know why you're calling and they're leery and probably distrustful of you because you're a stranger. And any attempt to try to sell them is going to fall on deaf ears. And that's kind of what I'm trying to get across to everybody here. Hopefully it's making sense. This is not why we don't sell the product very early in a call. Even for telesales, for people who are on the phone to pitch a product, you don't talk about the product up front. That's the last thing you do. Instead, what you do is you talk about your, well, not yourself. <laughs> you talk about the, pro, the client, the, pro, the prospect, what their interests are. You get to know them a little bit. Uh, you ask them why they did what they did. You, you be, show curiosity. You try to understand the reasons. You get trust and authority. And you build this thing and then start to tell them about how the product works. So there's a sequence of events that have to happen in order for somebody to buy from you. And the first step in the presentation, as we'll get to, is you got to set the appointment. Okay? I mean, you got you got to build rapport and trust. But you in, in person... Over the phone, you can't do that early on in a sales call. Telesales are face-to-face. -face. So you want to avoid selling, explaining, anything. Because explaining is basically selling. Just sell the appointment, not the product, okay? All right. So hopefully you guys can see some value here from the rebuttals and the sequence and how we do it. Again, I'll put down in the chat here, um, if you're interested in the script, daviddefore.com forward slash scripts. 
Uh, you're welcome to download that for free. If you can't get access to it, holler at me, and then I'll see about finding what I need to find uh, in order to uh, hurry the process along. Know a guy who has a five-minute non-sales video on his website. He points prospects to, especially those who can't reach or who are ducking them. Uh, they see, hear, like, and learn a bit. Breaks down barriers, like the idea. Sure, it may or may not work. Um, this is an interesting business of, of, of when it comes to branding. Uh, the interesting thing is that the vast majority of sales are made off of vanilla non-branded sales approaches. There are a few that are exceptions to the rule, but the rule in this business is you know, you're selling a product to somebody without a brand. And again, you don't build a brand over the phone on a, what they perceive as a cold call. You build, brand can be otherwise defined as a relationship with somebody. And relationships are built after you've learned a little bit about them, got them comfortable, asked some really good questions, and it naturally buds. And so that's why there's a sequence of events. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Johanna, hey, how you doing? Email me, support at davidford.com. And then um, I will send all of this out to you guys directly, okay? All right, so that's appointment setting. Any last questions on appointment setting? Uh, the, a couple of things here while I wait on any last questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. The biggest mistake, what do you think the biggest mistake on rebuttals are? The biggest mistake, and this is, the way, again, big takeaway on, on objection rebuttals, is you don't close. Because here's the truth. When you're rebuttaling an objection, you're nervous. Your anxiety's higher. They're pushing back against you. You're getting the beginnings of rejection, right? And in the moment, what a lot of people don't do is close. They say everything else right. Hey, that's fine. All I need is five minutes. What you do, it's up to you. But they lack that last little conviction to tell the person what to do next. Our prospects need to be told what to do. You're leading here. You cannot like abdicate your leadership okay you and otherwise you can't like not lead you have to lead to the end and leading is defined on telling people what to do when it comes to setting appointments you've got to close them every single objection rebuttal you say you might be two or three objection rebuttals deep you've got to tell them that you're coming at 10 o'clock or two you got to give them the alternate times and ask them which one they want me to show up at if you refuse or forget to do this your objection rebuttals will be less effective. You will not book appointments. And this happens so commonly with newer agents that this is why I'm covering this. You've got to get good at having the entire script with the close at the end. How do you know if you're not closing? Record yourself. Again, I'm going to beat this horse dead by the end of this call. Record yourself giving calls, listen to them, and you will discover all sorts of terrible mistakes you're doing that you swore you weren't. And this is one of the big ones on the objection rebuttals, okay? And this helps you kind of maintain that frame of reference, the, the bigger frame than the clients. All I need is five minutes. What you do with it's up to you. How about I come by at 10 o'clock or two? Which works best? You've got to always be closing. Always be closing on every objection rebuttal. Do not forget that. If you do, you'll lose momentum. The client will take over and hang up on you. All right. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Okay, cool. Perfect. So I think that's the big one there. Now, real quick on the uh, door knocking here. The door knocking is, and, and after we talk about door knocking, uh, we'll uh, have a, uh, I think we'll play one of the sponsor videos. I think we'll have um, Security National play first. So uh, we'll get to that momentarily. But let's uh, briefly talk about door knocking. The good news is that everything that we talked about when it comes to appointment set setting, almost entirely applies to door knocking. Actually, before we get to door knocking, a couple more things on appointment setting I wanna cover here. Just some, just some dynamics with the appointment setting process. Number one, when do you call uh, with appointment setting? From sunrise to sunset, even past sunset. You can start calling at 8.30, 8.45 in the morning. Those are really good times to call. Uh, but the kind of the hot times call are between nine and 11, and then somewhere between five and nine o'clock at night. The later you go, usually the better uh, and more often you get people on the phone. Saturdays are also really good times to call too, from about 10 o'clock till one. And then Sundays are fantastic from about four o'clock to eight o'clock. Um, we got appointments all the time on Sundays for people who never otherwise pick up because they don't expect us to call. So I would do that for leads that are just otherwise non-responsive. Try to call between four and eight. You'll be shocked at how many people pick up. Um, 
How many times should you call your leads till they buy or die? Or they just say no, okay? So um, <clears throat> with that said, what I don't want you doing is calling, uh, spending, you know, calling a lead the 25th time and putting an equal amount of effort into that as opposed to the effort that you're putting into your fresh leads, okay? So at some point, after you've made 10, 15, 20 dials, the likelihood they're gonna pick up on the next dial is, is commensurately lower. It's better to spend your fixed time calling on the fresher leads. So always spend your time calling those freshest leads first, okay? If you run out of time calling those fresh leads and you have extra time, call the old leads, that's fine but always prioritize the freshest leads first. Those are the ones that have the highest level of interest uh, closest to that inflection point where they agreed to request the information. Don't squander that opportunity. Um, there is definitely better leads than others and the fresh ones typically are always the best no matter what kind of leads that you're getting. Make sure you triple dial your leads. This is non-negotiable folks. Most of you guys should know what triple dialing is. If you don't, I'll explain it. It's where you call the client, they don't pick up. You call them five seconds later after you hang up a second time, they don't pick up that time, and then you call them a third and final time. This is a pattern disruption. People are typically going to look at a call, it's gonna go unanswered, and they're gonna just assume it's another telemarketer selling them a car warranty thing. But when you call that second or that third time in a row, people start to worry, who is this? Is this a loved one? Are they in a car wreck? Do they need me? and you've disrupted their typical level of behavior that many of those people that otherwise would never have picked up will pick up. And then you just proceed to pitch them the exact same way. Um, yes, people will pick up in, in a tizzy. They'll be a little bit perturbed. But after you go through your script, they tend to chill out and they tend to read or to respond in the ways that you would hope they would, which is book an appointment or go through a script with you. Guys, if you're not triple dialing every single time you pick up the phone to call a lead, you will fail this business. You will lose money. It is not worth your time. Please get over any sort of type of um, fear of them being upset with you. What you should be upset with is you not getting in front of somebody who dies because you refuse to have the guts to triple dial them. They will be thanking you. The family will. He's the other person dead. Uh, when you close a person that you triple dialed because... That's what it took to do the job and get it done. So have a per perspective shift on this. This is just a reality of how this business is. What about texting, Dave? Here's what I would say about texting. First of all, stay compliant. Only text those leads that you have opt-in permission to do. Two texts that work really well for us that we've been testing and have worked with for a while. Uh, I like to text just the, the prospect's first name with a question mark. Maybe after the first or second attempt to get them on the phone. The response to that is very similar to a triple dial. When somebody says the first name with a question mark, it's, it's just very curious. They know who I am. They're asking a question, but I don't know who they are. It's, it's very much good bait to get them to reply back into a text conversation to where then you can text them the appointment setting script uh, word for word is what I would do, or just call them when they reply back and then they'll be more likely to pick up, okay? Another way, one that works well too is, hey, call me back when you can. Just some simple kind of request like that is good. Again, a couple of calls. And I, I wouldn't abuse the texting guys. Don't text after every single call. I wouldn't do more than two texts, maybe just one. Again, uh, you don't want your phone set up as scam likely, and then your phone automatically go to uh, uh, you know not being picked up at all. So just you know, be very careful to respect the texting because texting 100%, almost 100% of people look at texts. Uh, so it's a very reliable way to get people to respond. Uh, so just don't, don't squander the opportunity again. Uh, let's see, I mentioned something there a second ago. Oh, yeah, oh, well, yeah, okay. So that's appointment setting. Texting, triple dials. Um, can you rotate numbers? Sure. Oh, that's what I was gonna mention. Scam likely. Uh, if you are worried, so there's a new initiative by these carriers out there that if you are rendered a potential telemarketer, you'll be put on these internal carrier lists that you're a scam and then your calls won't go through as much. So if you feel like you're dialing and nobody's picking up, chances are your phone is on the scam likely uh, list. Here's how you get out of it. Go to YouTube, put in David DuFord scam. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a Dave DeFord scam, but you'll get the video that says how to get off the scam likely uh, uh, lists. 
and it's a three to five minute video. I'll walk you through it on screen, how to remove your phone number and request that your number be taken off because you're not a scam. You're not a telemarketer you're responding back to what these people requested. Of course, they don't know that because your call's coming in with a dozen others a day. So we forgive them for making that decision to understand. But we want to take these steps to remove our numbers off the list. Okay. And that will help you increase pickup rates as well. All right. Any questions here on all of that? All right. Um, da -da 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 -da. <clears throat> I'm unavailable at both times. No problem, Mrs. Prospect. I'm actually working a little bit later. How about I come by at six o'clock or does eight work better? Same exact strategy. I can't afford it. No problem, Mrs. Prospect. All I need is five minutes. It's just my job to show you how this works and what you do with it's up to you. Why don't I stop by at 10 o'clock or does two work better? Yep, heels on holiday. That's right. Dave, when you're following a script for telesales call, do you follow the script verbatim? Uh, sort of, kind of. I mean, I think as a new agent, you should follow it verbatim. You should discipline yourself to follow what has been proven to work. Um, I think over time, as you start to put reps under the bar, you're going to internalize this stuff and your own kind of language is going to come out in it. We all kind of use different words to describe what we do, right? And I'm okay with that as long as we're following fundamentally the, the elements of the script that matter, right? Um, but you got to be careful though, because if you, if you wander too far off, then you're probably gonna start doing something you shouldn't be. So you always want to have the tutelage of a mentor that knows what they're doing to listen to your calls, to give you some feedback and, and to correct, to course correct you if you feel like you've, you know, you're not doing what you're supposed to. Uh, same thing, to, uh, uh, sunrise to sunset, Carl, but yes, I would say pickup rapes will be the same there too. Do you triple dial people you've spoken to or met before uh, or for follow-up? Sure. Yeah. I want them on the phone. I'm going to triple dial. What about when a client says, I have to talk with my spouse or child? That's a closing uh, objection. We'll talk about that later today. Good question though. What is the time to use the triple dial the lead? Um, what is the times? Um, if they just, if it goes to voicemail, I hang up, count to five and then call them again and do that again the third time. You're welcome, Valentina. How much time do you allow between an attempted appointment setting? Oh, so, okay, great question, very good. So let's say I have a stack of uh, 20 direct mail leads. It's nine o'clock, I start dialing. I get through all 20 by 10.30. Do I just wait to call them in the middle of the afternoon? No, I call and start from uh, lead one uh, at 10.30, okay? I might take a five minute break to, to collect myself, but at 10.30, I'm gonna start over on that list and call again. I don't care how many times I call them a day. I am going to call them till they all pick up. I don't care about pissing people off. I don't care what they think. I got to talk and resolve these leads, period. My money is tied up in these pieces of paper and somebody out there's got my money in the form of a policy and I need to help them out and sell them something. So I don't like, like call them one, only once in the morning, then in the afternoon, the evening, who knows? You gotta call them until they just give in, submit and answer the phone. So call them as much as possible, okay? Make hay while the sun is shining. Call them leads while you got time to do it. David, if you're willing to invest the money, what do you recommend as far as setting up your phone for out of area, out of state calls? Ah, uh, you could get like Prospect Boss, many of these dialers out there. Uh, you can uh, put in a number that you own that has a um, area code that's similar to theirs. I'm thinking about life, but in telesales, can you triple dial them? Is that legal? I don't know, D, probably okay. Should caller ID be your name or business name? Ah, excellent, it should be your personal name, not your business name. If, if yours says DeFord Insurance on the caller ID, what do you think people are gonna do? They're gonna be like, hell, I ain't picking that up. They're gonna try to sell me something. I, I've, I've already cut my legs off <laughs> before I start the marathon, right? Not a good way to start. Uh, when do you leave voicemails, if ever? Never, ever, ever leave voicemails, period. Okay. If you leave voicemails, then what'll ha have to happen is that um, you will not be in a position to where um, they will ever want to call you back. You want to use what I would call kind of like the surprise element. Uh, they're, um, you know, wondering who the heck is calling me and the curiosity kills the cat is what we're trying to say. Okay. All right. Now, let us continue. So uh, we're gonna hit door knocking here real quick. This is actually gonna be a very short segment on the door knocking because door knocking is almost exactly the same in the strategy and what we talked about earlier on appointment setting. 
So um, let me pull this up here. I'm going to pull the script up. And uh, let's take a gander at it. Give me a second to download it. And uh, we'll uh, do this momentarily. All right. Okay. Pull this up. How are we enjoying the training so far? Everybody enjoying this? Getting good value out of it? I hope, hope so. Um, if not, let me know. <laughs> All right. So let me set this up here. All right. So you should be able to see my screen. Trust the process, Dave. Good. It's working. Wonderful. Okay, cool. So door knocking. Door knocking is critical to your success as a final expense agent as a new agent. Um, in many ways, it works better than setting an appointment. Um, the kind of crap that you run across on the phone doesn't manifest as much as you do in person. Plus, the beauty of being in person door knocking is you're able to build rapport and trust right away because you're there physically in front of them. I think a lot of the kind of concerns and fears people have when booking appointments tends to drip and melt away when you're in person and you've got a good presentation at the door to book the appointment and get in to see them. Like the appointment setting script, the job at the door to is just to get in to talk about the product. It's not to sell the product. So the scripting is almost identical. We'll go over it in a minute. Our job, ladies and gentlemen, is just to get into the kitchen table or at the front porch. It's to sit down and talk product. Um, but we've got to sell ourselves at the door to make that happen. There's some physicality here we're going to teach on that you've got to learn to master in order to kind of direct the client in the right way uh, and to kind of give you an added advantage. So we'll talk about that as well as we go over the script. So again, very much the same script here, guys, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, hey, Mrs. Jones, my name is David Duford. I'm stopping by about this postcard you sent off in the mail a few weeks ago. You requested information about our new state regulated final expense program. And I'm here because it's my job to deliver this information you requested and wondered if we should sit out in the porch to discuss or if I can come in. <clears throat> Same script with Facebook, um, except I mentioned, mentioned their favorite hobby. Again, script wise, just like appointment setting. Uh, look, uh, we don't say insurance. Uh, I don't pause to let them overcome and ask them questions where they start to take over the control of the conversation, okay? I sell the appointment. And my close is, do you want to sit out in the porch or should I come in? Another close is, should I take my shoes off before I come in? This is a little different in, in the sense that the decision to say yes or no is now made around my shoes being on or off, but the presumption is that I'm coming in, okay? So you can alternate those type of closes as you'll see with the objection rebuttaling. Um, but both of them work very well. Uh, but all of this is pretty much the same. Now some physicality elements to the actual script. First of all, look reasonable. Now, <laughs> what do I mean by that? Uh, don't walk up to your prospect and be a bum, okay? If you look like a bum, you'll be treated like a bum, okay? So you want to make sure that your business casual, khakis, button-down shirt, a polo shirt, especially if you can get one with like uh, carrier regalia on that's helpful having your lanyard with like your ID on is helpful too you know people look for like signs of authority and a badge like a police badge kind of shows authority right people kind of react to it that way so all of these things are helpful make sure you're making eye contact with people the whole time don't be shifty eyed and do this bit like you know you look like you're suspicious and people will treat you as such um, I don't like to, especially nowadays with uh, social distancing, uh, I don't like to get all up in people's faces at the door. I'm six foot, so I like to stand back. If I'm on like a, a stairs up, I'll take a step down and stand back as I start to as I start to greet them at the door. I don't want to be registered as a threat, okay? Uh, my trainer, who's like uh, when I first started in 2011, Andrew, he he would he's five foot what three or four? He's short little dude. And he would get all up in the door and like open up the glass door and stick his folder in there. And they'd answer and he'd give me kind of already coming in the door. It's pretty funny. Uh, but you don't have to be that aggressive. Um, I prefer the cool and relaxed approach at the door. Um, when you're sitting and when you ring, when you go up to the door, make sure you don't ring the doorbell. Okay. The doorbell doesn't work half the time. Okay. Knock on the door. Okay. Preferably knock on the side door if you're not in an apartment or a condo. Most people use the carports to get to their house. That's where the kitchen typically is located. That's the door that's most used. The front door is almost never used. So try to use the door on the side if you can. And I, again, prefer to knock. Knock like the feds, okay? How do the feds knock? I don't know if they knock. I think they just come in and <laughs> good luck, right? Uh, don't do that. 
Uh, knock like the cops. I think they still sort of kind of follow the rules. So how do you knock like the cops? Take your two knuckles, right? And then you want to knock hard 11 times. I'm going to knock hard, so fair warning, it's going to sound like this. And what that does is it stops everybody. People are like, what was that? And they go right to the door because somebody's at the door and they want to come in. Um, if you knock limp-wristed, half the time the he seniors don't even hear you because they're old and they've got hearing problems, okay? You need to knock to be heard. And I think if you knock with authority, people will respect you with that. And they'll come to the door a little alarmed, but they'll come to the door, okay? So... Um, when you knock and nobody answers, I count to 1,010 and then I knock again. Usually knock a little louder this time. Then I'll count to like 1,015, 1,020. And the final time I knock, I start to say the person's name. Hey, Janice, you there? Janice? And, and that way they know that I know who they are. And maybe if they're just holding out, that maybe they'll answer the door and, you know, let me come in. So um, all the while as I'm waiting for them, if there's a peephole, if it goes dark, then what I want to do is um, wave at the peephole because their big old head and eyeballs looking through it. So I want to wave at them to know I know they're there to develop a beginning sense of rapport um, and, and a little more obligation to actually answer the door, okay? Um, if you're at the home, then what I would recommend that you do is make sure that you also, um, why am I getting Skype calls on here? Not good. I'm in the middle. There we go. Okay. I have an important presentation. People are Skyping. I didn't even know I had a Skype. All right. So what you want to do is uh, make sure you park if you're at somebody's house. Uh, park in the driveway. I like to leave my car on and wave as I'm getting out the door at the window in case somebody's peeping through the screens. They think that I've saw them and hopefully will be more obligated to actually answer. Okay. So um, a couple other things here uh, uh, from a scripting standpoint. When I'm closing at the door, you know, you want to sit out here on the porch or should I come in? Notice how my head is shaking. Yes. And I'll also point to where I want to go. So do you want to sit out here on a porch or should I come in? I'm telling them I want to come in, okay? And hopefully that kind of physicality is leading them to actually answer and let me, or actually let me in the door. It's kind of the same when we wipe off our feet at the door. It's very presumptive, okay? But there's a momentum-like effect that you get when you use uh, language and physicality in a presumptive way, okay? Again, we're trying to push those people over the edge that may or may not do it, but based on our kind of forward kind of approach, they will let us in where maybe they wouldn't if we didn't. So if I say, hey, um, should I take my shoes off before I come in? I'll start to scrape my my feet on the you know doormat and, and kind of motion that I'm ready to come in, okay? Again, little things that help us get in the door and leverage more out of this. Is it, is it kind of ballsy in a little way? Sure. But you got to be that way. You got to be bold. You know, fortune favors the bold, as the old saying says. Okay. Um, last thing on the physicality here before we talk about objections, which really are the same thing. Um, when the person answers the door, again, the same exact script. But what I do is I show them, I show them on the screen. Let me uh, change back over to this. What I do is show them on the screen what I've got here. So I'll say, hey, Mrs. Jones, my name is David Duford. And the reason I'm here is because you had requested information on our new state regulated final expense programs. And it's my job to deliver this information. What you decide to do with this is up to you. Do you want to sit out on the porch or should I come in? Notice what I did with the card. I, I sh If you have a postcard, I show them where they filled this out, okay? I show them where it fills it out, but I don't actually hand the card to them to read it. I used to make this stupid mistake. What happens is they're like, hmm, free information. Is this free? State regulated program. Walmart card. I got a $100 Walmart card. And you're like, oh boy, I got to, now you got to unravel all that stuff. So what you don't want to do is give up control of the card. You want to basically point with your finger as you're talking to them where they signed it or where they filled it out. Okay. That tells them that they did this. 
But as I indicate it, and as I see their eye contacts made to what I'm showing, because they will look at what I'm showing them, I'm gonna uh, uh, casually take it away as I go through it. So it looks again, something like this. Hey, Mrs. Jones, right? Hey, my name is David Duford. I am here because you had requested this information about our new state regulated final expense programs. And I was actually being between appointments and it's I'm here because it's my job to deliver this information, so on and so forth. But notice how I just casually, I didn't like rip it away. I didn't give it to him, so I didn't have to rip it away. I just showed it to him and then casually took it back. If I'm working Facebook leads like this, guys, I'm gonna have a spreadsheet, like an Excel spreadsheet. I'm gonna have each of the clients, I'm gonna blow up the size of it so they can read it easier. If it's on like 12 point font Arial, they won't be able to read it. Blow it up to 25 point font. So that, that what I'll do here is I'll say, hey, you said that your favorite hobby was spelunking and the reason that I'm here is da 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 da. So I, again, use the same methodology, but I point to where they had, they put that their favorite hobby was spelunking. And it's, it kind of has the same impact, not as good as a card, but it has a similar impact on jogging their memory about what it is that I did, okay? So um, those are kind of the things there that work. Okay, let's talk about some of the things here in the chat. Um, what's going on here with some questions here, da 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 da. Uh, thank you very much, Al, appreciate it, guys. Um, what about text message leads on initial contact? I prefer you just to talk to them on the phone. Sales are made over the phone, not on text. Uh, that's the exception, not the rule. We want to do what the rule is, which is talking to people. So call the phone, get them on the phone. I haven't seen many door knockers around in a long time. Maybe it's in my area. More reason to do it. They're definitely out there. Um, door knocking is probably working better than it ever has been, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would absolutely recommend that you uh, implement this. In fact, I will say this if I didn't, door knocking is non-negotiable. If there's one thing that is negotiable, it's calling people. You don't have to pick up the phone to prospect face to face. I think you should learn the skill set. It's very powerful when you get good at it. But if you don't want to do it for some reason, you got a door knock. And, and, and also you can't just call to set appointments to see people as a new agent. You've got to call and door knock. So really the door knocking thing arguably is the most important strategy to learn and get good at because without it, you're just not going to realize the conversion rates that you could get as a face-to-face -face agent. All right, moving on here. Um, hey, uh, Lewis, uh, Alex, not many have the determination to do it. That means your area is not oversaturated. Yeah, well, those are good things, right? You're welcome, uh, guided plans, appreciate you. Curious, why do you use the word new state regulate? It's new to them. You don't have to do it if you don't feel good about it. Um, again, it's one of those gray areas in the scripting that really is your decision. You could just say, hey, I'm calling about the state regulated final expense program information you requested. That works just as good. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, what rebuttal uh, do you have when somebody says, this is social security or this is life insurance? If you go back, uh, so at the door, it's the same as over the phone. Let me get to that in a second because we'll cover that awesome beauty. Mariah, you need to start, uh, need that heart stopping knock. <laughs> exactly. I'm telling you, I've, I've had people accuse me of being the cops several times, um, but they still let me in. Uh, so to wear a mask at the door or not, I don't think we need to wear a mask anymore. If you have to or want to for personal discretion, that's your business. Um, I would carry a mask with me. And um, if somebody expressed the interest of me wanting to wear it, I would respect their wishes and do it. Um, but I think in most places, that's unnecessary at this point. Uh, maybe carry it around your ear if you really feel the comfort for it or carry it somewhere close if you need to, okay? Let's keep politics out of here. <laughs> that only a matter of time, right? Uh, feels like that might be too pushy. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, what part of that too pushy, Alex? Uh, just clarify for me and let me know and I'll, I'll clarify it. Haha, you look at the peephole. Oh yeah, absolutely. If you if you look at a peephole, um, meaning the door people, uh, they call it something else if they do, correct me if I'm wrong. You know what I'm talking about though. It, it should have light coming through it, okay? But when somebody's head gets in the way of it, it goes dark. That means somebody's looking at it. So you can safely wave at it and hopefully get them to answer. What about ring camera? Um, to me, don't hit the ring camera. Just knock their door. This really isn't a big deal in the final expense market. If you run into a lot of ring cameras, you're probably running into circumstances where your income level is a little high. 
I would knock on the door, just like we're talking about, even if there's a ring camera. Um, I would treat, if they answer on the ring camera, then I will just do the script that I would have. Okay, just I wouldn't change anything about it. But I wouldn't ask to be on the ring camera. I try to knock on the door first, if that makes sense. Does this level of boldness work for women as well? Probably better, uh, Valentine. It's funny. It's funny you mention that because I have an agent, Jess, uh, in Vegas, and and she has always been aggressive like this. Um, and I say aggressive because that's the kind of reaction you have to some of this stuff. It's like that's kind of pushy, right? Um, and it <laughs> it always worked well for her, and. Um, she did very, very well at it. Uh, so if she was on here, she'd definitely reinforce this. But she was always wiping her feet, making her way in the door. You know, it was always pushy like that. Kind of, again, pushy, quote unquote. And it works fine. If they're going to tell you no, they're going to tell you no. And there's nothing to do about it. When you turn off the car, uh, if left running when door knocking, uh, use your discretion. Like if you're in a bad neighborhood, you know, and you don't want your car stolen, turn it off. I, I never, if I've ever felt like I was, I wouldn't do this, right? I mean, use common sense here. But I left it on just because it looks as if I'm not there to sell them. I'm just stopping by asking a quick question before I'm going. It, it gives the observation that I'm just here for a moment. It's truly your uh, uh, discretion, though. It probably doesn't, it really doesn't do much. But it's a lot of this door knocking stuff at some level is inspiration for me to actually go do the thing because I can tell you guys I have the same kind of mental hang-ups as everybody else it's like oh I got to knock on this person's door what happens oh no I don't want to get rejected right and it's just like exercise if you just get through the first door knock or two the rest are going to be a lot easier but I do these kind of things to psychologically get me in the mood and if anything like the door open thing um, the, the processes I'm teaching it gets me comfortable with accepting that I'm going to do this and I know that may sound strange but we all face the same kind of anxiety, I think. I know I do. Uh, and this is what helps me do it anyway. Okay. Uh, David, what about the door knocking fairly dangerous area? Uh, again, please don't put yourself in harm's way. Don't do anything where you might regret it, right? So just, you know, please lock the door and roll the windows up. And <laughs> don't make that version of it. New cars turn off by themselves after 10 minutes. I'll leave mine running in the summer. When I hear the little dog come to the door, I know the owner is, is, is at the door. Right, exactly. Um, it's kind of funny. Um, I think part of the reason I started keeping my car on is because my uh, my starter failed. Uh, that Because I would turn... It's funny how many times you turn the freaking car on as you're doing door knocking, you know, or running face-to-face -face appointments. It's like, I probably start the car like 25, 30 times a day. And I was like, well, I don't want to spend $1,000 on a starter again. So let me just like leave it running and cut it in half, you know. So maybe that was part of the inspiration. No problem at all. Kids and husband are nonstop politics. Yeah, yeah. I like to turn to the side and make sure they can see my hands so it takes pressure off of them. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah, you know, uh, hands are visible. What is the income level of final expense? Uh, working class, uh, lower income is what I would say, uh, roughly. Uh, in numerical terms, on the mail outs, zero to 65,000. Why is it zero? Why is it 65? Somewhere in the middle there, but it's just kind of like a broad net that you cast. And income levels on data is highly dubious. So that's why it's pretty wide. Can you address some safety issues? Um, use common sense. Um, I won't door knock anywhere that has um, beware of dogs personally. Some people do just fine. A lot of the times the beware of dog stuff is just like a little Yorkie. <laughs> It's funny, my my mother-in-law is here right now and they got the beware of dog sign, you know, right as you go up the, the hill and they're out in the country, you know, it's just exactly what you would think it is. And it's 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 like, we, sure, we shoot first, ask questions later, and they're the nicest people. And um, either, the beware of dog is like literally a, an, an elderly 18-year-old miniature Yorkie that probably isn't more than five pounds. It wears a diaper and it can't see, you know. <laughs> that's what, but but the stu that stuff. But until it isn't, then you walk in and it's it's a it's a man eating pit bull, and you're in trouble, right? And I've had those circumstances. So for like just, you got to make your own boundaries up. Please follow them. The worst thing you can do is just, you know, that you, you could just call them at the door. Hey, I'm out here. I'm I'm here to see you. you. You got any dogs I need to worry about before I come in and meet you? You could call them from the door if that's kind of what you're up against too. 
but please just use women's intuition if, if you're a lady and you're asking this question, Susan, um, and I know you are, but you get what I'm saying, right? You know, don't do anything that just doesn't seem like a good idea. What do you carry to the door? Uh, Glock uh, 43. Uh, oh, <laughs> um, I carry uh, nothing when I go to the door. I want to be seen as not a threat, okay? So um, I just, I bring like the lead card, that's it. And then when they say, yeah, I say, hey, okay, well, let me go shut my car off before I go and close everything up and I'll be right back. I've never had a point where they locked the door and didn't let me come in after that, by the way. So again, I wanna be perceived as somebody who's not there bringing their whole pack of stuff, their computer, their briefcase and everything else. Oh boy, what's he here to do? I don't wanna be perceived that way. I want to lower their threat uh, uh, perception as much as I can, okay? Uh, I didn't say you can come in. Oh, that's okay, Miss Prospect. Let's just sit out here on the porch instead. And then I'll start making my way that way, Steve. Supplementing my retirement income. I'm custom to door knocking, retail, sales, and collections. Uh, any advice? Um, yeah, just follow the script. <laughs> You'll be fine, I guess, Ned. If you want to give more uh, specificity, though, let me know. Is door knocking like running debit route? They will expect you to come get payments. No, they're not expecting you at all. Like even though they sent the card back, they're not expecting you. But the card or the lead is leverage to get in the door, right? I mean, if you get in trouble inside of the home, um, say like 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 you find out that they're, you know, like bad people. I mean, just like in the appointment and leave. I, I'd have to give them more specificity. Thank you, Tony. Appreciate it. Okay. Now let's look at objections here. And, and thanks for everybody sticking here, man. Man, we've had so many live. By the way, if you like this content, hit the thumbs up button if you don't mind. Uh, that will help us share this that much more across the YouTubes. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. I appreciate you all so much. David, do you have any agents or do you work with agents who primarily are singularly focused on FIAs, IULs? Uh, I do have an agent that does annuities, uh, davidduford.com forward slash FAQ. If you go there, click on annuities you can see what steven does uh he pretty much just strictly works annuities um yes i'm sure they do tell me <laughs> okay real quick here we're about to go do door knocking objections before we take a break and, and feature one of our sponsors but i want to make sure we, we share with you guys again davidduford.com forward slash scripts uh if you're interested in getting any of the scripts we're talking about right now as well as the presentation script which, which we're about to jump into here in a little while in addition to our final expense cheat sheet, resources to use in the home, please go to davidduford.com forward slash scripts. If you try to request this and it doesn't work, email me at support at davidduford.com. I will reply to that probably um, sometime soon and then get you that information and um, have it emailed to you personally, okay? And like momentarily, right? All right, moving on here. Let's go to the door knocking objection script. All right. Again, this will all look very familiar. So uh, I don't remember sending the card in. Hey, that's okay, Mr. Prospect. This is your signature right here. And all I need is five minutes to show you how these programs work and whatever you do with it's up to you. Do I need to take my shoes off before I come in? Again, scraping the floor with your feet, all right? Again, same thing. Remember the ask methodology. You answer the objection, you sell the appointment, and you close. Exactly the same process here, okay? Objection number two, I thought I was getting something mailed. No problem, Mrs. Prospect. It's my job to show you how this works, and all I need is five minutes to do my job, and what you do with it's up to you. Do I need to take my shoes off before I come in? Objection number three, oh, I'm not interested anymore. No problem, Mr. Prospect. It's my job to show you how this works. All I need is five minutes to do that. Do you want to sit out in the porch or should I come in? I already got life insurance. Great. All I need is five minutes to show you how these programs work and what you decide to do with this is totally up to you. Is it okay if I take my shoes off before I come in? Number five, I am busy in, uh, uh, now in appointments or I'm about to leave. Uh, hey, no problem, Mrs. Prospect. I'm actually working late. Why don't I come by at six o'clock or does eight work better? So you would just go back to rebooking. By the way, at the door, if they're busy, we want to rebook immediately for the same day at a later time. If, um, if that doesn't work, then book for the next day. But please don't book more than a day out. Uh, you'll find that the no-show rate drops precipitously. Okay. Any questions on rebuttals here? Anybody got anything you'd like me to clarify on the rebuttal side of the equation at the door? Oh, no, Tony, that's your, we're just goofing around. I'm, 
I'm fine with that. Okay. So uh, let's see here. One thing I wanted to cover here that I mentioned uh, on the appointment setting script. Okay. When you get in, on, when, when they say yes at the door, you just go in. Okay. Right. You get it. Like there's not a lot you have to do after that. But for the appointment setting, there definitely is some stuff you've got to cover before you get in. And I want to make sure to cover that really briefly here because I forgot to do that. So I'm sorry. I'm first time doing one of these big trainings live. So hopefully you can forgive me. So I'm going to um, show you on the screen what happens when they say yes, when they say, okay, 10 sounds good. What do you say after that? So there's, there's some things you've got to do after the appointment setting script and the objection rebuttal to book the appointment, okay? And to, to book it solid. And we're gonna go over that right now. So let's see, I'm sharing the screen. So they say, yeah, 10 a.m. works. Here's what you say. First of all, you say, okay, I'm just confirming your address as 123 Main Street, is that right? Great. And perfect, is this information for you only or for your spouse as well? Now this is very important here, guys. You don't want to do what's called a one-legger. What's a one-legger? A one-legger is where you just talk to one of the two spouses. The other spouse isn't present, and you'll likely get the let me talk to my spouse objection, which is very difficult to overcome. It's better to see both of them, to convince both simultaneously, and then the guess what? Sell two policies in many cases instead of one. We don't want to turn this into a multi-step sales process because that's less time for us to close somebody else. But the issue here is what we don't want to do is say, hey, is your husband, husband going to be there to, uh, think, uh, to, uh, to decide on this too? Because when you say something as stupid as that or, or imply that, you're um, challenging the decision-making capability of the lady of the house um, or the man of the house sometimes too. So instead of suggesting, and, and in, in some cases, I have, we, we reviewed a call the other week from an agent who's good, who, who started asking, is the husband going to be there? Is he going to be there at three? Is he going to be there at six? The problem that I kind of took from listening to that, it just sounded like this guy's like up to no good. Like he really wants to know if that husband's going to be there to the point of like, I think my safety's in danger as a woman. That's how I understood it. That wasn't how this particular agent meant it. I could tell he was sincere, sincerely wanted the other person there to make sure that both could hear about this information. So you have to think about how you're going to suggest this. And the best way that I've come up with is saying in the confirmation part, perfect, and is this information just for you or for your spouse as well? We assume that person is married, okay? And what you'll hear many times is if, is if they're not married, they'll say, hell, I haven't been married for years, I'm divorced, or no, 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 I'm single, it's just for me. And in that case, we just say great and then continue to book because they have voluntarily shared with us that it's just us that you have to worry about in the decision-making process. But if they say, no, this is just for myself, my husband's already got life insurance, let's say, or, or, or they say it's for both of us, then what you'll wanna do is rebook the appointment. You wanna say something like, okay, well, just to make sure, because this is something that what I've experienced, both people want to listen to and both wanna give their perspective, um, that they both wanna be there, is two o'clock still a good time for both of you to be there? Or should we book later, say at four o'clock or does six work better? I will go back and rebook that appointment to make sure that both are there. Again, I can think on one hand out of probably a hundred plus attempts to pitch a one-legger to close them that I actually closed. You will waste in a, in a, a ton of time by trying to pitch one-legger appointments. Make sure both are there. Get both prospects in the room and only see them when both of them are there. Plus, you don't want to go back and do a second or a third call to book uh, to close the other person if you were somehow to magically get that other one, which is very low odds chance of happening, okay? Now, um, at this point, we ask for directions, not because we need them, because we all have GPS at this point. We ask them to help the client get engaged in booking the appointment. You don't have to record this stuff down. You want them to kind of recite, oh, well, you do this, you turn here, you look there, and my apartment is on the third floor, it's got the wreath on it, right? The process of them going through this helps them recall this instance in time where they're on the phone, right? Because the risk we all run is setting appointments that no show, right? So again, this is the reason this is in the, uh, uh, the script. We ask them to write down the time we're gonna be there, our name, and then also the other thing we do is book like the cable man. Very, very important to do. You have to book like the cable man, okay? 
So uh, it sounds like this, and I'll explain it after I do the script. Perfect. Oh, yeah, one more thing. Please expect me somewhere between 10 and 10.30 in case I get stuck in traffic. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow at 10, but please give me up to 10.30. You have a good rest of your day. So we do that because what we're trying to do here is give ourselves an arrival window that allows for flexibility. If we try to write an application, it ends up getting declined or an appointment goes longer because it's a husband-wife combo or something unexpected happens that requires more of our time. When you give yourself an arrival window, it can be 30 minutes, it can be two hours. I used to run two hour windows and that was okay. I think I had a little higher show rate at an hour window, but not too much. Um, it makes your life so much less stressful. You don't have to worry about showing up for a 12 o'clock appointment at 12.03 and people like losing their minds because uh, they think um, you know, you're late. If you give them that arrival window, they'll accept it. You set the standards or the terms of engagement and uh, you should be fine and good to go, okay? All right, any questions on booking and securing that appointment? Let's see here. If you find the person and he let you in, but you are already in, and he told you later, your wife is not here, you pack up and leave. You say, oh, your wife's not here, well, let's do this. Um, I'm actually gonna be back later tonight. And what I found with a lot of spouses out there is they want both in there and available to hear what this is about. Why don't I come by later today at four o'clock or does six work better? You just rebook from that point. I was in an appointment really early, like at an 8 a.m. appointment and the wife was there, let me in in Cleveland, Tennessee. And she was real nice, she was interested, but her husband was asleep, he's been on the road, he put up signs for, for you know, restaurants and that kind of thing. I said, hey, let, let me come back another day so both y'all can listen to this and both y'all can kind of talk this out and see if it's a good idea for you. Can I come by Thursday at nine or does 11 work better? And we rebooked it, I closed them, and I was so glad that I actually ran it um, that way because I would have not gotten her closed. And, and then if I showed up and he wakes up out of bed and some man's in her home, that he doesn't know anything about, that looks pretty strange too. You know what I mean? Like I want to be there on terms where both of them can engage, right? What about nasty homes? Leave shoes on. Yeah, yeah you may want to leave them on if there's like cockroaches running everywhere. That's an acceptable decision. Uh, Guillermo, uh, I'll make a la later appointment. One leggers have sold more often cancel. Yep, um, 100%. Nasty homes, I'll leave shoes on. They're not going to ask you to take your shoes off. They totally understand why you wouldn't. <laughs> Oh, the phone, on the phone presentations, how do you approach the one-legged appointments? Uh, there you go. I think I uh, covered that pretty good. I'm extremely interested to start this. Great. Cool. Okay. Well, very good. Hopefully, uh, so far, so good. We're going to now play uh, the uh, video from Security National, I think is what I said that we're going to start with. I'm going to take a little break here. I'm going to have on a couple of folks from the Security National team. Security National is a great final expense product, one of our proud sponsors of today's segment. And uh, they're going to tell you a little bit about the Security National final expense product, its advantages, why agents choose to do business with them. If you're looking for good final expense carriers, you'll enjoy this particular training. So I'm going to turn it over to that. And then uh, after this is over, we'll get back and we're actually going to jump right into the actual presentation uh, a final expense sales presentation person and begin to discuss that more. So uh, sit tight. Let me go ahead and pull this up and uh, we will get the balls. <clears throat> Greetings and salutations. How you guys doing out there? It's Dave Dufort. I'm here with Stephen Lowry and Adam Burson of Security National Life. How y'all doing today? Doing all right. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, it's wonderful to be here, David. Thank you. Appreciate you kindly. So thanks, guys, first of all, for uh, sponsoring my final expense face-to-face -face event. Uh, you guys are here, of course, to talk about Security National Life as a company, as well as a final expense product. So just for my audience's sake, we're going to go into a deep dive of how the SNL product works so you can better understand what the advantages are and why you want to write them. So we're going to first start off if you, uh, Adam or Steve, want to kind of give us a rundown of uh, Security National Life from the top, uh, just a brief description, and then we'll jump right into the final expense product and take from there. Go ahead, Adam. Uh, well, I would say we're a smaller company. We've been in business since 1965. 
uh, publicly traded company. And uh, I mean, we've grown quite a bit. I've been here now for seven years. Right. And I mean, when I first started here, we had about 750 million in assets. And now we are about 1.5, 1.6, if I'm correct. Is that, does that sound right, Stephen? Yeah, 1.5 or 6 billion in assets. That's what I meant. That, that's what I meant, billion. So, so yeah, we've grown significantly over the last six, seven years. Um, I mean, I think a lot of it, it's the agents, the agents that are going out right in the business. I mean, we we wouldn't be a company without the hardworking agents that are out there that are representing us and right in business with us. Right, right. So, um, so yeah, you know, pretty good, pretty good stuff. So let's let's talk about the product. So, of course, I've worked with you guys for many years now in the final expense space, writing the uh, final expense products that you guys do. Can you kind of give us a run a run through of how the product works and and kind of some just basics of of how the SNL product for final expense works? Sure. So our, our flagship product is called the Simple Security Plan, and it begins at age 40, has three underwriting classes, uh, preferred and standard, go up through uh, age 90, and our modified product ends at age 85. Um, we have smoker and non-smoker rates for that uh, product, and it's it's a very simple you know, kind of three-tiered application. Uh, underwriting class is determined by a person's height and weight, the answers to the health questionnaire, and the uh, and the medications and combinations of medications that they use. Uh, it's a four-page application. It can be completed in 10 minutes tops. It's, uh, it's a really easy way to do business. And frankly, our rates are, are competitive. They're among the best in the industry and our uh, compensation as well. So it's a good, simple product for an agent to build a baseline uh, for their, their final expense business. It's a good go-to. Gotcha. So a little bit about the product. First of all, I think a big selling point is not a lot of carriers go to age 90. So most quit at 80, maybe 85. So for the older people, that is definitely a, a nice little niche. Um, from from a product standpoint, is your application paper, electronic application? Do you get an instant decision when you submit it? How does that all work? Yeah, we have a paper app. We also have the, the e-app. Um, it's really to me, it's really up to the agent, whichever way that they would prefer to submit. Some people prefer a paper app, some people prefer the, the e app. Um, and I think the process and underwriting it, it, it's about the same when it comes to how long it takes to get that piece of business issued. We do have on our web app the ability where, uh, well, once the web app is submitted, the agent would contact the home office, they would do a quick phone call. It's it's about maybe five minutes simply just to verify identity. Yeah. And the agent does have the choice on that call if they do want to have a decision right then and there. Okay. So so they can get the instant decision if they'd like. Sometimes there's some scenarios that maybe they'd be better off to uh, have underwriting, maybe take another look at it. Sure. Sometimes with the dual purpose meds, things like that, um, where if an underwriting is actually looking at it, they, they may get a better decision. So okay. compared to the software that's going to run. So, okay. Uh, so yeah, like I said, but we train our, our agents kind of when to use each and, uh, but it's, it's really up to the agent, you know, whether they want to do a paper app or, or an e-app. So the phone verifications for either the paper or the e-app, correct? Uh, it's only for the e-app. Oh, okay. Yeah. On a paper app, we don't require any phone verification. So you can submit it and then get an answer. If, yeah. They'd submit it. Important. They would, yeah. uh, exactly. And the phone and the phone verification. So it's just like five minutes. It's not like a 20 minute grind or anything like that. It's a very quick phone call. They are not re asking all of the health questions. Oh, good. I've seen some okay. companies where it's like a nightmare. I mean, you're on the phone for 20, 30 minutes to get it done. Yeah. It's a quick call. They, the reason they do it actually is because of uh, COVID when we got into telesales. Oh, really? And, uh, okay. and they wanted to be able to still get, at least that that client's voice recorded to say, yes, yeah. I want to take out a policy. Right, right. So, so top, that's when we went to doing the quick five minute phone call, just simply to verify identity. Right, cool. And then, and then you said there is an option at the end of that to then get a decision. Exactly. Yeah, if they want the decision right then and there, they can get it. Yeah, that's and I, I made the joke about the interview because a lot of these carriers out there, I mean, you're on the phone for 20 minutes and they've got 15 questions and you ask it word for word. They read the HIPAA stuff 
you know, it's nice to get through stuff quickly. Right. Yeah. Um, you mentioned telesales. How does that work with you guys as far as the differences between selling face to face and over the phone? Well, it's a pretty simple process. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really pretty much the same. I mean, our web app, it can be used over the phone or face to face. And, uh, and <clears throat> sorry about that. Um, yeah, it can be used over the phone or face to face. And, uh, and that's why, you know, like I said, you know, that's why both ways we have to do the phone verification. The company really doesn't determine whether it's being done over the phone or face to face. It's the same process for either. So, but it's a simple process. Like I said, you fill out the web app, you submit it, you call in to do the verification and, and it's done. Move on to the next. Gotcha. Steve, do you want to add something to that? No, I think it's, I think Adam covered it very well. Uh, I love the telesales uh, process. Uh, you can, in fact, you can use the web app at the kitchen table. If you're a face-to-face -face salesperson, uh, you still have to do the complete the phone call. Um, but it's, it's so easy. It's so simple. And our operators are absolutely the best at the business in terms of making your client comfortable and, right. uh, and instilling that sense of security and trust in them. And I really think it kind of adds credibility to the agent to do it anyway. So, uh, and like I said, our folks are the best in the business. So I'm, I'm happy that we have this process available. Cool. Excellent. So telesales and face-to-face -face friendly, uh, are you guys offering riders now in the policy? Is there any grandchild coverage or anything like that that's available? Well, no, we don't offer coverage for grandchildren, but we do offer coverage for uh, natural children uh, up okay. to, I think, age 17 uh, when they enroll in the process. The coverage lasts until they're 25 years old. There are a handful of medical conditions that are very, very serious that will disqualify a child from being on the rider, but they're rare. Uh, they're rare and very serious conditions. Um, very simple calculation, uh, to figure out what added premium th that brings to the package. Uh, but our, our excellent, uh, rate calculator calculates all that for you. And we've got wonderful instructions in our underwriting guide. Uh, it's a very simple deal. So yeah, we're happy to offer that. And we also offer, uh, an indemnity on a, an accidental death benefit rider, uh, as well. Again, the uh, rate calculator is very simple to use and it calculates all the, the premiums for you. So yeah, we're, we are trying to accommodate what agents need when they, when they wind up at that kitchen table. What is it that they're going to need in order to, to make a concrete sale to a, a client that's going to satisfy them, give them what they want? Right. No, another thing too, um, Stephen mentioned our main product goes ages 40 through the age of 90. Uh, we do have a secondary product, the security care plan, which actually goes ages zero through the age of 85. Right. Uh, so even younger people, maybe you, maybe an agent runs into a scenario. Maybe there's a grandmother who wants to insure her grandchildren. Well, we have the security care plan that has a 10 pay option where it's whole life it's paid off in 10 years. Someone who's five years old, by the time they're 15, they have a paid off policy and probably paid in about maybe 20 to 30% of the full face amount of the policy. Right. So it's a Excellent. very good deal to the client. Of course, it costs more than having a rider, but it's permanent coverage. And then it's, I always tell the client that, look, it's almost like a gift you're leaving your grandchild. You'll no longer be here, but that's something that they're going to have for the rest of their life. Right. Absolutely. Good point. And the, uh, agent, and the agent earns lead credit on that product as well. Ah, excellent. So let's talk about lead credit. Um, we talked about the lead, lead co-op program. This is something you guys have done for many, many years. How does it work? Go ahead, Adam. Well, you know what? The lead credit program is really what attracted me to coming over here. Um, I was with another company for 11 and a half years. I've always just been pretty simple, focused on one product and one company. Um, and... The lead credit, yeah, that was the seller. Uh, I mean, I was spending, I think the last year my prior company, I probably spent over $50,000 on leads. So right. someone told me about SNL and told me how they would cover half the cost of my leads. I'm like, well, tell me more. Right. So I found out about the lead credit program. I've always been the one that wants to build and grow. And uh, I looked at it as a great recruiting tool, is the lead credit. Because anywhere you go, especially direct mail leads now, you're spending a ton of money at least $40 a lead. Returns have not been great. Right. Uh, well, with the lead credit, 
uh, we will cover half of that lead expense as long as there's enough lead credit available to do so. Uh, the way it works, it's a 10% lead credit. It's based off of the annualized premium of the policy. So you write somebody $1,200 annualized, well, you earn yourself a $120 lead credit. So of course, the more business you write, the more you earn a lead credit, and then we'll use that money to cover half of the lead expense. Uh, we do have a list of preferred vendors that the agent has to go through. So they contact the vendor, they place the lead order. We double check to make sure they have enough lead credit available. They pay their half and we take care of the rest. You know, from my perspective, I think the lead credit program really is the magic sauce that sets us apart from everybody else. Um, and here's why. Every one of us is a business owner. The managers here at Security National Life, the agents, the agency directors that are contracted with us, each of us, from me all the way down to the newest agent that started this morning is a business owner. And marketing is the gasoline that drives your business. And anybody who's not marketing, doesn't have a marketing plan, isn't in the business. They're, they're fooling themselves. And we have devised a way where we can uh, multiply the power of an agent's marketing dollar. Uh, let's pretend your budget's $500 a month. Um, that'll buy you X number of leads. Well, with lead credit, that same $500 buys you X times two leads, which is X times two sales, X times two income at the end of the year, but your marketing budget remained exactly the same. And that really is the magic that, that helps Security National Life agents uh, really become successful. Excellent. Well, yeah, it's all about activity. I mean, the more people you have to see, the more money you're going to make. Right, right. It's a leads business. You got to have them. Got to. It's good to have the support too, financially. Uh, can we can we talk about distribution? As far as um, what states we can sell Security National Life in? Uh, I think it's easier to say what states we can't sell. Yeah, that, that works National too. <laughs> uh, so we're not very active in the Northeast, uh, uh, New York. Uh, I'm not sure if we're in Delaware or not. You know, my territory is in the southern central part of the United States, and I'm not really familiar with those states up there. But I, I know we don't sell in Montana. Uh, what else, Adam? Uh, I know we are not in Massachusetts. Right. Yeah, a lot of the Northeast. We're not in much of the Northeast. I know not many companies are like in New York. Right. Um, but, yeah, we're not in any of those upper Northeast. Uh, we, we are in Pennsylvania. Um, that's one of our recent additions. It was Pennsylvania, Ohio a few years ago. Okay, we added where we were not in those states prior. Um, we're still not in North Carolina. I get a lot of calls from people right. in North Carolina wanting to get going. And unfortunately, we can't help them. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I'd say I, we are in what? I know it's in the 30s, 36, 37 states. Right. So... Yeah, mainly just the Northeast and a little bit out West, I think. Right. Yeah. And I would say, uh, I would say just to put your agents hearts at ease, Dave, uh, all the final expense country States we're in. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Right. Quick, quick question. So can an agent who is in a not acceptable, so let's, let's take a North Carolina agent, right? Can they sell in other States? And get appointed like as a non-resident state with you guys, even though they're not the resident states in a state you guys aren't in. Yeah, as long as they uh, like, if, well, two things: if they're doing telesales, okay. uh, yeah, as long as they, you know they can have multiple licenses and they can sell over the phone. Um, I do have a few agents that are in North Carolina that, yeah, they're licensed in a bunch of states, so they are writing with us. Um, as long as the state is signed in the state that we are in, so. For okay. instance, let's say the person's in North Carolina, but they have a client in South Carolina that wants to take out a policy. As long as they drive to South Carolina and help that client and have that application signed where that person lives, then it's fine. And we can write it. Perfect. Perfect. And that includes telesales, David. So yeah, uh, wherever the client is sitting when that phone call takes place, that's the state where the, where the policy is issued. So that counts. Perfect. So no restrictions on states because you're telesales, in other words? No. Wonderful. Excellent. Okay. Trips. Of course, agents like to go on trips for production. Can you guys talk about how SNL does trips and uh, conventions? 
Usually yeah, been on a 15 month qualification period. Uh, in, in the last trip we had a, we're kind of compressed. We've got a 12 month qualification period because we actually skipped a trip. We were supposed to yeah. go to, uh, Israel in, uh, oh, in yeah. 2020 and of course COVID and then we, we couldn't go. So, uh, we're on our way to Hawaii, uh, the Island of Kauai, uh, later this year in October. Uh, it should be a super fun time. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, generally you're going to get a 15 month qualification period. Historically, we ask agents to produce about $90,000 during that 15 months. Uh, we will make accommodations for agency directors or agency owners uh, to, to try to find a way to get them there as well. And uh, they're, hey, these are world-class trips. We, we put on a show at Security National Life when it comes time for conventions. We go to big-time resorts. Um, we've been to Thailand. We've been to Monaco. Yeah. We've been to Alaska. We've, we've been to some great places. So, uh Trips are a lot of fun. The the qualifications generally it's it's stiff, but it's achievable. And uh, and hey, we want to fill that place up. We want everybody to come with us. So uh, so I encourage everybody uh, when we make our announcement, we'll be announcing our next trip in November. And once we make that announcement, uh, just get some leads, get some business in, and then we'll all go together on the next trip after that. Yeah, I know uh, SNL's always put on really intriguing places like Israel. I don't hear anybody going to Israel. And then Thailand was a couple of years ago. I remember Doug Massey went on that trip. Yeah. Um, it's just this unusual, but but fun, you know? So that's cool. Very good. And then last thing on the list here, contests. Um, I think you guys are mentioning you guys do some regular contests to kind of spur and encourage agents. Can you kind of describe how those work? No, that's another thing. I mean, that attracted me here. Um, well, I didn't really know much about the contest until they hired me and they brought me into the home office, but I was hired in September of 2015. They, they brought me into the office. They handed me this flyer, this brochure for this upcoming contest that they were having. And it's the founders month contest. It's the company's largest contest of the year. And I was looking at the production requirements and the sort of bonuses that you could earn and I just, I couldn't believe it. Like I had never seen that sort of contest in with any other final expense company. Uh, I mean, you can earn thousands of dollars of bonus money. I've actually handed out checks over $12,000 to agents that have uh, just gone out there and worked hard. It's a five week contest. Right. So they're writing a ton of business over those five weeks. And by doing so, they can earn some really good bonus money. So yeah, that's one contest, but I feel like there's always something extra to be able to be working towards here. Uh, there's always some sort of contest going on. Most of them are cash bonuses. Um, we also have a president's club, which now it's going to be, as long as you qualify for the trip, you're also going to earn the company ring. Right. And uh, each year that you qualify for the trip, uh, they'll add diamonds to that ring up until the point that it's totally full. So, uh, so yeah, there's, you know, I've always liked the fact that there's more to work for than just a commission. There's, there's all these extras that, that to me, it just motivates me to get out there and do more. Right. Right. You know, and I think one of the intriguing things about the way we run contests here is that we ask the agent to compete against themselves. So we're going to look back at your history. What did you do last year? If you beat that, you're going to get a bonus. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to be the top agent in your territory or in the nation uh during the contest you just got to be better than you were and that's achievable for all of us and it's a wonderful uh, approach that security national takes to contest awesome guys well i appreciate y'all being here uh to describe security national life the product reasons why to work with you guys can you guys give us like if somebody wants to work with you guys kind of what next steps to take to uh, reach you all out and and do some business well, uh, I, I think that the easiest way is we've got we've got a, a website, securitynationallife.com slash FE training slash. It's got all of our phone numbers on it. Pick the manager you like and give them a call. And if you're in the wrong place, we'll help you get to the yeah. right manager. Uh, uh, I'll share my phone number right now and Adam will share his. I'm sure I'm, I'm at 985-264-8697. I'd love to hear from you and we'll find a good fit for you among the the roster of managers that we have, make sure you're well taken care of. 
Yeah, and I can be reached at uh, 815-693-8299. And that's, you know, another thing I wanted to mention real quick that I kind of feel separates us from some of the other carriers out there is that we do have that, that local presence. We do have experienced managers across the country, people that have been in the business a long time that, that can help. And that's what we're here to do. So, you know, you're not just dealing with the home office directly. You're dealing with us. And our goal is to help our agents to be highly successful. So, yeah, I've known you two uh, for a number of years and both of you are, have street cred in the business, you know, and you don't get that with most of these carriers. They have, usually have no clue <laughs> anything about final <laughs> expense, you know? So uh, yeah, on that note, Dave, uh, just to let your, your folks know that uh, before I ever got into the final expense business, David was kind enough to let me drive across Tennessee and ride with him for a couple of days to make my mind up whether I wanted to be in this business or not. When was that? uh, That was like 2011, 2012? It was a million years ago. I had a head full of beautiful hair at that time. All right, that's what I was thinking. I don't think you were bald back then. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I don't know if you remember, like, really, I I mean, a lot of my business, I've found so many people just through the content that I've provided through social media. And I don't know if you remember, but I I had reached out to you kind of like right when I wanted to start kind of building that up and posting I think videos I remember, and yeah. stuff. And I mean, you just shared a couple of little tips, but you know, just that, I mean, it was motivating to kind of help me move forward with it. And I mean, I'm telling you, I mean, my business wouldn't be where it is today had it, had it not been for kind of taking that step forward with social media. So yeah, no, that's, it's money. <laughs> it <Yeah>. really is. <laughs> well, guys, thanks again for being here. Appreciate you very much. Thank you, Dave. Thanks a lot, David. Take care. See you. And we're back. Welcome back. Isn't that cool? You know how quick I can change a wardrobe. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to our final expense training spectacular. It's your humble correspondent, El Jefe, here to teach you on all things final expense face-to-face sales. Uh, We are plodding our way through an incredible amount of information and uh, slowly but surely getting into uh, the uh, training of actually presenting final expense. We spent the last couple of hours, of course, talking about setting appointments at the door and in person. Probably the most critical training you can do and take seriously and spend your time practicing and perfecting. And now we're going to move and transition into the actual presentation itself. What you do when you're actually in the door. What do you say? How do you say things? What do you not say? Uh, We're gonna cover that in its entirety uh, for quite a good bit while uh, and um, really give you all the uh, the keys to the kingdom, I guess you could say, when it comes to selling final expense successfully. So a couple of things here. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you there to Security National Life. Of course, our other sponsors as well, iLife and Trinity Family Benefit. We'll hear more from them momentarily. Uh, Security National Life, I think this is the uh, correct um, website if you want to go there. Um, also, we're going to be talking about scripts. Uh, www. Um, sorry for these dang posts here in the chat. I wish I could get rid of them. I got to keep hiding them. All right. Uh, www. Uh, DavidDufour.com forward slash scripts. Uh, that's going to give you the scripting to the presentation and a lot of the resources that we're using. So uh, just uh, be looking out for that. And uh, we'll have more on that momentarily. And using the script here. So as we get into the final expense presentation, um, <clears throat> we look at this script in four different stages. Again, um, our first stage, what we'll be talking about is, is rapport building and the introduction part of the stage. This first stage really is designed to sell ourselves in a sense, uh, just Google search it, Corey, I'm sorry, but thank you. Yeah, I might have spelled it wrong, probably what it was. Uh, yeah, national life, there's one L, there should be two there. Um, But the rapport building part of the training here, the purpose of it really is to make that initial connection to the prospect. It's to get them relaxed, at ease and comfortable with us, to invariably open their mind to what it is that we have to say and to be willing to listen to us. This is a critical step of the presentation. Without rapport and without a connection, You're not going to do very well convincing somebody to buy from you. So we have to deliberately build the foundation to a relationship 
uh, purposely right here at the beginning of the presentation as we're inside. How much rapport building should you do? This is a common question that I get asked. A lot of people think that, you know, um, should you spend and talk 10 minutes, 15 minutes, five minutes, one minute? Uh, and that's a great question to ask. And here's how I would answer it as we get into the actual scripting here. Rapport building is something that you just need enough of. I went on a uh, training uh, once with some guys that were with, uh, oh, I forget what their guys' names was, uh, Tim, uh, Tim Winders. Uh, some of you guys, maybe if you've been around long enough, remember Tim Winder. Um, I forget the agency he was with, but he was doing a training. And the only thing that I really picked up that stuck with me forever was all rapport building is about ultimately is breaking the ice. All we really care about to do is just get the client uh, friendly with us. Being friendly is different from being friends, right? Like it takes time and effort to develop a friendship. But being friendly is something you can establish in a couple of minutes uh, if you know what to focus on. And of course, we'll teach you that. And it's just uh, being friendly is all you really need. You just just need a little bit of friendliness and openness to create a, 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 a position of relaxation from the client so that they'll be open-minded to what you're going to say. Now, one other element of rapport building too, and this is probably the most difficult part of rapport building. In a sense, it's the most subjective part of the script. You know, we talk about the script. One of the elements that I train my agents on is you got to follow the script. Like the script is there for a reason. It's it's the track you run on. We don't put the script together to not follow it or to feel like following certain parts. The script is put together for you to follow it. It is the standard operating procedure that gets results. Why would you deviate from it, right? But the problem with the rapport building side is there's a sense of read and react that goes on. When I say read and react, uh, this is that skill set that you have to develop in the heat of the moment to read what's going on and then react accordingly. For example, I can't tell you what rapport building question for sure for each of your prospects is going to find them uh, be more endeared to you, uh, that they're gonna be flattered by. They may love talking about how retirement is not all it's cracked up to be, um, or they may sneer at it and think it's a silly question. I don't know what to expect. So you have to think on your feet and be aware of your surroundings and how the client's answering. And when you find something of interest to the client that the client likes to voluntarily talk about, it's better strategically to go deeper than it is to go wider with more questions. Again, one of the things I notice, <clears throat> more of an issue with telesales agents, but certainly the case with face-to-face -face agents, is that sometimes agents will not go the... Um, they think that kind of checking the boxes on the script we're about to look at for the presentation is all you really need to do with the rapport building stage, but it's really not. You, you, you want to find the thing that they're interested in, then focus your entire conversation about that thing that they're interested in and ask some follow-up questions. And generally speaking, the average time to build sufficient rapport is just a couple of minutes. Sometimes it's less. Sometimes it's more, it just kind of depends on the person. But rapport building is something that shouldn't take you 10, 15, 20 minutes. If you're taking that long to build rapport with somebody, you're either just an incredibly wonderful people person that um, is gonna find that your time is gonna be taken advantage of and it's not gonna be used as effectively as possible, um, or you're not seeing the cues that the client gives you that they're comfortable with you and ready to proceed. So a couple of things on this just to discuss. Rapport building, what are some of the cues we need to be concerned with? Number one is their physical um, tells, right? Everybody has tells that tell you that they're relaxed or comfortable. What I'm looking for is physical signs of relaxation. Um, uh, they're, they're comfortable in their seat, they're set back. They're not covering up with their arms covered up like this. They're looking you in the eyes like Brian said. They're smiling. My favorite is they're laughing. If I got them laughing, I got what I need. They're comfortable with me. Somebody who's laughing, hopefully with me, not at me, <laughs> is somebody who's comfortable being themselves, okay? So that's a good sign that they're comfortable and that they're willing to um, listen to you. So in fact, when I hear them laughing, I'm looking for the exit ramp into the next part of the stage. So um, these are the things I'm looking for. A couple other tenets really important with rapport building. You've got to ask open-ended questions focused 
on the prospect, not focused on you. A common mistake agents make is they'll say, I, so I see, um, so do you have any grandkids? Uh, yeah, I've got five grandkids. Oh, that's awesome. I have grandkids too. I'm actually 55 and I just had a grandkid yesterday and boy, it's the greatest thing I've ever seen. Uh, you know, she's five pounds and, you know, came a little early, but da, 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 boring. Nobody cares about you yet, yet. You see, the problem with a lot of rapport building, it's like, okay, now you told me an inkling about yourself. Let me tell you a tsunami about me, right? That is a wrong way to approach rapport. And a lot of this is meant with good intentions, but they're, they're met with resistance because now you're focusing the conversation on you. The point of rapport building is not to tell them about you. It's for you to listen about them telling themselves about themselves. Does that make sense, everybody? The goal of rapport building is to focus on the interests of the client. Again, I had a client who was talking to a prospect. She had had bladder cancer. We were listening to her and critiquing a sales presentation. And as soon as she mentioned that, he said, oh, that yeah, it's terrible. I had prostate cancer and took the next like two minutes describing the intricacies of having prostate cancer, which, listen, I'm sure for a lady isn't a nice thing to hear with a stranger. So uh, a little weird, right? The better thing to do would have been to say, oh, wow, how, what happened? How did you get it? How was, did you have to do chemo? Really? What was that like? Was it painful? How did you survive? How did you, were you, were you close to death? What was that like? Like, I want to focus that rapport building stuff on her first and foremost. Okay. It doesn't mean you can't talk about yourself, but take the perspective that talking about yourself is not the priority here. It's not. Uh, people will find you actually more interesting and intriguing the less you talk about them and the more you talk about the, the prospect. It's an interesting process that I think you'll draw people more magnetically to you when you're asking questions about them and keeping it all about them. Body imaging also, if someone leans back and I will match it 100%, um, we call this mirroring. You know, you can even mirror their cadence and their voice and their inflection. Um, you don't want to be uh, ingenuous about or disingenuous about it. You don't want to be like copycat. Uh, but um, I uh, definitely will slow my pace down when somebody's a little quieter or maybe pick it up a little bit if they're kind of loud and I'll kind of match them too as well. That kind of mirroring shows some kind of commonality I think is the way to look at it though, but it is, it is a nice little technique. So that is how we look at the basic fundamentals of rapport. So what questions do you actually ask? Um, let's pull up the script and we're going to go over that process um, right away so that we can take a look um, how to actually put all these concepts uh, into action. So just bear with me while I, while I pull up the presentation script. And then I'm gonna show it on the screen. We're gonna take a sip of coffee. I'm going to jump over. You guys should see the uh, script. Okay, and remember daviddeforward.com forward slash scripts if you want to download this for free along with every other resource we talked about today. So when you come in the door, the first thing you wanna do is take command, take command, okay? Um, this little dance we're doing is about alpha and beta, who's in charge and who's not in charge. And it starts with little things which build ultimately to the big thing, which is the close, the sale, the policy, and the money you make. Um, this is how we kind of talked about it earlier um, we're taking this presumptive type of perspective on the entirety of, of, of this sales call. And what you need to be thinking is, I'm going to act as if I'm making this sale and the language patterns that I'm going to reflect, assume this is going to happen. Part of that language pattern is basically showing authority and taking command. <clears throat> Who tells what to do things? Even little things matter. Uh, I use this commonly as an example. Uh, during the Vietnam war negotiations. Uh, there was a lot ado about the situation or where the negotiators, the Vietnamese and the Americans were negotiating and where their table and more specifically the chairs were in location to each other. Um, the perception, and even though that sounds silly, the perception of somebody who sits higher than you is they're above you. Think about the judge who sits above and looks down and makes a judgment. It's the same type of concept is that these little things matter in what you know, uh, the outcome in taking command is going to be. So we wanna make sure that we take command. And we do it very subtly with little things to start with. We really do it at the door where we say, do you wanna sit outside or should I come in? 
they're now following your command. And then if you haven't made it clear, is, is that you need to tell them, hey, let's sit at the table to discuss this so I have some room to spread out my stuff. And instead of asking, can we sit at the table? You need to, to tell them, let's sit at the table so I can spread out some things. And then you need to physically start making your way towards the table. Again, you may look at this as a little thing, like it's a non-issue. But when you make these subtle commands for people to listen and do what you're saying, this gets them into a behavior pattern of following your directions when it matters most, which is which one are you going to buy today, right? <clears throat> so I want to make sure that was clear. So as far as what to say, look, here's just a litany of questions you can ask. Again, um, if you've got a Facebook lead, I would absolutely talk about the uh, favorite hobby. Um, but if you don't, then I'm going to be talking about things that I look around and see in the house. Uh, if it's, you know, like uh, the fish on the wall, the golf clubs in the corner, pictures on the wall, I'm going to look for something unique and interesting because people display the things that they have an interest in. For example, if you're looking in my room right now, and I'll kind of just go back to the big screen. I mean, if we were doing a Zoom call, let's just say, where you're across the table from me and you were looking for things uh, of interest, what would you talk about? I mean, there's some interesting things here. I'm an American living in Chattanooga, Tennessee, but you'll see over one of my shoulders a Canadian flag. I think it would be interesting to say, hey, you're, are you Canadian? What do you have that flag for? And then there's a whole conversation there about where my family was from, how getting back to Canada is a personal goal for mine. I'd love to own a cottage on Lake Huron. I could talk endlessly about this because it's something I'm passionate and interested in. Or maybe you look around and you see certain books on the bookshelf and ask, well, how would you think about that book? Or maybe you notice my personal books I have written. you got conversation. Or maybe my family. Pick something that people have displayed an interest in and ask them about it. Um, I had a client who had, and she told me this, so it's not exactly true, but I walked in and a uh, crazy lady, she had a pink mailbox, a pink Cadillac. She had drawn, drawn a, a, like a jester clown face on the side of her house. And I walked in and she uh, had a blown up letter from... Vice President Al Gore, totally serious story here. And uh, they had picked her up after Hurricane Katrina because she got waterlogged, like her whole house like went underwater. And she was straddling a casket that had unearthed from the ground. I, I kid you not, that's what this lady told me. And uh, paddled her way to I-10 overpass in, in uh, New Orleans before uh, Al Gore picked her up and dropped her off in Ch Chattanooga. <laughs> Crazy story. I couldn't close her, by the way, if you're wondering, because... Her objection, she called me back and she said, God came to me in a dream and said, I shouldn't buy this policy from you and I should keep my funeral plan. <laughs> and and still to this day, I think, well, how do you rebuttal God? <laughs> that is not the rebuttal I'm going to fool with. And I wasn't very religious back then. So uh, anyways, uh, but she displayed this. The stuff was all hanging out over the place and it was an interesting thing to look at. And had I, she not brought it out, I would say, hey, what, is that Vice President Al Gore's signature up there? Or you could see the letterhead, right? So I would want to bring that attention. That would have spurred that whole story, right? And then if they're finding interest in sharing this with you, well, then you just need to keep going down that path. Well, how did you survive the hurricane? How did you get here? Really? Wow. And let's listen to all these stories. And what will happen as they are talking and explaining these things to do, they are automatically liking you. People love people who listen to them. Again, most seniors, especially the last couple of years, have been shut in. They have already were shut ins for the most part. A lot of their friends have died. They don't get out as much. They're lonely. Uh, my mom's in her late 60s now. And, and, you know, like she lives by herself and her dog. She talks to the dog half the time is what she says. And when my kids come over, she talks to them about politics and stuff that they have no interest in, <laughs> but she has nobody to talk to, right? So this is your this is your typical baby boomer getting into retirement. So if you just listen to people, like they're appreciative of it, okay? And you just got to ask questions and then make sure the follow-up questions are back on them. So a couple of things here. What do you ask? Keep it simple. How's your day going so far? Are you from Chattanooga? Where did you come from? Did you grow up here? Are you retired? Is it all it's cracked up to be if you are? What's your grandkids like? How many you got? What's that like being a grandparent? You know, if the attack poodle or attack chihuahua comes up and tries to bite your ankles off, you know, what's your dog's name? How long you've had them? Is it a barky dog, barky dog good dog? Um, they'll tell you the whole story and blah, 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 right? So you got to, then these are listed here in a script because you don't have to do all these again. You just got to pick one or two until they find some kind of reciprocated interest in explaining to it. 
and then just ask some follow-up questions. And somewhere between 30 seconds and two minutes, you probably have asked enough that they are expressing interest, that they are like, you know, compelled and like you. Okay, that's all it really takes. Now, a couple other things. What happens if your prospect doesn't shut up? <laughs> what if they like talking, you know, I don't know, a little too much? What do you do about that? So a couple of things that help. First of all, everybody has to take a breath while they talk. As soon as they take a breath, what you need to say is something like, hey, um, actually, I forgot to tell you this. So the reason I'm here is because of this information you requested. So you have to do some kind of pattern interrupt. Oh, yeah, hey, I, I forgot. I wanted to get to this here real quick. Let me show you. And then get into the introduction here, okay? So you might have to do that. I had one lady who said, yeah, when somebody goes blah, 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 I'll push my pen off. Oh, whoops. Oh, hey, my pen dropped. Hey, you know, um, you know, the reason I'm here is because you had requested, and that pen drop kind of, they just kind of like, oh, they stop what they're doing. They react, and it's this moment of kind of like stall where now the, the agent can jump back in and start taking back command and directing the conversation. I would be dropping pens off the side of my desk like after five minutes, guys. There's really no added benefit to rapport building past, I would say, a couple of minutes. There's what we call diminishing returns on your investment of your time. Uh, so you want to be actively looking for the pause and the breath uh, or dropping that pen and creating a pattern interrupt so you can continue with this presentation. Okay. Now, uh, a couple of things here in the chat just to see if there's anybody got any questions here. Um, how do people that are not scared, uh, uh, you get access to, you can work through me uh, conceivably uh, or any IMO that offers it, they offer that same program as well. Uh, yes, I do, Brian. Exactly. I've learned so much from you. You're welcome, Kim. Thanks for being here. Uh, you can't sell someone who doesn't want to sell themselves. That's right, 100%. I would have said, well, he spoke to me and he said it was the devil. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not going to lie about that either, you know. So I don't know. There's probably, there is a way around it, I'm sure. But at that point, I was like, man, I'm, I'm not going to argue with the man upstairs. Uh, the stories that people tell make this business fun. Yeah, I know. Tell, you, tell me about it. Yeah. They say if you can't think of anything, talk about the weather. Yeah. So the point is get them comfortable, get them relaxed. It's going to be subjective. You got to think on your feet, but don't stress this stuff. Just remember when you're in the home to talk about the client, ask them questions, surefire, easy questions to ask. What's retirement like? Is it all it's cracked up to be? Because everybody's told retirement's great and then they find out it's not. Um, or are you a grandparent? How many grandkids you got? What it's like being a grandkid? <clears throat> you're almost always going to get conversation points out of that if you can't think of anything else. And as long as you can string a, a series of questions based on that, for 30, 60, 90, 120 seconds, you'll likely get them comfortable with you and you can proceed with confidence, okay? All right, so let us, let me close down a couple of things here uh, and get to the script again. All right, so I'm gonna switch this back over to the screen. So once we kind of feel like, and you'll kind of have this feel like you've said enough, it's time to just do the transitionary statement to what we call the introduction. So the introduction is the second half of the first stage. This is essentially where we lay the groundwork to explain to the prospect who we are, why we're there, and why they should care. It's, it's like we're giving them the agenda of what to expect with the uh, forthcoming presentation. This kind of cools or quells their concerns, like, What's this person looking to do? I don't know exactly what this is about, blah, 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 blah. This is designed to basically give them some concrete idea of what to expect and to be more comfortable with the, with the forthcoming process. So here's how it's scripted. I'm going to scroll in just a little bit. Hopefully you guys can see. So now you've told me a little bit about yourself, Mr. Prospect. Let me tell you about who I am and what I do. My name is David Duford. I'm an independent licensed life insurance agent in Tennessee. Here's my license just to show you. I've jumped through all the hoops, passed all the tests. I'm a bona fide insurance agent. I've been in the business since 2011, and uh, I do what's called specializing with people uh, 50 and older, get affordable final expense life insurance to cover final expenses, burial, cremation costs, that kind of thing. And the reason my clients do business with me is because I'm what's known as a broker. Any idea what that is? Yeah, so I'm not married to one company like Allstate or State Farm. What I do is shop around. I have access to all the companies, and my job is to basically give you the, give you the best bang for your buck, and so you get the best combination of price and value. Does that make sense? Lastly, since the life insurance is about family, I always like to share my kids just so you can kind of know I'm, you know, where I'm from, who I am, and all that stuff. So I'll show them a picture of the kids. 
Um, also throughout that script, I'll show my license to the person as well. And then we'll transition at this point to stage two, which we'll get to here in a moment. So let's, let's kind of backtrack a little bit here and talk about some of the rapport building here or the, the introduction here. So this, this particular script, we want, we want to, we want to uh, really script and canvas, okay? This is one of those things we want to be like completely scripted on. This is unlike the rapport building part of it. You really want to be canned on this part. So take time to memorize this and to say this with uh, certainty and execution, okay? Now, again, back to the screen here on uh, what we're looking at. Uh, my name is David Duford. I'm an independent licensed life insurance agent in Tennessee. So this is the point where I tell them I'm an insurance agent. Again, why is this okay to do this now and not over the phone? Because they like me now. They're comfortable with me. They're relaxed. I'm, I'm okay to tell them exactly what it is that I'm here to do and what it is that I am. I'm also, as I'm saying this, here's my license. I'm showing my license to them. Um, you could also just show it to them, point to them. But for me, I just showed it to them, just handed it over so they could look at it for themselves. Um, and, and again, um, I tell them, you don't want to say, here's my license, just to show you that I'm not a scam artist or some kind of con artist trying to rip you off. You don't want to say that because then the idea opens in their mind, which may not have been there, that they should, maybe they should be worried about scams and cons, right? If you say something like, I've jumped through all the hoops and passed all the tests to be a bona fide insurance agent, it tells them what your intentions are. Like, I know what I'm doing and the state of Tennessee says so, right? It establishes our authority without questioning our legitimacy. And when you suggest things like scam or con artists, even if you say it in a way like, I'm not a scam or con artist, you know, like, it's like the old saying, you know, just trust the government, right? Like, well, sh why shouldn't we, you know? Um, or it just, it brings up these feelings or thoughts that, you know, if you just didn't say it, it probably wouldn't be a problem, right? I've been in the business since, uh, again, I, if you're brand new, you could just kind of get rid of that part. You can say, so I specialize in helping. You don't even need to say how many years you've been in business. So don't freak out if you're brand new or you haven't got your license yet. You're licensed. Authority is relative, right? It's not absolute in the sense that you know more as a credentialed life insurance agent than the prospect does in most cases. So you have an irrelative authority. So that's enough to give you the right to help these people, okay? Even if you're just still learning to some extent. Uh, I've been in the business since 2011. And then at this point, I talk about what I specialize. And I want them to understand that I'm not just a life insurance agent, no matter whatever it is that they think that is. I want to clarify that and show them who my target market and specialty is. And that's helping people 50 and older get affordable life insurance to cover things like final expenses, life insurance, and cremation costs. Again, I'm doing what's called differentiation. I'm, I'm explaining to the prospect who I am, what makes me different. And this builds into what we call the unique selling proposition. So this tells the client why they should do business with me instead of others. I work with people in their age group. I work with affordable life insurance programs for final expenses. And then further on down here, I'm, I'm a broker. I shop around for my clients. I'm not married to Allstate or State Farm. I'm looking to get my client the best bang for their buck. One of the conversations all of our fixed income seniors have in their mind is I'm on a fixed income. I don't have a lot of money. I don't want to spend too much, and not be able to afford anything. This is a constant issue for them. And so one of the things we want to speak to in multiple parts of the script, as you'll see, is that we respect and understand that, that things like affordability and quality and making sure they're getting the best value are all inherently important factors in their decision-making process. So I make sure to mention that. I get my clients the best bang for their buck. I shop around for you. They, I, my clients are on a fixed income. They love hearing your recognition of that. So make sure that you're saying that in the process. Now, the last thing here, um, I used to do this, and then I don't know what happened to my, my picture. I lost it, and I just forgot it and did it without it. So you don't need to do this, but this is helpful if you feel like, and you should do this anyway as a new agent. You might find over time you don't need to, but I find it's helpful to humanize the salesperson as much as possible. And and part of what we're trying to do is, 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 is help our prospects see us not as... Um, to not be prejudiced really for a lack of a better word and think that we're in the sense of being a salesperson, you know, like salespeople are bad people, right? They're just going to think that because that's how they've been programmed. They probably have experiences that would um, kind of bolster that idea. And so what we have to do is try to counteract against that. So this is why I like showing my family, okay? 
if I pull, if, if they may think, okay, everything sounds interesting so far, so what? But if I pull out a picture of my family, my spouse, my kids, my dog, right? Um, they're going to see me in a different light than maybe how they perceive me unfairly as just a salesperson looking to rip them off, right? And I find that using the picture of the family and humanizing this process, they're going to, in many cases, relax their um, preconceived notions about who you are, what you do, et cetera. So I would start like this, everyone, if you're brand new, get a picture of your family, laminate it so you can show it to them, not an actual picture, get it laminated so it lasts longer, and, and hand that to them, let them look. A lot of times the reaction is, oh, your kids are cute. You know, look at her hair, you know, or whatever, right? Uh, he's a little guy. How old is he? Blah, blah. I got kids like this. It builds more rapport. It lowers the concerns of who you are a little bit more. And it gets them to look at you something different than, um, you know, a bad person, like in the sense of a salesperson. So that is uh, how we get into the introduction. The conclusion of all this at this point is they know why we're there. They know who we are, how we're going to help them. And they know what's in it for them, right? They know what to expect, what we do, how we help. There's no confusion. And I find that if you don't do this particular part of the presentation, this introduction, people are wondering like, what is this guy here for? What is he here for? And they start getting concerned. Like, what's your, what is your intentions here? So we lay them out early on clearly and concisely so they know exactly what to expect from us and so that there's no confusion about what it is we're there to do and how we're there to help people, okay? All of this should take about five minutes, okay? You'll build rapport for a couple of minutes once you come in the door, uh, focusing that conversation on the client, and then you'll transition to, of course, this part of the presentation, which is laying the groundwork of what it is that you're there to do and how you're there to help them, and establishing more authority and more trust as you get into stage two, which we're about to go into in a moment, which is the real fun stage, the most important stage, uh, to figuring out if this client's gonna buy or not. So let's go back to the uh, uh, page here again. So we're going to um, take a look at the questions here. Da, 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 da. Um, yeah, hey, Roberts, uh, you can get access to that same Security National uh, program if you work through my agency. We do business with Security National. You get appointed with them and have that co-op program as well. Perfect. Any questions on rapport building? Pretty straightforward. Any questions on introduction? Also pretty straightforward. Nothing miraculous, new, um, pr yeah, but it, very necessary to, to build that groundwork to eventually get the sale, okay? Well, let's continue here because now is the most important part of this presentation, ladies and gentlemen. The most important part of our presentation. By the way, if you enjoy this content, please consider hitting the like button. If you haven't already, that helps YouTube recognize this as a, a well-loved video and we'll share it on the algorithm a little bit more. So thank you so much. Hit that like button, please. Thank you very much. And also special thanks to our sponsors, Security National Life, iLife, as well as Trinity Family Benefit. So let's talk a little bit about um, stage two. Now that you've established who you are, why you're there, and they somewhat like you or friendly with you, it's time to get to business. And stage two is the most important part of my final expense face-to-face -face presentation. That is uh, the pre-qualifying and fact-finding stage of the presentation. The purpose of this stage is very simple. It is to tell the prospect or tell us, the agent, if this person is a qualified prospect or an unqualified suspect. So a couple of definitions here. I think all of us here will agree we only want to spend our times with people who are going to buy. Is that fair to say? Yeah. I mean, why would I want to spend an hour with somebody who has no interest in buying? It's a waste of not my time and their time. And I could be spending that time elsewhere, spending it with real prospects that actually have a need. So we have stage two specifically set here to establish whether or not that lead we're sitting with is actually somebody who has a high likelihood of buying. Because we want to, like uh, you know, any sort of gambler, play the odds when they're in our uh, favor, right? Makes sense. So um, what I'm about to teach you is how we establish if this client pretty much is going to buy or if they won't at all. All within a matter of five to 10 minutes, if not less. And what the power this gives you is the ability to determine if you want to spend time with this person and continue to sell them uh, because they're qualified or better yet, if they're not qualified to, to get up and leave the appointment. 
So um, there are five factors here that we're going to go over here momentarily. And you need all five of these to have a qualified prospect. But if there is one of these that the client doesn't have, then they're instantly rendered unqualified. And in my mind, when I'm in the home, I am looking for the door literally to exit and go to the next appointment, no matter what. So this is powerful because it gives you back the power in the presentation. You don't have to beg somebody to buy from you. You don't have to feel like you have to pressure anybody because when you're pre-qualifying, the, the essence of pre-qualifying is asking good questions and checking all the boxes off that indicate whether objectively, meaning based off of facts and logic, if this prospect actually is qualified or not. And if they're not, then you can rest assured that the odds are extremely low that they'll convert and your time is probably best spent judiciously elsewhere, like with a real prospect that is qualified, okay? So this is something that for me uh, is very important. Um, it made my life as an agent incredibly less stressful. I didn't feel like nasty about pushing anybody because if they just weren't compliant and didn't go through the process I gave them, then I chose to end the call. And it gave me back the power of the presentation so that I didn't have to be at the mercy of the prospect and, and literally have to beg on both knees for somebody to buy and like lower my status and myself and self-perception. So what I'm about to teach you, in my opinion, is the most important part of the presentation. Beyond the appointment setting and door knocking training, which I believe is the most important to study as a new agent, this is the second most important part of, uh, this is the first, this part of the presentation is the most important part um, and you should spend most of your time getting really good at this section, okay? And this is the pre-qualifying section. So what are those five things that um, you need to know if a prospect, a final expense prospect, is a good qualified prospect or not? I'm going to tell you right now before we get into the script and break it down into even further detail. Number one is need. Now, it's unusual because most products you don't need. I don't need a Porsche, right? I could get by with a Pinto, right? Uh, but the need in the final expense business, I think, is unique. Typically, now some people buy stuff, they don't need it, but they really want it. You definitely get that in this business, but it's a minority. Most of the prospects that we see, they need this stuff because if they, they just don't have the time to save up enough money to pay for their funeral themselves and their family's just as broke as they are, okay? This is a video I'm putting out in a couple of days that um, Dave Ramsey did, talked to a guy looking to join Lincoln Heritage. And Dave Ramsey just gave him the whole, you know, whole life is trash value and all this nonsense and didn't even understand the important nuance and context of selling final expense whole life insurance. And um, uh, the point is, is that you need to have the need. And it's something that in our market, um, our clients can't buy and invest the difference like with term insurance, right? So that's something that was lost on Dave. Um, but regardless, they've got to have a need. And if they die, then what's going to happen? Is it, is it going to be good? Is it going to be ugly? It's got to be ugly. And they got to feel strongly about it, which gets into the want. They have to have the desire, the urgency to buy today. I kind of use that as all the same description of want. They have to want this stuff now today, okay? In other words, I like to use the terms, um, they've got to see the hearse backed up against the front porch, okay? That's the perfect visual to describe what it is we're trying to, to accomplish. Like they have to see, you know, the Grim Reaper with the hearse backed up waiting for them. Like that's how death really is at the end of the day. And it's not about scare tactics and making people fearful, but it's about getting people re in recognition that death is certain as the sunrise and you're going to die and you therefore must be prepared because death of the date is unknown. But preparation is something you can do now, therefore you should get it done. And of course, we'll talk about how to build urgency in a moment because we've got some really good questions to ask that'll build that process up. Next on the list is probably the easiest and that's building value. I'm sorry, not building value. Uh, health questions. Uh, we'll show you our pre-qualification checklist where you can just go down the list, ask all the questions, Again, you have guaranteed issue carriers most likely out there that no questions are required to get approved. So questions, it's not like this is super important, but we want to make sure we ask the right questions and do the right kind of detective work on asking questions so we have an accurate profile of their health so we can accurately underwrite them. The fourth step is to make sure that we uh, get the bank account information correct. 
um, or I should say that we um, have permission. This is one of those permission-based questions that we, one of the rare ones we ask, that they we do have permission to draft their account, be it of check, savings, or um, debit card. And the last but not least is making sure that our client has a minimal acceptable budget range. We want to know the client can afford between X and Y a month, okay? And uh, so that we know we at least can get this much money from them in exchange for a policy that meets their needs. So again, the recap, you don't have a qualified prospect until the client has, you know the client has need, the client has urgency and desire and want, the client has health, easiest of course, because they're alive, they have some kind of health, maybe not great, but it's there. They've got a bank account with you, which you have permission to draft, and they've got a minimum budget. Take away one of those, and it's not a qualified prospect. If the client doesn't have a bank account, they store their money in their bra. I've had clients like that. <laughs> I'm sorry, they're not qualified. You can't bank draft them, so you better find uh, another way to sell or another prospect to sell. Uh, you got a client that loves what you're talking about, perfectly in shape, has a bank account, but is broke. I mean, they don't have a pot to piss in. And they won't even agree to 10 bucks a month. They're not a prospect. They're not qualified. It's time to end the call and go somewhere else. Y'all get the picture here? And as soon, literally, as soon as I hear they're not qualified, I mean, I used to do ride-alongs when I was in the field all the time, training agents. As soon as I heard that, I'm like, hey, you know what? This probably isn't for you. And I'm as I'm standing, I'm reaching my hand out to shake their hand. And I'm walking away towards the door. And the, and the ride-along is like, like, whoa, whoa, what, what happened? You know, like, I'm done. I am done if I can't get a deal here. Why am I wasting this person's time? Why are they wasting my time? I'm leaving. And the, and the funny thing is like, oh, why don't you walk, walk away from deal? No, they don't stop you ever. Um, yeah, we do direct express hydrics for sure. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But I don't want you wasting a moment of your precious time. And that's kind of the big f factor here. Your time is the most valuable commodity that you've got. You've got a fixed amount of time every day, a fixed amount of time in your entire life. And there's an abundant supply of prospects that need your help. And every second that you waste with an unqualified prospect, you're doing a disservice to yourself, your family, and for the qualified prospects you've yet to see that desperately need your help. So I don't want you spending your time wasted with somebody who just can't get their life together enough to buy from you or just are unqualified, okay? Um, it's a very uh, proactive, positive way of looking at this business. It's pretty um, cuts to the bone, but it is what it is. Thank you, Eli. All right, take a sip of coffee here. So let's talk about how to string all this stuff together because um, there's a scripted way to uncover this stuff and it is your requirement as professional insurance agents to memorize and master this process uh, because if you don't, then you're in trouble and you will find, you will get to the close, have lots of objections you can't overcome and people won't buy and you'll have no clue why. So let's get to the script and talk about the transition and then the scripting of what we do to get there, okay? All right, so the transition's right here. Um, now that you know a little bit more about me, I'd like to tell you why I'm here. The reason I'm here is because of the postcards you mailed back. And most people send this back because they're concerned about the high cost of final expenses and want to plan to take care of it. And with that said, what were your thoughts and concerns that caused you to send this card back? This question, ladies and gentlemen, is the big question to ask. What were your thoughts and concerns that prompted you to request this information? This is what we call the why question. Why did you do what you did? Why after years of seeing this junk mail? Why after years of getting these uh, 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 ads on Facebook, did you finally click it? Did you finally send it back? What in the world has happened to you? Are you crazy? I mean, that's kind of what I think tongue in cheek. Um, but And the reason I'm kind of elaborating on this is because Nobody sends off and requests information on ads unless they actually have a sincere interest in what it's about. And the only way you can convince somebody to click on an ad of which they know they'll probably be sold or spammed to death or something sales is going to happen is because the curiosity, interest, and need and desire outweigh the risk of a sales situation. You understand that, guys? And I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because you've got to understand the behavior behind why the client does what they do. Now, some people just send it back because that's what they do, sure, but that's a small minority. 
Most people never respond to ads unless something in their life has triggered them to have that interest. And it's your job to figure out what that was. I call this the inflection point. Uh, in other words, there's something that happened in the client's life, maybe recently, maybe in the past, where their perspective on life, and in this case, preparing for death, has shifted, it's changed. And they now are looking at life insurance or final expense as not something that's optional, but as, as something they should consider seriously. Um, that inflection point in life typically uh, is uh, the death of a loved one, a spouse, a kid, a family member, and the experience of dealing with death and the inability or the ability to financially cover those final expenses. And the outcome of that experience impressing upon them the importance of having a policy in place. Your job as an agent is to essentially recap, to reinvestigate that entire experience so the client can verbally explain what had happened, why it had happened that way, and why it's important. And when we ask our client, why, what were your thoughts and concerns to, that prompted you to do this, we're getting at that inflection point and getting at the driving force to what it is that prompted them to do this in the first place. This makes sense, everybody? Don't ever do a sales presentation ever again without asking why I'm here or why did you do this or why did you request this information. Now, with that said, a lot of the times, of course, you'll get a, um, a non-answer, okay? Sometimes you'll get um, a question like, well, I'm not getting any younger. Well, I get this stuff all the time, you know, figured I'd send it back. I don't know. I just was curious. <laughs> That's, that's, that's not a reason why, that's an excuse. That's like dodging the question. So what you have to do is revisit and double down on asking that question again. So if I hear something like, yeah, I get these all the time, I wanted to see what these are about, my response is gonna be something like this. Hey, that makes perfect sense why you would send this back. I know you've been getting these a lot, but here's the thing. What I'm really interested in learning is what has happened in your life that after seeing all these cards for years, that now is the time to send one back. And what has prompted you to seriously look at getting a final expense policy now? So I rephrase the question in the way to not let them off the hook because I cannot do a sales presentation, you can't either, without understanding the why. If you don't understand why, You'll never, ever make a sale. Well, you might, but you'll get lucky. And we don't want to run a business off of luck. We want to run it off of, um, you know, a strategy that's consistent and doesn't need luck, right? So what kind of responses will you get here? Well, you'll get things like, well, I don't want to be a burden to my loved ones. I don't want my children to die or me to die. My children have to pay it. Or I had my spouse die and he, did, he didn't have coverage or he did have coverage and I don't want to put the burden on my children. That's the typical kind of answer that you get, and that's a great sign that we're on the track. Now, from here, there's a couple of questions we can answer or ask, and this is very important again. Um, I wanna get to the heart of the matter and disturb them. Ben Feldman, legendary Guinness World Book record holder on insurance, life insurance sales, said the key to selling life insurance, again, mostly is about asking disturbing questions. Death is disturbing, it is. Nobody wants to talk about it. Too bad it's your job to talk about it because that's how you get people to hand their money to you to buy a policy, all right? So one question I'll ask is, as I understand and say, okay, so you don't want to be a burden to your loved ones. You don't want to die and not have a policy in place is what you're saying, right? Okay, so what do you have in place right now to cover the burden of your funeral expenses or final expenses? So I ask them, what are you doing right now for coverage? The, the question is presumptive. And then what you're going to get is either one of two answers. You're gonna get either, yes, I've got it, or no, I don't. And a lot of the times, um, I'll, co I'll cover both, um, most of the times I don't have any. And, and we'll kind of back that hearse up real close to the door with a couple of follow-ups. But if they answer, yeah, I've got coverage, then my follow-up is gonna be something like this. Hey, that's great to hear. Um, I have to say, you're really smart for preparing. A lot of people I talk to, they don't have anything at all. So can you give me more details as to how your program works? So at this point, I'll start to fact find what they've got, how their plan works, how much coverage they have, what it costs. I'll ask them to get the policy. Now we're gonna do a protracted training on policy reviews later on. So we'll kind of give you some more details and insight on how to uncover 
policy review opportunities. But um, that's where I'm going with that direction because before I can show them what my plan can do and give them advice and direction, of course, what I have to do is be able to explain where my plan fits with their current life insurance affairs, right? If they've got a $10,000 plan, well, I'm going to have to sell them on why they should have more than $10,000. If I don't have that information, I'm not in a strategically strong position to convince them to buy because I don't have the knowledge of what they're currently doing. So we want to fact find and uncover this information because it's just that important. The next thing here, of course, is that sometimes your client's going to say things like, um, no, I don't have any coverage. Um, and the response to that is going to be something like, is, and this is important that you script this part right. This is where using silence and pauses and, and changing the inflection of your voice really makes a, 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 a noticeable difference in the outcome here. So if I say to Mrs. Prospect, so what are you doing right now for your existing coverage? I don't have anything. My response is going to be something like this. Really? Well, God forbid, if you die tomorrow, who's going to carry the burden of these funeral costs? And so my, my tone will drop. It'll get like serious. It'll be as if I'm leaning into him, whispering like, what are you going to do about this? You know, like if you're really talking about something serious with a friend or family member, maybe you're at a restaurant, you're just talking like, what are you going to do? You know, like that's the kind of mentality you want. And I want that dramatic pause after wow or really, because I want them to know that that's a problem. And I want them to feel, I want them to squirm and feel the emotion of what it's like not to be prepared. And this question, what, how, do you, how would your family carry the burden of your funeral expenses is a disturbing question. And we're not going to just let them say, I don't know. We're going to follow up with it with several follow-up questions. Because again, people don't want to be disturbed, so they'll, they'll say throwaway questions, but you cannot let them off the hook. One thing we're trying to do as a rule in this particular section is build up the problem bigger than they perceive it. The way we make sales is selling the size of the problem, not the size of the solution. When we sell the size of the problem and we hopefully we show the client how big the problem really is that they have, then the solution is pretty evident in what they need to do. It's easier to sell. If they don't think they have a big problem, even if the solution sounds great, well, so what? The problem's not a big deal anyway, right? Does that make sense? So one of the things we're trying to do fun fundamentally here is, is build the problem to what it truly really is because we all downplay to an extent uh, the reality of dying. And we want to make sure that we've got enough in place, of course, to make sure that uh, it will be covered. Um, so the follow-up questions I would like to ask them, I'll say, okay, so you don't know. Well, I mean, do you have any money set aside? How, how what would your, um, so would your kids pay for this? How do you think they'd handle it? How would you feel if they had to pay for it? How would you feel if you, if, if how would you feel if they had to pay for it, right? So I'm talking very emotional questions here. I want her to feel or him to feel what the, what the pain will be like when they're dead and burdens are left to somebody else, okay? And some things here that I'll say, I'll say, hey, you know, the reason I'm asking these questions is because this is what is going to happen if you don't prepare. You are not in a good space, Mrs. Prospect. If you die tomorrow, today, or tomorrow, somebody somewhere has got to pay for this, and you're going to make their life a, a, a living misery if you don't think through and prepare this. So besides... Um, and then the next thing I'll say, and what that's done is it's, it's set them up to be like, yeah, this is a big problem, right? We've expanded the problem. A good, some other follow-up questions I'll ask are like, what experience have you had dealing with funerals in your family? So I'll do that because what I want to do strategically is reference a point in the past to emphasize the point I just made. So we just got done talking about, you know, it's terrible that you've got no coverage and, and you're going to really bring a lot of pain and suffering it could be that they've already got coverage and we've commended them for doing it and um, that there may be a need for more. But one of the things we want to do is revisit the experiences in the past of the prospect that maybe have been responsible for the inflection point in their life. So the common question I like to ask is, what experience have you had dealing with funerals in your family? And so what that allows us to revisit and think about is maybe a brother, a sister, a dad, or mom have died. Usually this is the case. And our job is to go back and revisit what that experience was like for that client to live through and see or witness and whether she had to pay for it or whether it was taken care of. 
And then from there, asking follow-up questions, reinforcing the fact that preparation is key because you don't want to end up like your brother did if, the, if they didn't have coverage, or you want to be like your mom did who did have coverage. Does that make sense, everybody? Again, we're using past experiences to basically lay the foundation of why they need to buy. And why do we care about doing this? Because a lot of these thoughts and feelings people have about loved ones dying and, and the fallout from the financial fallout or the financial peace that they've gotten are just exist in their head. But if you can get out and start verbalizing and talking about this stuff with the prospect or with a salesperson, it helps give clarity to that person so that they feel better about what it is they're thinking about and have more confidence in making a decision because now they've rationalized the stuff verbally and they're going to feel a little bit better about making that pulling that trigger to feel good about buying and moving forward. So it's 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 critical to walk through these multiple steps asking about experiences with with paying for death or paying for funerals, okay? And then a couple of follow-up questions that are really good here. Oh, wow, your family, uh, how did your family uh, handle your brother's burial without him having insurance? Let's relive that experience. Let's walk through that process. How did you feel when you found out he had no insurance and you and your family were carrying the burden? Again, getting to the emotional uh, despondency that comes from that. How would things been different if you had coverage? So like, let's imagine for a moment your brother was responsible and took care of this. How would your life been different? How would your you know family would have dealt with this differently? So let's think about how things would have been good. Again, thinking about them getting it, remembering and making that connection that having coverage would have been good. Um, other questions I'll ask, what do you want your new life insurance program to accomplish? A presumptive question that presumes they're gonna buy. What do you want your new life insurance program to accomplish? And then who do you who do you want your new beneficiary? Who do you want your beneficiary to be on this new policy as well? So again, I'm asking them kind of leading questions that get them thinking about owning it, who is going to benefit. This kind of pick, helps them picture them owning it already. And this is powerful stuff to get them to the point to where um, they see themselves owning it and they understand why. So in conclusion here, what we've what we've done here is We've built up urgency and need simultaneously, okay? We've built up a lot of, through the art of asking good questions, the story behind the prospect's life of their experience with dying and the financial fallout or the financial peace. And we've connected it with the urgency and need to buy something today. And how we don't want to, or we do want to relive what the loved ones that have passed, relive their experiences. Whether you relive the brother's experience or not, um, you want to take those steps so that you are not a burden to your loved ones. So that the last thing they don't think about is, boy, mom screwed us bad. Why did she do this to us? We can't afford this. This is not fair. And this is powerful stuff here, guys. Again, I review calls weekly in our in our uh, our agency. We're, we're, we'll review whole presentations. This right here is the most commonly mistaken, messed up part of the presentation. And because of it, a lot of agents who struggle with this struggle with everything. But if you get good at this, you'll help people see the reality that they don't want to see, that they're going to die, and there's no choice. You have to be prepared. And that you do have the choice, if there is a choice, that today is the day to take care of it because tomorrow is not promised. And by going through this process of asking these questions, it is a powerful process to get the client on board committed and um, in belief that having a policy is something they absolutely need, that it's non-negotiable, and doing and not doing would be a, a terrible travesty to the people that they proclaim to love. All right, so let's go back to uh, asking, uh, answering some questions here in the chat. Uh, let's go to, do, 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 do. Uh, thank you, Joe, appreciate it. Um, what if this prospect is from an existing book who did not request the information? Yeah, so why am I here today is a great question to ask. Um, if you're getting a live transfer or something, this would be more for telesales. I would be asking some kind of question like, um, you know, um, so I might even ask, so what are you doing right now for your funeral coverage? I might even just skip the kind of preliminary question and just get into that kind of, what are you doing right now for life insurance? You got nothing. God forbid you die tomorrow. What happens? You know, and then get right into that, right? So hopefully that helps. Perfect. Okay. Any questions on um, building up this, pre-qualifying, this building the need, building the urgency. This is absolutely critical stuff to do. Again, if you're my agent out there listening to this, this is where you need to spend most of your time in the presentation 
You do not want to spend this time again, um, you know, somewhere else. It's just, uh, it's just not good. All right. One second here. All right. Cool. Take a drink of coffee here. We're gonna go down now to the um, couple other extra pre-qualification stages that we have recently added into the mix here. What are pretty important as we build the urgency, build the need. You know, we want to show that the client that today is the day to you know that you may die and you need to be prepared, and that we can help them, and that the pain of and suffering is not worth. Uh, waiting another day, but there's other elements of things that we have to add to the pre-qualification stage, in my opinion, in order to expand the need to be bigger uh, than it may be perceived. Okay, so what we're going to pull up on the screen here in a minute um, are some important and very relevant training when it comes to the um, to the uh, building the need higher than it is perceived. Okay, <clears throat> some of y'all probably shop at the grocery store, like me. And uh, notice that prices of stuff uh, are a little high. Maybe you've noticed um, bag of cherries my wife bought were like $14, $14. Maybe you've seen house prices so ridiculously expensive. It feels like you live in California, how expensive things have become. Um, if you have noticed, likely your final expense prospects have too. And you need to bring this conversation point up when you talk to your prospect, it is imperative. I think that's the word of the day. It is imperative that your clients understand not just that they need a policy, but they probably need more than they think because of the I word, inflation. Inflation, ladies and gentlemen, is what it is. It's always there in some form or fashion. And right now, it is an easier to understand concept because every single one of us are living through it right now and all uh, normal daily activities. And what we wanna do uh, in reference to the client is show the client, long story short, that it's not just about getting enough coverage for today's reasons. We gotta also make sure that we have enough for tomorrow as well. Because if you're in your 60s and inflation, let's say it's not what seven or 8% like it is today, it's its, it's, it's typical amount that's a custom or customary for, for funeral expenses. Um, the, the price for funerals is going to double in 20 years, okay? If it's just what it historically the average has been for the last 100 years. And the point of you explaining this to the client is to have them understand that, yes, 10000 give or take, is, is enough today, barely enough. But you need to be also thinking about the next 20 years and locking in enough coverage for that since you're as healthy as you are today, as opposed to later on down the line where you may not qualify and you may not be able to afford it because the prices have gone up. So all of this is to say, what we're trying to accomplish here is building the need. What this does for us is give us an opportunity in one sense to build the value on average for each of the clients that we see. This is a critical strategy if you wanna sell more final expense coverage in each home. If you don't talk about inflation like I idiotically didn't when I was in the field full time, your average premium prices are going to be lower. Okay, Our, I have agents that have average premiums in the eight hundred to a thousand dollar range, which is incredible. My average, I hate to admit it, but it's the truth. It's like five hundred and fifty dollars, and one of those reasons, there's probably two reasons, and we'll get to the other one shortly. One of those reasons I didn't talk about inflation. I just said, yeah, you know, it's seven to ten thousand. That should do the job. I never made hay about it being anything other than that, which was not an accurate representation of reality. Uh, we are uh, essentially arbiters of the harsh truth, right? I mean, we're talking about death here, so we should talk honestly about inflation too. And it's not about them trying to push them into buying more than they can, but it's about making them aware that they should consider buying more than what they originally thought, considering something as obvious as has how inflation affects everything, including funeral prices. So um, what we're going to be doing is going over that script. And there's a couple of resources. Again, if you go to davidduford.com forward slash scripts, you can download the resources you're about to see on the, on the screen and then access them and have them ready for you, including the scripts, the cheat sheets, the pre-qualification worksheet, everything we're talking about. Okay, so let me pull over to the screen here. Let's continue this process. So um, here's how the script goes. 
How much do you know about the cost of funerals and how much it continues to go up? Man, I don't know. I know everything's expensive is usually what the prospects say. You say, well, yeah, it is. And it's, it's not getting any better. And I'd like to show you some recent numbers on the high cost of funerals. It's just terrible, as you'll see, how can, out of control prices are and just how much it costs. So are you wanting to be buried or cremated, by the way? And this will will kind of set us up to, to set up uh, one of the charts we'll look at. Um, we want to talk about either or. So let me show you first this Business Insider article written just a few years ago. It's going to be this one here. And really, we're just going to show them the chart. We don't care what this says up here. Okay. So the script says, see this chart? It shows how quickly final expense costs have gone up. For example, funeral costs are up 250%. In just 30 years from 86 to 17. And basically what that's telling you is like a $5,000 funeral in 86 was $12,500. It's crazy, isn't it? And the thing is, it's not getting any cheaper. If you look at this chart here, Mrs. Prospect, and you're interested in getting a funeral, the average price in 2020 was about 11000 And then if you just fast forward 20 years, it's 22000 You're almost looking at a doubling of the price. Now here's, and usually they're like, ooh, ah, oh, that's crazy. I didn't know that. But you want to explain to them why that's important, okay? So here's the thing. Here's why this is important. If you're a young man or woman, you know, it's probably hard to believe, but you've lived long enough to know that prices go up. You, this is why it's important that you prepare to make sure you've got enough, not just for today's prices, but also for tomorrow's. So what this does, again, bottom line, is it sets up the prospect to seriously consider buying more than they were originally comfortable with. Okay, we've given them a reason why to own more than their original preconceived notion. Um, all of us start with a number in mind that we'd like to pay, and it usually is on the smaller side. But it isn't until we realize the reality of things or experience something tangibly to where we become open to spending more. We see this time and again. Uh, we've got some friends locally that are selling their house. A uh, guy moved to, got a job in Atlanta. I'm in Chattanooga. They've got to live in Georgia. So they're looking at houses. And uh, they told us recently, you know, they're looking to buy. They had a range, but they're going to spend outside of their range because, interestingly enough, the, the house they're looking at has everything they want, right? You know, it's a better value for uh, what it is they're looking to accomplish. When I went shopping for furniture, when we bought this house, this is my very first house. I've only rented up to that point. Um, we just had a bunch of borrowed furniture from friends and family for years. And so we was like, my wife and I were like, yeah, let's get some nice furniture. I had a number in mind what I wanted to spend. But of course, when you walk the lot and you sit in the chairs and the beds and you smell the leather and you picture it in your house, you're selling yourself to just spend more. Or maybe I can spend more. So I ended up selling, spending 50% more, right? So this is just the normal behavior pattern people have. And it's not until you see things from a different perspective, like walking into the furniture store, seeing a house that matches everything and get, got, gets you everything that you want, or seeing that prices are really expensive, that you really shift your mindset and realize, well, maybe, maybe I need to look at things a little differently and be comfortable spending more. This, guys, you got to say the inflation talk. I call it the inflation talk. You have to have the inflation talk included in your presentation if you want the ability to maximize the case size and truly sell the client what it is that they need, not just what they want. Again, I don't want to come back in 10 years and sell another policy if I don't have to, right? Because maybe they won't qualify for it then. Maybe their health has changed and what they could buy, they couldn't buy in the future. So we want to, again, not take advantage of this so much, but just let them know what the facts are and then they can make their own minds as to what to do, okay? So any questions on the inflation stuff? Um, Brian, hey Brian, at the funeral home I work at, the average is thirteen thousand for burial, not including cemetery expense, so it gets more expensive. Cremation, three to seven thousand. Yeah, your area may be more or less. Go to a funeral home; prices may help. Hundred um, percent. What I have found is is that <clears throat> it depends right right what part of the country you live in. Like there's a funeral home up here in Hickson, where I live, outside of Chattanooga. Um, good, thank you. Um, it is. Um, probably about the same price, right? Last I checked, but you'll go out into the, the sticks and they'll do funerals for seven to 10,000, right? So it does depend on the region and kind of what the price sensitivity is. But regardless, inflation is real everywhere, right? Everybody feels the burn of high, higher input prices, right? So that's not gonna change. And again, that's enough to get convinced people that maybe they should buy more. That's the idea. Can a presentation be done and closed in 30 to 45 minutes? Not new, I would say an hour to an hour and a half. 
Um, over time, closer to 45 minutes, I think, is doable. All right. Okie doke. So let's go back to the script and continue this process. Um, at this point, we've kind of rounded out the need and desire. So we want to say a um, summary statement to make sure we're all on the same page here with what the client is talking about. So here's kind of what I'll say. Um, so Mrs. Prospect, let me make sure I understand everything you're saying. So here's what you're looking for. You're looking for a policy to pay for a burial because you don't want to burden your relatives like your brother did. And you're making, you want to make sure you get enough to take care of things, but not you're not necessarily interested in leaving money behind the kids or anything like that. And you want to make sure that you just find the best program that you can comfortably afford. Is that correct? Yes. So that is in a sense what we call a trial close. You're not closing at this point, but you're conceptually getting them to agree that they need, want, and have to have this program and that what we've described matches what they're saying. And reiterating that back to the client, refeeding that back to them, it shows you that you're listening. They appreciate that. And it helps you simplify the complexity of thoughts, feelings, and emotions they've had into one succinct sentence or paragraph where they can understand what they want, have clarity on the direction they want to go. Okay. Now we're going to move into the health questions. Again, probably the easiest part of the presentation here. So the transitionary question or statement sounds something like this. Okay, now that I know what your situation is, let me go ahead and ask you some basic questions to figure out which program would work best. Just to let you know, and this is, I'm adding this into the script. Um, please answer all of these questions with complete 100% truthfulness. Um, even if something is gonna be answered, like you do have a condition, it's better that I know now so I can look for the best plan for you than find out later and you know problems happen, okay? So I, it, some people I talk to in this business will go about complaining that agents aren't or clients aren't truthful uh, in their uh, health issue. You know, they just had a touch of AIDS <laughs> or touch of COPD, right? And um, but a lot of the times the problem is the agent didn't actually ask the question with enough specificity, okay? You almost are going to have a sense of being nosy with how you're asking the question, okay? So be comfortable with that. It's better to be nosy than like blow a whole entire presentation because you didn't ask about something specific, okay? So one of the things I'm going to share with you, again, davidduford.com forward slash scripts, if you pull this up, is what's called the pre-qualification worksheet or pre-qualification checklist. This is what we use to track all of the information on the client. I use this to track for my agents who want to send me information maybe to help them underwrite and to give them a little bit more guidance on what's going on and to help kind of just compartmentalize all the information on the client so they can effectively underwrite them. In a moment, we'll get to like figuring out which clients work best. Uh, but this is very useful when it comes to, uh, again, tracking all the information on the client. So you should see the screen now. Let's go over some of the information here. So first of all, this is all the information I'm going to ask. And we've already, this is kind of a summary of everything we asked. But I'm going to ask the birthday, age, height, weight. Again, I go through this whole list. I'm not going to spend time asking all the questions, but it's pretty conclusive. And then on the flip side, I'm going to ask about the medications. What you want to do is tell the client to go grab their medications. Why don't you go grab your medications too, Mr. Prospect, so I can write those down and check those out too. They usually come back with them no problem. Don't let them rehearse them from memory. You want to make sure you actually lay hands on the meds, write down what they take, and ask them why they take it. Those are the main points, okay? Also, as you're going through these questions, ask them out entirely. Do you use oxygen? You don't. Do you have any kind of COPD? Is it... Uh, chronic bronchitis? Is it uh, chronic asthma? You want to do, you know, are you taking insulin? So did you start before 40 or after 40? Do you have diabetic neuropathy or no? Any kind of complications whatsoever. It's going to sound like you're being very detailed, but it's because you are. We want to make sure that we're being thorough because being thorough on the front end increases the odds of getting approved on the back end. And sometimes, guys, you only got one shot. And if you miss that shot because of shoddy underwriting, you lose out on a lot of money. It's like flushing $100 bills down the toilet. You know, pretty pointless and silly, okay? Um, so yeah, just go through this list, pretty straightforward. At this point, we're not underwriting the client as much as we are just collecting information about the client so that we have a better idea of what their situation is so that there's no confusion and so that they understand everything. And the last thing I wanna add too down here is, okay, so let me summarize what I'm hearing. So another summer statement, you've got this, this, and this, and you take these medications. Are there any other health concerns that are worth mentioning um, before we move on that you've had or you currently have? 
So you want to make sure that you, again, seek clarity on what it is that they, if they're holding out on anything, this is like, well, there is that um, Alzheimer's diagnosis. I forgot about that. <laughs> uh, that's your opportunity to collect that information too as well, okay? Any questions on health questioning or getting questions answered? Can I print out the check sheet? Uh, you absolutely can. Uh, if you go there to the scripting and then you download it, uh, you can then print it off. And I would use that, um, whether you're doing telecells or face-to-face, -face, just to keep track of everything. Um, sounds good, Brian. Uh, by the way, if you enjoyed this training, remember hit the like button. That helps me out, helps share our wonderful training uh, to everybody out there. <clears throat> okay, so you've collected this information. There's two more steps here uh, before we get into the second half of the presentation. We've got the need and want out of the way, right? Now we're talking about, we've got health out of the way. We've collected information on health. We also need to collect information on what? The bank account and the budget. So let's look at the banking information and uh, learn how to qualify that. That's luckily not too complicated. Hold on one second while I pull up the script. Bear with me here. Right. Okay, so um, now the budget question, big question, same thing. So thank you for that information on the client. So two more questions. First, as your uh, right here. First, as far as billing work, since the company doesn't send me out to collect money like the old days, they require everyone paying monthly to set up either a draft from their checking, savings, or debit card, kind of like the Dir Direct Express green card. Which one of those do you use? Do you have a checking account, savings account, or one of those cards like Direct Express? So what this tells us is the form of payment the client is taking. This is imperative. Why? Because we can't draft cards with some carriers. Uh, if I'm using, I don't know, Royal Neighbors of America, I can't draft a Direct Express card, but Prosperity Life can. But if I don't collect this information up front, then I might quote Royal Neighbors when I can't because they don't qualify because they don't have a checking account. Does that make sense? Also, the way in which we say this um, begs if there's an objection to drafting their account. I would rather take care of this within the first 10 minutes than uh, an hour in where you're trying to close the deal and they're objecting to giving banking information. I find that if they're going to let me bank draft, I've said enough to build trust and rapport that they should give it to me now. But if they push back and say, no, there's not much I can do after the fact because they're just going to have the same level of distrust or worse. So I want to get out of the house if they have just an extreme holdup to setting up a draft. Okay, So that's what we say with the bank draft question. Pretty straightforward. And the final question, of course, is about price. This is the budget question. Again, one of the most important techniques I'm going to describe to you here. Some of you are going to be a little bit uh, withdrawn from this or worried about this. Please don't. This is critical, like the inflation question, to getting the most bang for your buck. If you can get good at asking this budget question with a straight face, despite your surroundings, you're going to find that your average case size is going to be much, much larger than what it would be without it. So this concept we're about to teach is called selling the premium. There's two different ways to sell insurance. You can either uh, sell the face amount and just show like a 10, 15, 20 or some arbitrary numbers, or you can figure out a budget range and then pr pitch a budget, okay? And that's what we do. I picked this up from an agent called Tim Winder. I don't know if he's around still, but he wrote like 400,000 in final expense in 2009 and 10 each year, which today is probably the equivalent of seven or 800,000. And this is the methodology he used and it's one of the reasons his average case size was so high. His close rates were the same, but he just closed more business because he got a lot of premium on average out of his clients. So this methodology is wonderful because it doesn't apply pressure to the client. The client can say no if they can't afford it. And as you'll hear here, the script makes the uh, lower budget range seem lower than the higher ones that we start with. All of this will make sense as we go through it, but this is a critical strategy to learn if you really want to maximize your case size and get the most out of this business. So here's how it looks. So my final question, Mrs. Prospect, is about price. Let me be totally upfront with you. Nine out of 10 people I see draw disability or retired. Basically, everyone I see is on a fixed income and they all want life insurance, but they want to make sure they can afford it too. Because I mean, what's the point of having a policy, right? If it's too much and you got to drop it in six months, it just doesn't make sense. 
The truth is the best policy to have, it's the one that's there when you die. And the truth is that the one that there that's when you die is the one that you can comfortably afford, right? So my question to you is this, if I can qualify you for a program today, can you afford somewhere between $150 a month to $200 a month? At that point, you shut up. You say nothing. And you need to say this just like you were saying, so what's the temperature outside? Um, how's your kids doing today? Can you afford somewhere between $150 to $200 a month? You need to be able to say that like it's no big deal, okay? And what we're doing here is called anchoring the price. This is an anchor, okay? When you hit them with a big number, a lot of the times, most of the time they're gonna say no to this. Sometimes it's hell no. But what we've done pre, uh, before that, the preamble to this question is, is to soften this blow. We've essentially told them, and we mean it, everybody we see is on a fixed income. We do not want to take the little money that you got. And in fact, you want something that's going to be there when you die, and that's something that's affordable. So we've earned the right to ask for something big because we've given them the permission to tell us no. And what is beautiful about this is that by asking high, we get the high policies when they're there and we get a nice large policy premium average from it. But when they say no, stuff that would otherwise seem normally high actually seems like a better deal. So for example, when somebody says no to that, I say, that's okay. If I can find you another program, could you be able to afford 100 to 125 a month? And I will work that down until I get down to 10 to $20 a month. But what this does is many times our clients end up in the $75 to $100 range or the $50 to $75 range. Had I started there, I likely would have gotten some pushback and had to lower it one down, therefore lowering my average premium size. And I would have missed out on the huge deals that if I, I wouldn't have gotten simply because I didn't ask. So what this does in a nutshell is that it allows you to get big money when it's there on policy sizes, but without sacrificing the integrity and the entirety of the deal because you've told the client and you will drop the price and find something that's affordable for the client. This is one of the most powerful techniques that you can use to maximize your case size, again, without pressuring the client because we don't want to do that because Mildred will just cancel the policy in the next couple of days after you leave. They got to buy into it as much as you sell it to them. The buying in and selling happen simultaneously. And this does not sacrifice that process. It makes it better. So why is it hard to get people to do this? Because you will be sitting in a, a government house um, where you know these people don't make a lot of money. You'll be sitting in a trailer, right? You know, and it's just, you're looking at your surroundings and it's like, these people don't have any money. That's your perception and you'll cut corners on this. And I say this because that's what happened to me when I was taught this. I never did this entirely like what we teach now. And my average case size uh, suffered because of it. Some tips I would tell you is, is stop protracting judgment on people. Um, I have been to many of people's home that didn't look like they had money, but they're well off than what you would figure. And the truth is we just don't know anything about the people that we talk to. Uh, we really don't. We don't know what's in their pocketbooks. Sometimes we'd like to think we do, but we really don't. Um, so don't walk in with preconceived notions. You'll want to, and it's okay. It's normal. But remember to like stop that process from ob ob obstructing the way of doing the script. Because if you just trust the process that we teach and just let it run its course, you won't lose any deals and you'll end up getting more and a larger average case size because of it without again, losing out on anything. So you just have to be bold with this process of asking. And the truth is, you and I both know we don't want to lose sales. So it's not like we're going to try to, you know, get a policy canceled or anything particularly um, unnecessarily. So we're not forcing this client to do anything. They say, no, I walk it back. Ain't no problem. Okay. But this is a very powerful technique you guys should be using. Uh, it has made a huge difference in our agency. Um, many of our agents, like I said, average case size is $800 plus when it was well below that simply because I think this method as well as the inflation method. Okay, I see some questions here in the chat. Let's go ahead and uh, remove report. All right. Thank you very much, Brandon. Appreciate that. Oops. Uh-oh. So 
Sorry, trying to get rid of these annoying chats. Not you guys. Uh, let's see here. Sorry, Robert's agency. I deleted your question on accident. I was trying to get rid of the other one. And that the, and it do it come up until the underwriting by the company show up? Yes, exactly. Thank you very much, Brandon. Hundred percent. Trying to give them all away. Right. Exactly. Okay. So in a nutshell, this is pre qualifying like a boss. At the end of this section, we've kind of arrived at the end. What you have in your hands now, if you've gotten positive answers to all of this, is somebody who's probably going to buy. And and therefore, most of the labor necessary to make this work has been done. At this point, it's pretty much, pretty much clear you're going to sell this person if you've aligned yourself and have done a diligent job pre-qualifying like we've talked about. If you haven't, then you're going to find more problems later, right? Uh, with some of the objections. Does this work even if you don't have your own agency? Of course. Why the agency, you owning an agency or not doesn't work. I mean, out, this works outside of even insurance sales. I mean, this is just a conceptually fundamental, no matter what it is you do, anchoring the price and lowering it, getting an average higher amount from it, it definitely works because it changes perspective on what high is, right? As opposed to letting it be arbitrary, you're defining it. And so therefore you can define what a reasonable price is by showing a super high one, right? So it's very effective, very works very well. Because we all have like price elasticity or it's subjective, like what is expensive, what isn't, right? So we're trying to frame that in definable terms and it just lets us sell more because of it. But the last thing I'll say here, uh, for those of you uh, who are gonna use this method, which you should, there is only one answer that's acceptable to this budget question. Can you afford somewhere between 150 to $200? Bottom line, the only acceptable budget range, or the only acceptable answer is yes. A thorough 100% convicted yes, I can afford this, is the only thing that is acceptable. Anything else is, is a no, is not acceptable. In fact, it's a no. It can sound like a yes. Yeah, I think I can do that. I might be able to do that. Yeah, that sounds good. That almost sounds to me like a maybe, which is also a no. So if I hear somebody say, yeah, I think I could possibly do that. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate it. I'm accepting uh, Super Chats, your money if you want to pay me, but don't feel obligated, you don't have to. I've got sponsors after all, I make ad revenue, so I would, no, I'm not shelling for y'all's money. <laughs> not in this one. Uh, but anyways, um, if I hear something that's not a 100% yes, then I'll just drop the price. So if, that, if I hear like, yeah, I might be able to afford 150, I'll say, okay, well, hey, look, when I hear people say that, what that really means is that it's a little too high. So let's do this. What if I can find you somewhere between $100 and $125 a month with that fits your budget? Yeah, that'll work. Perfect. So boom, I've got my minimally acceptable budget. And now I'm ready to proceed from there. So that's pre-qualifying, guys. Again, this is the most important, most powerful part of the presentation. This is what's going to make or break you. And if you get all this done, the rest of the stuff is easy. As we get into stage three and four and beyond, like it's just a downward slide. Okay. So with that said, um, we're going to take a little break here and actually have iLife on. So iLife is another one of our uh, sponsors who have uh, graciously sponsored us. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, play their video. iLife uh, streamlines the process, the sales process for insurance agents for a multitude of products. So what I'm going to do here now is go ahead and uh, play. And once that's over, we'll be back. We're going to talk about underwriting and using our cheat sheet to help you underwrite your prospects. That'll be a fun conversation. So stick around. And uh, let's turn it over to iLife. Hey everybody, I am here with John Boothman at iLife and they are our special uh, sponsor for this uh, segment. And what John is here to do is talk more about the iLife platform and how it helps uh, insurance agents streamline the insurance sales process. John, say hello. Hello, David, and hello to everyone on the call. Super yeah. glad to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. So to kind of talk first, I guess, about the overview of what iLife does and kind of what problems or challenges it answers uh, for insurance agents in the kind of modern era of selling. So why don't you kind of take it away and, and describe what iLife does and, and what yeah. it helps solve? Yeah. The point is what's important to agents and clients 
What's going on with them? What can they understand? How do they relate to the broader market that's going on on the internet, for example, because we're talking here about uh, technology platforms, internet commerce, e-marketing. What does that all mean? That's that's a meaty topic with a lot going on. So what does it mean to a client? What does it mean to an agent? And if we stop and think about it for a minute, what it really means is that it passed up the insurance industry. When was the last time, David, for example, you went into a bank? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, I had to a couple of months ago, but I sure surely didn't want to. It was a terrible yeah. experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <it's laughs> Otherwise, not, not as much as I used to 10 years ago, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Mostly you do your banking online or right. maybe going into a bank is actually now going to an ATM. Basically, uh, right. Yeah, but it's totally changed. And then the other, you know, think about when was the last time you went into a travel agency to buy an airline ticket? Yeah, what's that? <laughs> yeah, what's that? <laughs> And if you're, well, I don't know how old you have to be, but not very old to know that there used to be a travel agency in, in pretty much every strip mall. Right. You could go in and buy tickets and all that. So, you know, so all this commerce has been going on on the web with all the other product categories or industries since the dot-com boom, except insurance. So, you know, our goal is to, at iLife, bring life insurance into the, the modern era, put it on the web. But more importantly, put it on the web and give agents the ability to get involved in e-commerce. So that's what iLife is all about. And, and maybe just to, to highlight it in, in an overview, break it down into three areas. One is your online presence, websites, and digital marketing is how you drive traffic to those websites. That's where it all starts, your presence on the web. And then second, second point would be, which I call e-commerce. And that's you have a website, but if it's a brochure, it's not doing anything. Does it have a call to action? Does it have an engine embedded in it? Does it do anything like Expedia? You can buy right. tickets. So can you buy life insurance on your website? Probably not, but we can change that. And then the third area is client client engagement because they're your clients. So you need to engage them. How do you engage them? Well, phone and text and chat and all that's built into the platform so that you are engaging with your clients. So breaking all this technology down into three simple areas is what we're trying to do. Okay, but let's walk through and talk about uh, the important parts of the platform. And in fact, just what does it accomplish and how does it benefit the agent? So we're looking now at what we call the back end or the agent view. So if you're an agent and you sign up with iLife, you get on the platform, where you start is by setting up your website. And that's what we spoke to a few minutes earlier, giving you a web presence. So here you see uh, in the agent dashboard, a lot of stuff going on. You see all the prospects that have been in my website. It's going to detail them all. It's going to give information about them, the information that they've input, information about the products they've looked at, whether we've chatted back and forth, looks like I have with this one, whether we've texted. So a very, very complete CRM that tracks all of your activity in your site, in your iLife platform. But how do you start? Well, very simply, uh, you start by setting up your, your homepage. And really in a couple of minutes um, and inputting this information, uploading photos that you like, what do you want for a background? How do you want it to look? And again, I won't get in the weeds here. There's a lot of things you can do to make it really cool. Add video, for example. It only takes a few minutes and you're going to be live. Might want to add a little bit about you. Here's a picture of you. Looks like me, David Strange, but uh, <laughs> this is your website and a little bit about you here. So you're going to add this all to your website in order to publish it and get yourself live on the net. Now, what I've shown you here is the basic version. And like I said, and I'm not kidding, you can be live within a few minutes. But should you use our Wix partnership, and that is a super robust, state-of-the-art website builder that would be available to you when you sign up with iLife, your website could look something like this. So here's an example, but just to give you an example of what you could do to create a really cool state-of-the-art website, uh, it would look something like this. Anything that you want it to say, whatever messaging, all of your photos, every bit of it is customized. And every bit of it 
is customizable in terms of templates. So we partnered with Wix and created life insurance specific templates to make it really easy for you to get started. And as you get into it and start to um, build out your website, you can add widgets, add call to action. This could look like anything you want it to look like. Embedding buttons that take you to other levels of content or maybe even to other portals. And then it shares with the clients a little bit about the iLife journey that they're going to embark on when they click browse clothes. So for example, if your client comes on your site, clicks term, you're gonna see a little bit about term. Again, you've customized it, your look, your photos, your content. And with the call to action here, your clients are immediately involved in what we just talked about, and that's e-commerce. Cool. They have the ability to go on a life insurance journey on your site all the way through to purchasing life insurance. So again, I can't emphasize enough the robustness and what you can do in building out a state-of-the-art website with this Wix partnership that we have. It could have life needs analysis, state planning analysis. If you can think it, you can build it into your site. So again, that's a whole hour of its own. Right. But let's just go back to my example. So here's the simple version that I started with, welcome to iLife. And so what I want to take you through now is what's ultimately the most important thing, and that's the client journey. We've shown you how to get started. We have just a taste of what the CRM can do on the back end. But really, it's all about getting your presence on this, the web and having a place to drive consumers to, your prospects, ultimately going to be your clients, and giving them the ability to purchase and or at least select products on your site. So this is the client journey. And, and I often just kind of you know, pose a trick question, and that's when the client start this, starts this journey, what don't they see? And very simply, what they don't see is a form to fill out. If right, you think right. about all the other sites that you come across, it's fill out a form, we'll call you. Fill out a form, we'll email you a quote. No form to fill out. Your clients are free to browse based on maybe recommendations by you, based on maybe emails or blogs or advertising you, you've done directing them in a certain way, like maybe final expense. Wow, that's right. David was talking about final expense. Let's take a look at that. So once they've made those decisions, of course, they jump in, <clears throat> they enter their information so that we can price it for them. So just give me a moment. Their health is excellent. They don't smoke. They're a U.S. citizen. Maybe they're in California. And that quick, they're going to start looking at products, the best products available for them based on the inputs that they've just entered. Again, you still haven't seen a form to fill out. Your client is browsing much like they would for airline tickets, cars. They're free to browse, free to look at products. And I'll show you in a moment, look at all different kinds of products. We've selected final expense because I know that's your interest, but it could be term. Well, let's take a look at some term products just for fun. Oh, maybe I was too old. He's too old. old. <laughs> He's too old. <laughs> yeah, you got to watch your numbers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 1950, right? Doesn't qualify. So, you know, that's actually a highlight of the platform is based on the parameters. It's going to bring up products that will work for you. Uh, so let me just pause there for a moment. I've gone fairly quickly, David, and just see if you have a question or two or any comments so far. No, I mean, so far, what we're doing is just letting the consumer take control, freely browse the options, so you can play with the numbers and kind of come up yeah. with their own sense of what they're they're wanting to accomplish. But obviously, this integrates well into a broker situation like a lot of people watching here where they have multiple carriers. They can see multiple options. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you said browse, and that that's a key word. And so we can't emphasize that enough. All the different kinds of products, whether it's term, Final expense, permanent, are on the platform. So again, the consumer could spend Saturday night, Sunday morning, whatever time they need, just to educate themselves and start to learn about products. And maybe it's just to educate themselves for that next call they're going to have with you. Right, right. So 
they can look at you know anything that they want here. They can change all the parameters, get a feel for what's going on. Let me go back to term here for a moment because what we were looking at there was something quite important. And again, based on this client's parameters, we see a variety of term products. We went to term 10, 350,000, great. They could select any of these and go forward or fast online decision. Wow, that's cool. David was telling me about that. I think I could actually purchase the products myself. And that's in fact the case. So banners come up as a good option for this client. If the client selects that and moves forward, it will start them on a journey of filling out their information. And I'm not gonna walk all the way through it because we don't wanna send an app to banner here today for me, but it'll fill out the information. It'll communicate directly with banner and it's got your agent coding. Remember, this is your client. So your agent coding, it's going to go direct to banner, start a journey all the way through underwriting to policy issue electronically on your site for your benefit, your client, your coding, your compensation, and that can all happen within the platform of iLife. So that is a right. huge deal. And so maybe with that, I'll pause for a moment, David, again, and see if you have some comments. Yeah, so so we've got we've got carriers that you don't even have to be involved as the agent to still get credit on the sale, like with Banner. That's right. Are there other ones like that? Is Banner the only one? Or are you guys adding more uh, for this time? client? You know, based on the parameters, it was just Banner. We have okay. short list of products that are in the queue that work for different clients. Um, we had talked a little bit about final expense, so let me go to that. Um, here were a whole variety of final expense products. Your clients can select any of them. And then this is the other route. So a client can go through that process themselves to policy issue, or what's very common, of course, is working with you. You're the agent. So they select a product and now they fill out their information. I'm not a robot. I want to continue. And what I want to continue doing is now with my little bit of product knowledge and a product selection, I want to talk to David. So here's the product I selected. Now I can chat with David. I can call David. I can email David. This is David's client. David owns this business. When we talked about client engagement. David and Mr. Client, how do you want to engage? Some people just want to chat. They don't really want to talk. So we've got full built-in. You have to be able to spell to do this, of course. <laughs> but <laughs> hey, I want to chat now. And when the client does this, again, this is on the client side. Right. Where do you think it's going to go? On your side. It is. It's going to go right here. So I'm, I'm David, the agent here. And now, wow, I got a notification on my phone, by the way. You might have heard it. And here's the client said, hey, I want to chat now. And you say, now is good. I will call you. We'll talk about the Living Promise product. Maybe you want to send them the client brochure. As quick as that, one click, you send them, sent them the brochure to look at, send them a message, I'm going to call you. You're going to proceed with that client with the sale. So that client engagement, however you decide to engage, is built here into the platform, as well as some other features like client brochures and so on that you can send with one click. You can click here, pull something off your hard drive that you might want to send them. Maybe it's a different illustration or whatever it is that you do and how you handle your cases. But point being, all that interaction is built into the uh, platform here. So back here with the client, they've gone through their journey, journey, they've browsed, they've selected product, maybe they've gone directly to uh, enter the underwriting process, maybe they've come back and just wanna speak with you. Either way is fine. Both of those journeys we call them are built into the platform. So I'll, I'll pause again, David, and see based on sort of the interaction and client engagement if you have some comments. No, it's pretty cool. I mean, you know, you have this opportunity to essentially remove some of the steps of the typical sales presentation, right? Like that you would normally do, obviously, with their ability to research, their ability to look, shop, quote, kind of cuts out a lot of that potentially uh, okay. from a sales presentation and, uh, allows the client to be kind of client led through that education process. So that's makes it easier to sell them if they spent the time researching and kind of understand the options. Right. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think the reason for that is like we said at the very top of the call, 
that's what clients are used to doing. They're doing it in every other product category and have been for a long time. Why not here? And if why not here, why not have the agents own that process, own that e-commerce, and of course, own that client? So that, that's what we're building the platform for. So let me uh, go back a minute and go back to the agent dashboard. There's a lot of functionality here, as we mentioned at the, the top of the call, uh, hard to get into it all, but a couple of key things, just so you know how robust the platform is. We showed you that all of your interactions, all of your clients are gonna come into the pipeline here, but as well, we're talking about digital marketing. We've built a beautiful website and now we wanna engage in digital marketing, whether it's Google ads or Facebook or email blasts and drive prospects into our website. How do you do that? Well, you do that in a number of ways, but to start with the functionality to be able to upload or enter contacts into your system is here. You can upload gross lists straight into your iLife platform and begin marketing to those clients. So that brings up, how do you market to them? Well, we've got completely functional built-in email marketing campaigns and functionality here. Here's pre-made content so that you don't have to rethink all the time what you want to say, um, sent emails, had you sent them. All the functionality is start email campaigns, drip campaigns, reaching out to your clients, prospects, or consumers from a data list to drive that traffic into your website. So again, lots of functionality here. And then a couple of little things on your platform, you can purchase leads. We have live, live transfer leads here that you can purchase, web leads. And then a um, couple other things about your website, um, lots of functionality for marketing. You see these different links here that are pre-made for you. And what those are built for is perhaps you have a final expense database or client base, and you just want to drive them into a final expense journey where you'd use the final expense link and it would take them directly into final extent expense browsing right. or same for permanent or same for turn or same for other areas so that your marketing is very tailored to the groups that you're, you're doing your email campaigns to. So again, a lot of functionality here, all the things we talked about uploading your logos and uh, having it say what you want it to say. The journey itself can be customized so that the, the health questions are either on one page or on a little rolling page. Um, truly robust and fully customizable. So that's some of the functionality here on the agent dashboard. Be happy to walk you through it a little bit slower, a little bit more in depth to get into all the other things that it could do. But really high level, we're talking about building a website building web presence, whether it's simple or super robust, driving traffic into that website through all of the digital marketing and email campaigns that you can do, and then driving e-commerce because they're your clients. They're now in your website. Your website does something. It facilitates browsing, product selection, and product purchase should you go that direction, all coded to you and your business. And then you engage those clients as best uh, as you so choose, whether it's texting or calling or creating campaigns or all of those sorts of things. So let me take a breather there, David, and go back to you. I know we had a limited amount of time. Our goal was to cover the three basic areas that will drive e-commerce for agents. And then to some extent, just show a little bit about how iLife works in order to get that done. Any anything we're we're missing out on? I think we got did a pretty good job of covering uh, the bases from, a, like you said, a high level view. You know, I think the goal here is for agents to understand there is a sales facilitation model that's out there that iLife brings to the table that can help uh, qualify those prospects, get them into the buying process through the browsing opportunities that iLife provides, and and provide yet another way to help educate your clients. Uh, it's a cool idea. Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe the, the final part of it, it's, it's very simple, very user-friendly. Yeah. The goal of the client-facing or the consumer-facing site is that it's simple. It's not complicated. It's easy to understand. A couple of clicks here and there, and your client's already looking at product. And then on the back end, a lot of functionality for the agents here you see, but you don't need a tech person. You don't need to know how to code. Right. 
You don't need a support IT person. You can do it yourself. And of course, we help you, but very intuitive and, you know, pretty turnkey. Uh, you're up and running in no time. And I assume you all have explainer videos to kind of w walk you through how to set up the website, how to set up the page and, and all that stuff, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. We have that. And we also have a customer success team that on calls will walk you through, give you some insight into digital marketing and how to apply that. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Well, good. So um, guys, if you're interested in this, uh, I do have a link that should be um, in the uh, stream below. If you open up the detail section of the YouTube video, you should see uh, the iLife or, or, or get uh, join iLife or uh, learn more about iLife. I should say something like that. Look for it down there, then click the link. If you don't see it for some reason, just message me at daviddeford.com forward slash contact. I'll send you the link where you can learn more about signing up and getting started with iLife. And, and I'd uh, encourage you to do that because going through David, you get a discount, you get the knowledge of the industry with David, and then you'll get the tech knowledge or the platform knowledge when that sign up comes through to us. So covers all the bases. Perfect. John, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate you. Yeah, super great, David. Thank you. Have a good one. Uh, and we're back. Greetings and salutations. Thank you very much. I life appreciate you uh, graciously sponsoring this event and getting the word about about what you guys do and how you help agents. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Sorry, my cats are making comments. I don't know. Even the cats are watching the final expense sales and marketing mastery event. We thank your cats very much, Andrea. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Um, David, if you work for a company such as New York Life, could you use this? Sure. Why? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. The thing with New York Life, though, what you'll find is that the, the product selection they have is a little bit different than what we do, final expense. This is final expense focused, right? <clears throat> so this is a presentation that's more oriented towards somebody who's specializing in the final expense market. What you'll find with New York Life is they have a different segment, a different population they go after, a different type of strategy. So you're probably going to be best suited selling in the strategy that they will. And they do a pretty good job of training, as I understand it. Uh, so I would kind of stick to their story. Okay, welcome back, readings and salutations. Uh, thank you all for those of you who continue to hang with me. I know it's a grinder here today. We're halfway through the training, maybe a little less than that. Uh, we're slated to end at 6 o'clock Eastern. It's uh, 212, so I think 219. So I think we're getting close to it. Um, uh, covering a good chunk of what we need to cover, but we got more to go. So hang with me, fill up your coffee, um, get focused because the fun is just beginning. So first of all, uh, don't you forget, I did have a wardrobe change. I did. I changed out the old uh, suit jacket for this. So there you go. Um, scripts, davidduford.com forward slash scripts. If you would like the information we're about to show you, the whole presentation script uh, the uh, appointment setting, door knocking, cheat sheet we're about to review. All of that stuff you can get absolutely for free at davidduford.com forward slash scripts. And uh, just go there, download it. If you can't access to it, um, go to davidduford.com forward slash contact and then go ahead and um, just uh, send me a message and then we'll get it to you. Probably at this point at the end of the call. I was going to do it here in a minute, but I've got this whole text set up here on my side and everything's working so I don't want to break it accidentally in email and then, you know, so I'll send it to you later. You'll, I promise you'll get it. Thank you, Sharice. Appreciate you. Appreciate you very much. Um, iLife link. Um, uh, I think it's iLife. The iLife people are here. Um, shoot me a message if you want the link to iLife. Uh, DavidDeFord.com forward slash contact. Okay, that works for him. Um, hold that question, um, the debit question to the end, if you don't mind. Uh, we're going to have an open mic Q&A call for those of you who are here live. And I'll kind of cover all the like odds and ends questions then if you don't mind, because we got to keep this train running on time. Um, also, thank you, iLife, uh, Security National, and then also Trinity Family Benefit. We'll hear more from uh, Family Trinity, Trinity Family Benefit Trinity later on how their final expense product works. Excellent product to use uh, momentarily. But we're going to jump back in and pick back up. We're now through the first two stages of the presentation. We've talked about rapport building how to build a proper introduction, and then how to fact find and pre-qualify effectively. We now have a client who has need, want, health, bank, and budget. We're sitting pretty. Our prospect's probably gonna buy from us, but it's not guaranteed. There's still a few more things we have to do to seal the deal. 
and some steps that we've got to take. So what happens after we get this information on the client? We have to figure out and, and have some kind of guidance or direction on what options we have for the client from an underwriting or carrier standpoint. We don't proceed into stage three until we have an idea of what the client actually can qualify for. So what we're going to be doing now is actually using or learning how to use the free cheat sheet that you would have downloaded at davidduford.com forward slash scripts and then learn how that works so that um, you will use this in context uh, with your particular training. So uh, Roberts, again, hold that question to the end if you don't mind, and then um, we'll hit that up later. So let me uh, share with you on the screen my cheat sheet so you guys get an idea of how it looks and what it is. So this is the cheat sheet. If you go to, again to the scripts uh, page, davidefore.com forward slash scripts, you'll see this and you can download it. It is an Excel file. Um, you can personalize it as you'll see. But this is the utility that we use as a central hub for my agents to uh, have access to lots of really good information, the basic information on all the major carriers that we have access to. We have things like minimum, maximum face amounts, age limits, payment options, et cetera. Um, overview videos, you're gonna have access, you'll have access to all of this when you open it up and look at it. It's a hugely beneficial resource that's, that's going to contribute to you selling more policies. What we're specifically concerned about here is the actual conditions the client has. And if you look at this page, I'll actually zoom it back out because there's a lot of information. The deep dive cheat sheet here at the bottom, what this covers in column A is the most common health conditions you're gonna run across in this business and then column B and beyond all of the major carriers and what the most probable rating or underwriting decision you'll end up getting. What this does, ladies and gentlemen, for you is simplifies the complex. It tells you what is going to give you the best options for coverage. Whoops, I don't think I share my screen. Sorry, guys. Is that better? Yeah, okay, perfect. And um, what it's going to do is tell you exactly um, with pretty good accuracy what you can expect from an underwriting standpoint. At this point, you want to use this cheat sheet in conjunction with all the information you've collected on the health of the client to figure out basically, is this client gonna be eligible for first day full coverage or is this client gonna be eligible for some type of graded or two year waiting period plan? Because in stage three, we have two different ways in which we um, collect this information and we wanna make sure that we have everything uh, possible segmented out ahead of time so we know how to deliver the correct presentation. More on that in a moment. But real quick, it's very simple how to do this. All you gotta do, guys, is just basically look at the conditions to the left, scroll over to the carriers you have, and then see what the rate class is, and then based off of your research, figure out which of the options is gonna be best suited for the client, whether that's first day coverage, like a standard or preferred product, or some type of graded or guaranteed issue. And we'll kind of do a little case study real quick here so you understand the process of how to use this thing. So let's say our client has, let's see of a couple, COPD, bipolar, and has diabetic neuropathy. Okay, well, I don't know if I can remember all this. Um, let me, let's do COPD and bipolar, just to keep it simple. So the first step is to find the condition on the cheat sheet. And it's right there, and I'm gonna zoom in so you guys can see. It's right there in column 19, okay? And then from here, we just tab over. And, you know, there are some carriers we won't have, some carriers you do, it's just gonna depend. But this is gonna tell you what's available. So if you have Aetna, it's gonna be standard, okay? If you have American Amicable, it's gonna be graded if treated in the past three years, which it usually is. And then you can kind of see the other carriers and what the rate class is. And um, I know right away that some of these are gonna be more preferable than others. If I've got Foresters, uh, Americo Eagle, well, I'm not gonna do Americo Eagle because it's declined with them with COPD. And I'm not gonna do American Amicable because graded doesn't give full coverage like a standard or a Foresters does. Does that make sense, everybody? So I'm delineating which options are best as we speak and go through this selection of options, okay? So let's say we know that standard price is an option. We also have to see about bipolar, right? Like that's another condition that sometimes is an issue with some carrier. So we're just gonna scroll up here to bipolar. So I'm gonna put it to where you can hopefully see it. And then Aetna says preferred, which means it's still standard because the COPD drives the health uh, rate class. So it's still accepted as standard with Aetna. And then Forrester says preferred. So it's still standard with Forrester's because COPD is standard. So what I'm learning here, if these are my selection of carriers, that this either Aetna 
or foresters are good options because they give first day full coverage. So in other words, what my situation here is right now is that I've got an option for first day full coverage with either of these plans. Let's assume that this small selection of carriers was all I had. So what this does is it takes the complexity out of underwriting and it simplifies it for you. And you don't have to choose Foresters or Aetna at this point. Now, maybe you would because you only have one or the other carrier. But if you say you have access to both, well, how do I know which one to pick? Well, eventually you're going to decide on that later before you get to the close when you look at prices a little bit closer. But the main objective right now is can my, quali can my client qualify for first day full coverage? And what we found out here is standard pricing indicates first day full coverage. So I know I can proceed and do a first day full coverage sales presentation. Does that make sense, everybody? Hopefully it does. Um, the idea behind this, of course, is just simplifying the underwriting process, making it a little bit more streamlined and getting you uh, up and running and uh, situated uh, perfectly. Hey, Claude, what's going on? Nice to see you. Old friend in the business. Wonderful. All right. So... Um, we found the case and now we can proceed to stage three. And stage three, of course, is the uh, positioning and presentation stage. This is where we're going to basically differentiate between the bad guys in the business and how our product is way better than the rest. Um, it is a relative positioning strategy in the sense that like price, Nobody really knows what expensive means. It's a relative comparison. Same thing with when we compare quality. What we want to do as professionals is show and compare and contrast the quality to a known variable. Okay. In other words, it's easier to explain how our products are superior when we look at the junk mail stuff and the commercials on TV and show the fine print and the shortcomings that are in those particular plans. And what this script is going to do without uh, defaming the company is simply going to show the client the truth behind the coverage that they have and the true shortcomings that having these plans uh, cause you. What I'm going to do kind of right now as we speak is pull up a couple of resources here. Uh, this is imperative because again we're doing a relative comparison to the competition and we want to make sure we don't just tell them what we know about the companies, we want to show them. This is one of the most powerful things that you have as a salesperson in final expense face-to-face -face is the ability to show and tell, not just tell like the tele people. So we get to show them the brochures that have the uh, fine print issues that prove that many times the plans, the other guys that have bigger brands and are better known are not as good options as what we have. And it really seals the deal in getting our cases our case closed and getting the policy to buy from us than the other guys. It's very important training makes a big difference. So we're going to go to the screen here. We're going to pull up the uh, script. I'm going to walk you through the script. Now that we know the client is first day full coverage eligible, we'll go through that script and then I'll speak on what happens if they're not at the end of the script. So here's how the transition goes. So now, now I know where you stand on budget. I want to spend some time describing how my program uh, for your final expenses works and is a much better than the other options available. I'm, I'm well aware you're probably getting all sorts of junk mail from life insurance companies, seeing countless life insurance TVs on commercial and so on. Am I right? Yes. And the truth is that not all insurance is the same. In fact, some programs are better than others in either way. I'm sure you agree with me that it's important to know all the facts before making a decision on the final expense program that's right for you, correct? Perfect. So let me ask you, do you know the difference between term and whole life insurance? Usually, guys, the answer is no. Even if they say yes, you're going to go through the same script that we described. No, that's okay. Most people don't. Let me describe to you the difference so you more clearly know which program is best suited for you. At this point, we're going to pull up this AARP brochure. Again, if you go to davidufordcom forward slash scripts, you can download this for free along with the script presentation, cheat sheet, and more. And that's, there's no cost or obligation. But what I do is I just simply pull up this brochure and I show them exactly what it is that they're getting. That they're getting what's called, I'll scroll in here. Uh, let me make it to where I can see, or you can see. You're, they're getting AARP New York Life Term Insurance. And so we show them where it says premium. And I'm showing you this kind of ahead of the script so you kind of know where it is. Coverage can be kept until age 80. 
Uh, premiums are arranged in five-year bands and will increase as you each enter each new brand. So this price goes through the roof as you get older, and it really does after age 75. They don't show that here, but it, it just screams through the roof, and we'll give you a story about it too. But the point is, is we want to show them this fine print so they understand the hang-ups with this, and you're going to actually show it to them and ask them to read it. Uh, premiums increase as you enter each new five-year and, and will be based on the current rates at the time. And then um, what happens after age 80? You know, the rates, the coverage cancels if you don't convert it, okay? So script-wise, this is how it reads. Check this out. You know who ARP is, right? ARP sells all sorts of insurance, including life insurance. It's called level term insurance. You see where it's highlighted? Yep, I see that. Now, the simple way to remember what term is is that all term terminates. And I usually like to do the little pause there to let them think about it. Terminates. Well, what if I'm alive when it cancels? They're like, wait a minute, what? In other words, any program called term life insurance will cancel. Now flip this over. See that in the back? Now read that out loud. So I show them where to read it out loud that it cancels at 80. That's right. AARP is designed to cancel your coverage at age 80. You could be in perfect shape or almost deceased. It doesn't matter. They will cancel your coverage completely at age 80 and you don't get your money back. It's crazy, isn't it? And it gets worse. Look at the fine print here. You see where it says that prices actually increase over time? This is a bait and switch program. You could basically call it that. And they start you off cheap, but raise the price. When you're retired, you're not making a lot of money anymore, and you're now in a position financially where you just can't afford it. And they get rid of you because you can't keep up with it. Now you're in a position where you have nothing when you most need it. Sometimes I'll throw in the script, guys, by the way, where I'll share a story about somebody, a real client of mine who was making eight, nine hundred dollars a month, had to cancel the AARP plan. You guys can read it. This helps you sell it a little bit more. You don't have to say it. I will only include it if you feel like it's not registering. They should be a little angry when we're describing how AARP takes advantage of seniors in the context of how the clients don't know that they have term terminating, et cetera. I want them, they, well, they should be angry. They should be upset about that because it's a trusted brand and they don't know what term does. Um, you know, the, the AARP is not lying or defrauding anybody. It's just that the clients don't read this stuff closely and they get mad about it, but we want them to because why would you get a plan with all the knowledge that you may outlive? And that's exactly what we say at the bottom. Bottom line, I have to ask you this. Are you planning on dying before or after 80? And most of them say after. And the response is exactly, who knows, uh, who, who on earth knows when our final day is going to be, right? And again, this is selling a big concept of like, we don't know when the final day is going to happen, right? We're, we don't know. So why take a chance to gamble? Again, so what's the point of having a policy that cancels out before you need it, right? And that's why I don't recommend term insurance to anyone who is serious about protecting their family from the burden of final expenses. Why take a gamble on something that can hurt your family? That's how it works. So what we're doing here, and this is very important with both sections as we get into the two-year weight products, is we're isolating out the most common products your clients are going to see after you leave. Just because you close it today doesn't mean they'll keep it tomorrow. And so we have to leave them with feelings or thoughts about how inferior the other options are and what the bait and switch is like. And so what we're doing with this is we're conceptually closing their minds off. Even though AARP begins cheap, it does get more expensive, but more importantly, it doesn't give permanent protection with its term product, which clients, when they understand the difference, know that's what they inherently need and it's a better value. So what we're doing here is we're basically building a wall around our clients so that another intruder can't carry them off, right? and take them away as far as business goes. And so every time they get the junk mail in the mail, then they'll look at it and say, this is crap. That dude, I don't know if I forget his name, but he told me it's crap and I remember, I didn't like what I saw, so I just throw it right in the trash. This is essentially a business retention strategy we're doing, as well as a business acquisition strategy, right? It makes what we sell that much more appealing, okay? Let's see, is there any questions about this so far? Um, good, all right, let's keep going. So uh, script-wise, let's go back. So have you heard about, so that's how term works. So have you ever heard of Colonial Pen? You know, the Jeopardy guy, Alex Trebek. Um, at this point, we hand them this card. And again, what we're going to do is really just scroll down to the fine print on the application where it says, uh, where is it? It's somewhere in here. I understand that my life insurance benefits are limited during the first two years. That means that you don't get the full coverage. That's what I explained to them. 
It also says it right here. If death occurs from non-accidental causes during the first two years of coverage, your beneficiary will receive 100% of the premiums paid plus interest, 7% interest, which ain't much, right? If they die in the first two years, they get their money back plus 7% interest, not enough to pay for a funeral or cremation in most cases. And most clients don't know this. They've heard of this company, they trust it, but they don't know the details. And of course, that's why we do what we do. So well, get, so back to the script. Well, they do, they do what's called guaranteed acceptance coverage. Basically, all it means is that they do not ask you health questions when you apply for coverage. All you do is sign your name to the bottom, send it in, and guaranteed approval, and you're guaranteed approval for coverage. So what's the catch? Well, here's the truth. Look at the prompt, fine print, pointed that a second ago. Read to me what it says, and they read it back that there's no coverage for two years or return a premium for two years. The highlighted fine print says at the bottom, I understand there's a reduced death benefit for two years if a death occurs by non-accidental death. Do you know what that means? What it really means is that you have no natural death coverage for the first two years. In other words, if you die by any natural death coverage, anything, cancer, heart attack, stroke, anything at all that's natural, in the first 24 months of your policy, Colonial Pen will not pay the full coverage amount, that face amount, to your beneficiaries. Again, I'll share a story where my first client had a dad's uh, client had a no, the client's dad had a policy with Colonial Pen. Thought they were getting five thousand or ten thousand, didn't get anything but the return of premium back. They were appalled, shocked, horrified, and how much it burdened them financially. And, and, and again, I say that if I need to, if they're not angry or angered by this realization that they didn't know about. Bottom line, this kind of insurance is perfect if you're bedridden, horrible in health, and you can't qualify anywhere else. But for people who are, who are qualified for something better, it's not the best. In fact, you want to have a company that does ask you questions because this qualifies you for better coverage at a better price, which then leads up to what I do. So again, same theory here. We're detailing exactly, showing and telling what this product does, the traps associated with it, and closing off the client's mind to even considering anything like this. Again, by doing this, we're positioning our explanation of our product to look a heck of a lot better after looking at really the shortcomings of the products we've already reviewed. So getting to that, now we go into our sales pitch, and it's very simple. I offer what's called final expense whole life insurance. There's three main benefits. Number one, your coverage is day one, 100% from the first day. You're completely covered and you start the program with no two-year waiting period. You're fully covered for natural and accidental death immediately. And you never, ever have to worry about burdening your family with funeral costs. Second, your coverage never cancels due to age or health. If you simply pay the premium, you'll always be covered no matter if you pass at age 75 or 115. You'll never get that dreaded rate increase in the mail like my client did if you told the story and risk losing the plan and dying without coverage and leaving the bill to your loved ones and third your price is guaranteed never to increase you will always pay the same premium each month without ever having to go through a price increase under no circumstances are you ever going to pay any more uh, for the premium than you would to start with and it's as certain as the sunshine sunrise <laughs> bottom line my final expense program is what you see is what you get you know what your price, you know your price is never going to go up, the coverage lasts forever, and the policy begins with complete coverage from the first day. So this is kind of the summation statement. So Mrs. Jones, and this is what we call a trial close here. I have to ask you this, out of the three programs you saw, the term that cancels and goes up, the colonial pen plan that makes you wait 2 years or mine that has 100% coverage with fixed rates that never go up, which program fits you best? They always say yes, yours does, duh, but we want them to say that because I want them to admit they want what I got. And then I follow up and say, that's exactly right. That's what everybody says. What do you think is best about the program? And then they say whatever it is, the price is great or never goes up or never cancels or fully coverage. And then the, the response to that is, yeah, it's pretty much a no-brainer, right? Everybody I show the programs to, they all agree. They say the same thing you did because this is all about guarantees. You want to have peace of mind. You don't want to take a gamble. Why would you want to gamble with your life insurance, right? So let me get a few minutes here to pull some quotes up and show you what I can do. So what we've done here again is we've 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 shown through comparison how our program is better and likewise have shown why they should never even consider another option ever again, which is very useful when you leave the home because your client will always be tempted or someone will be tempting your client to the extent your client's tempted varies to try to buy something from them, okay? So long story short, 
the strategy is very good at positioning your product as the obvious choice to buy. Wonderful. Excellent. Okay. So uh, again, we've got them qualified. Remember, we're going back to what we were talking about. We got them qualified on need, want, health, bank, and budget. We know they are very qualified, very interested. Now we've got them to admit our program's the best. We're just kind of inching our way towards the ultimate decision to buy something, one of the three options as we'll get to. So we're culminating to that ultimate uh, outcome, which is buy from me. Which one are you going to go with, right? And we'll get to that in a minute. Now, the alternate here, there is an alternate close here, alternate um, uh, stage three when your client is guaranteed issue. Let's say they do have a touch of COPD and they're on 24-7 oxygen and you're in a position to where, well, how do I pitch first day full coverage, like you said, but I can't do it because obviously their health doesn't qualify for it. Well, it's pretty simple. So what I'm going to do is kind of show you what's different and then um, give you the rundown. Now, a couple of things here that are different about this. Number one, the term discussion is exactly the same, changed nothing, but the guaranteed issue and obviously the, and the first day full coverage plans are kind of out the window, but we're now pitching guaranteed issue is the best plan to get because it is the best because they can't qualify for anything else. So how we're going to pitch this is going to sound a little bit different, but understand we only do this if the client, based off of our uh, rudimentary underwriting, all they can qualify for is first day full coverage. So I'm going to switch the screen and show you. So here's how the alternate stage three close sounds. So um, now you know how term insurance works. Let me explain to you how my programs work. I'm going to give you the good and the bad because I want you to know exactly how this works. So here's the thing. The good news is that you can qualify for coverage. What we do is called final expense whole life insurance. There's two main benefits. First, you can never be canceled due to age or health like term. And second, the premium, I quote, never goes up in price. So what's the catch? There's no health questions. Um, because of your health conditions, most companies will not take you. In the other words, they never consider giving you coverage. However, I have access to what's called guaranteed issue companies that will take you without any care about your health. It's pretty good, right? Because most time, Mrs. Jones, your COPD and oxygen is just a big decline. As I've explained, your new guaranteed issue final expense policy never cancels, never goes in price, but you have only accidental full coverage for the first two years. And if you die of any, if you die of any natural causes in the first two years, only what you paid plus 10% interest is paid to your beneficiary. But here's the, here's the thing. The good news is that you don't lose money if you die early. If, does that make sense? If you die, you get back what you paid or your beneficiary does plus 10% interest. So it's like better than putting it in the bank and hoping you're going to get a lot of interest because most banks don't pay much interest at all. And once two years are passed, you have full accidental and full natural death coverage that no company anywhere can ever take away from you. Your coverage is as certain as the sunrise. And again, like you want, you have total peace of mind. So out of these two options, term that cancels and go up in price or my plan that's guaranteed to never cancel and will be there when you need it, which do you think works best for you? Great, you like mine. What do you like better than the term about it? So it's the same kind of close there on the, um, on the sales side. So all of this is to say, again, we're positioning guaranteed issue differently here because they're not the bad guy, quote unquote. They're the good guy because it's the only option for our client. So we want to build up the benefits of guaranteed issue, which everything I said in the script is definitely representative of it. Um, again, I'm not going to sell guaranteed issue to somebody who can get first day full coverage, but we need to have a strategy in place to sell a GI plan or guaranteed acceptance plan uh, when the issue or the opportunity arises. Okay. Thank you very much, Future. Any questions on this? All right. So we got them convinced that our plan is the best option. We got them convinced not to look at any others. We got them convinced on health, budget, bank, need, want. We got all the things in our, our, our strategy here. So the good news is that we're just going to keep going and we're going to keep this process going with the close. So luckily, as we get into the close, the good news is the close is probably the easiest part of the sales presentation here. Unlike uh, the pre-qualifying stage, which is very important, detailed, lots of questions and nuance you need to learn and pay attention to, the truth is with the close is as long as you do a good job of pre-qualifying and building the difference in stage three, the close is just a downward slide. It's really simple, it's not complicated, and it's not stressful. Remember, if you're at the close, it's because your client's qualified meaning they probably have, they have a pretty good odds chances of buying. So it's not like you're running into a close blind and you don't know what this client wants. You know what they want. They've already said that they want what you got 
and they meet all the criteria necessary to buy. So closing becomes not a big deal. Okay. So don't get stressed out about this point. You're going to be, it's just normal, right? You're about to ask for their money, right? Um, but let's uh, remember that we already kind of had the odds in our favor in a big way. So it's a real slow, pro a real easy process uh, to wrap things up and get things done. So one thing we want to do here at the close, of course, is make sure that we select the ultimate plan we're going to use. So my advice is use a quoter, look at the differences between the two or three plans that you're considering, like in our case prior to this, Aetna or Forrester's. I'm going to compare prices if I have access to both um, and then pick the one for me, in my opinion, that's best priced. That's how I run my business. I like competitive prices as much as possible because I don't want y'all coming back behind me and trying to replace me, right? It's just the reality of this business. That will happen. Your, your client will have people in the home to try to replace you. So you need to act as if and run a presentation based off of preventing that. And, and you could argue that my entire presentation you're learning is designed to do just that, prevent them from uh, thinking about replacing you. But part of that for me is also getting the most competitive price. Um, but maybe you want to hit a trip. Maybe your price is a little is competitive, but not the lowest price, right? That's okay. So there may be some different goals here that you have with the product you're selecting. My advice is just to make sure that the client can actually first day full coverage uh, get applied somewhere um, if that's eligible. Don't put a client in a position where they're graded, where they could be first day full coverage with someone. You're going to get replaced. It's not worth it to like, uh, you know, uh, apply or try to get a trip with inferior coverage when you could just do better by the client. Yeah, this is going to be recorded so you guys will have access to it later. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to do that step at that point and I'm going to narrow it down to the product and the carrier that I want and I know what I'm going into. So this may take a minute or two to kind of narrow this down. And in the meantime, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, well, we'll get to the pricing here in a minute, but I'm going to have already put down the pricing and the face amounts based off of the budget. We'll get into more strategy on that in a second. But um, I'm ready to pitch them, okay? And now it's time to take this one all the way across the finish line. So let's go back to the script. Let's wrap this bad boy up and get this deal closed. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and share the screen. So now here's back on script right here. Okay, so tell me about the, let me tell you about the company I can qualify for. The company I can qualify for is called Five Star Life Insurance Company. They're out of Alexandria, Virginia. And if you flip over in the back of the brochure, uh, President Dwight D. Eisenhower first chartered this company back in 1947. They're A ranked by the AM Best Company, which seem, means that they're financially strong, aren't going broke. So you can rest assured they're financially solid and a long, have a long track record of paying death claims. So just kind of a side note here, all I mention here is just the name of the company, where they're located, and an AM Best rating if they have it. If they, some carriers don't, that's okay. Um, it doesn't really matter, AM Best ratings don't, and I can explain this if you'd like to in the Q&A, just remember that question, I'll describe it. But I don't wanna go into a litany of, you know, what the assets are, or the balance sheet numbers, like nobody cares. What people want to know is, is it a company that's been around a long time and um, do they have a solid track record of helping people with insurance needs? That's what matters the most, okay? Then I tell them, so the program that I can qualify for is their best price program called the Immediate Solution. Basically, it's everything I described. It's day one, 100% coverage. I just remind them of the same stuff. Can't be canceled due to age or health and your rates never increase. And now to make sure I can qualify for them, let me ask you their questions. Now, some of these will sound weird, but bear with me. So I'll go over each question on the application, get a yes, no. So this is like the second underwriting uh, attempt that I'm going to do because I want to make sure before I conduct a phone interview or submit the app that I feel reasonably assured that they're going to qualify for what we apply for. So I'm actually, this is the first time where I'm going to read word for word what it is on the application and the questions are. So that way I know that Odds are pretty high that they're accepted. I'll also say and explain, and it's not in the script, but I will explain it here, why I'm selecting this program. This is critical. It's one of the modifications I've made recently. You need to justify um, emotion with logic, okay? You have people who are emotional right now about buying, but they're going to have some kind of remorse or resistance. So you need to help them feel better about their, their feelings, because they may just get this like, well, I don't know if I want to do this. So you got to give them the confidence that buying is a good idea. So what we want to do is tell them why we're recommending this particular product. So the reason, what I'll say is, so this is the immediate solution. 
It's day one coverage ever canceled due to rates, rates never go up, blah, blah, blah. And one other reason I'm selecting this company for you is because your combination of health issues, this is the best option that gives you the best combination of price, coverage, and value uh, with a company. In other words, based on your circumstances, this is the best deal that's out there. So I relate it back to something specific, usually their health, maybe it's their, their great health or their not so good health, and I'm gonna explain them why this product is the best choice because of that. That's gonna help solidify in their mind that why they should buy and give them that much more confidence to make that decision, okay? And then at this point, I'm going to show the prices and the budget. So here's kind of where I'm gonna show you guys some stuff on screen here. So I'm gonna switch it back over. So I'm gonna, first of all, let me pull up my camera here so I know what I'm showing you. So <clears throat> you wanna take a blank sheet of paper and you wanna write three prices down. We do the good, better, best close. It's the only close you need to do. Don't worry about any other closes, but here's how you structure the good, better, best close. And this is gonna go back to our budget range. Let's say our client said, yes, I can afford 50 to $75 a month. So the good or the first choice you're gonna put down is the face amount for the good choice, okay? So let's say it's $10,000 and then you're gonna put the budget at the bottom, okay? The second choice is gonna be $75 a month. You'll put that on the de denominator, the numerator, the number at the top is gonna to be the, um, the other one, okay? The face amount. And then the best choice is gonna be one interval above the range they gave you. Cause this is what we would call a stretch goal, a stretch sale. So they said 50 to 75, but maybe they're willing to spend a little bit more. Now they know more specificity. So we wanna offer this as an option in addition to the, the low and the high range. So the top range, the best product is gonna be $100 a month, right? One interval above, difference between 70 and 55 is 75 and 50 is 25. So 25 plus 70, 100, right? Makes sense. And we're gonna write this on a clean sheet of paper and it's gonna look something like this, okay? Now, a couple of things here that aren't as clear we want to make the face amount on top bigger than the budget below. Um, it sounds cheesy, but we have to think of and show visually the check they're paying monthly, the little check, uh, is pales in size compared to the big check that their family is going to get when they die. Again, you know, visually showing this sounds silly, but Ben Feldman, Guinness World Book record holder in sales and life insurance for a long, long time, literally showed little checks that he would have, have created for the client to demonstrate what he would be paying for, and then a big outsized check of what the death benefit would be and what it would look like. And I remember seeing him do a sales pitch, I think we actually published this on our channel, um, where he did this to like a CEO of a um, you know construction material company that had hundreds upon hundreds of employees, like a sophisticated person. And he's using these cheese ball sales tactics that money, many of us would roll our eyes to. But hell, he got the deal, a huge deal. And I, I don't argue with what works. So we kind of do this with the same capacity. We show how little it is to get this big number here, okay? So we wanna have that on a clean sheet of paper and make sure that we describe it, okay? So then the next step to just show, uh, at this point, I will step up and I will go over and sit by the client. If I'm like across the table from, I'll sit by them to demonstrate and show this, okay? Because right now, I'm, when I'm, the angle I'm working is now I'm their advisor. I'm not just a salesperson, right? So I have the right to sit by them and advise them. And by now they trust me. They know I'm out to help them out. They feel better about me, okay? So I wanna sit by them and show them this, okay? So script wise, what it looks like is, so the, looking at the budget you gave me while working, while also taking consideration what you're looking for, I'm gonna show you again, um, the budget range that you gave me and then one above it because some people look at these and then say maybe want something a little bit more. So let me, and then let me explain to you kind of why. Um, so, so here's what we got. So I'm gonna sh share my screen here and kind of show it uh, on screen as I'm demonstrating a little better. So here's the three prices, Mrs. Prospect. And here's the good news. All of them are gonna do the job. They fit your budget. The 20,000 is a little bit higher than your budget, but here's the thing. Listening to what it is that you want, you're 60 years old, you wanna make sure you wanna protect your loved ones. My recommendation to you is to either choose the 15,000 or the 20,000, okay? So I'll circle it, it'll kinda of look like this. And then I'll say, let me explain why. You're in good shape, the likelihood, we don't know 
when our final day is going to be, but the likelihood is you're going to live a long life. And we talked about inflation earlier and how inflation just drives everything up and how the prices of funerals are going to double. If you end up with that fit, that 10,000, that's too little. Yeah, it'll cover you today, but not in five or 10 years from now. But your health is healthy enough and you've got the budget that 15 or maybe even 20,000 is going to do a better job for you and it's going to better protect your loved ones to relieve the final expense burden from your children so that they're not in the same position you were when your mom died. So what I've done there off script is I've positioned and I've made a recommendation about which options to pick. A lot of times people get confused or they don't like to make decisions. They'd rather have other people make them for them or they're just not convicted and confident of making a decision. So I'm giving them a recommendation to allow them to borrow some confidence from me. And I'm justifying that emotion again with logic. So they feel better about making that decision. Now I did, if you see here, I did go high here. I showed a, I showed the top end of their budget and high, but I, but I recommended it based off of what I know the truth to be. If I felt that the 10 and the 15,000, maybe they just wanted a simple cremation, I might not suggest the 20,000. Why? Because earnestly based on what they told me in this hypothetical sense was, you know, the 10 or 15 is going to do the job and leave money left over. You could go with the 20, that's your decision, but really the 10 or the 15 is best. I'm going to make a recommendation I actually sincerely believe in. Don't just pitch the highest price, guys. That's a great way to lose business left and right. Make a, make a recommendation based off of you being an honest person. Hopefully, if you're here watching this, you already fit that bill. Um, I don't think any of you guys would do anything differently. I hope not. And so that's what I'll do. And then from there, the close is simple. So out of these three options, which one do you want to go with today? So I'm not forcing them to get that 15 or 20,000. I say, well, out of these three options, which one do you want to start today? And then I shut up and then let them tell me. Okay, so it's still completely within their control. They completely have that decision-making power of what it is that they want to buy. And if they don't want the recommendation, they get the 10. Then you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to say, that's a great decision. I'm glad you got it. Who do you want your beneficiary to be? And I'm getting off of that price and getting into the application and completing it, okay? So again, I don't care about chasing dollar signs. If I chase appointments and I get in homes and I work and work and work, the money follows. It always does. If you just believe and follow the system consistently, it does. Uh, the money will take care of itself. I care about helping my client with the best options available. And this presentation here, this close, does a great job of suggesting spending more without breaking that integrity and trust that you built with the client. The cool thing, again, with this uh, particular type of close here, is that you'll get some people who will select the 20,000. Well, if I didn't offer that, uh, or I should say the $100 a month, if I didn't offer a, a, a price point above that, then I would have been missing out on total sales volume. So with this particular strategy, adding a stretch goal, what I believe happens is you end up having a higher case size uh, on average, but without the pressure that a lot of strat sales strategies use to get people to buy, which ends up causing chargebacks and problems like that. So um, that is how we close. Again, out of these three options, which one do you want to go with? You shut up, let them choose. If it takes them minutes to make that decision and say th something, be quiet, let them do their thing, and then um, let them choose, okay? All right, let's see if there's any questions in the chat here. Hold on one second here. All right. Thank you, Phil, appreciate you. Thank you very much, Leslie. Uh, let's see here. Oh, I don't know. It's just yeah, it's not me. It's like um, some spam service. A lot of a lot of YouTubers get this crap. They automatically go out when you publish stuff. It's really annoying. So sorry about that. Um. <laughs> Considering the profile, of the average life insurance agent, it sure would not be a pretty sight. Yeah, see through moo moos, as we say in the face to face world. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. So that's how we close. But of course, what happens, ladies and gentlemen, you get pushbacks, you get objections, people decide not to move forward, people give you uh, resistance, they give you issues, right? Like this is normal. Even when you do everything correctly, you're going to end up with objections and you got to have a strategy on how to deal with them. So what we're going to do here is uh, talk about some of the strategies to overcome the most common objections. Here's the thing, guys. Um, there's, there's really three different objections here that you'll run across. Well, two specifically that come across when you do everything right. 
and then pretty much a methodology using the ask strategy to overcome anything else that people say. The two issues, objections that we run into to an agent that follows a script are going to be just general complacency and hesitancy. And they're going to say things like, I need to think about it. Um, or the fake objection, I need to talk with my kids. And what we're going to do is give you a simple objection rebuttal to both. And you'll notice that it really follows the same ask methodology. You answer the objection, acknowledge it, sell why they should buy today anyway, and then you continue to close it. Okay, you close the uh, sales call from there. Okay, so um, if we transfer over to the screen, here we are again. I need to think about it. I need to talk with my kids. Here's what you say. Um, I need to think about it. That's fine, Mrs. Jones. I can understand how you feel that way. But when you say I need to think about it, how do you mean? This gets them to open up and explain what specifically that means because what is it they need to think about, right? Okay, besides needing to decide which policy is right, maybe they don't know if the 50 or 75 is good to start with. Is there any other issue that needs to be addressed before making a decision? So this is isolating the objection. So this is making sure this is the only thing that they have a problem with. And out of thousands of presentations, there's typically just one thing, okay? And so it's not like there's like, well, there's like five different things here that I'm concerned about because usually you've overcome them if you followed the script early on. And it's just a general hesitancy about or indecision. So then here's the close. So here's my proposition. If you're unsure as to which plan you want, go with the least expensive option. Bottom line, we don't know even if you can qualify for it and your health isn't promised, your health today isn't promised tomorrow, right? And isn't some coverage better than no coverage? And the good news is we can always add coverage later. So let's go ahead and start with that first option. So who do you want your beneficiary to be? So I kind of just basically uh, take the sacrifice and, and, and say, let's just do the, the least expensive one because it's usually people's hesitancy is on money uh, when they're kind of hesitant. So I just say, let's start with that one. We'll come back, buy more later when your budget suffices and something's better than, then I go back and sell them on again, all the same things. Hey, some coverage is better than nothing. Tomorrow's not promised. You know you need this. You said as much. You didn't want to burden your children like your mother burdened you by not paying the funeral. So let's take care of this today. And then close would be, who do you want your beneficiary to be? Okay. If they say, I need to talk to my kids. Uh, okay, here's my proposition, Mrs. Jones. I think we both agree that your children would prefer you having coverage over not, right? And again, how would you feel if your children had to pull 10 grand out of nowhere to pay for your funeral expenses? Bad, right? Further, would you expect your grandkids to pay for your kid's funeral? Of course not. So let's get you qualified with this plan and you can show your kids your plan after the fact and I can help with any question that arises then. So who do you want your beneficiary to be? So that's kind of the way we overcome that objection with the kid's objection. And if there's any objections, by the way, if, you, if, if you'd like to throw them in the chat right now, um, do so because I'd like to address some of those that you kind of run across because there is some kind of just some... Some, a lot, most of the objections, and, I, and I'll kind of wait for you guys to kind of jump in and provide this, but a lot of the objections, um, a lot of the objections that are not what I've described are basically because you're not following the script like we do. I really assure you, you will overcome most of these objections that you might bring up in the chat um, just by default. As you go through this, as you go through the script and pre-qualify effectively, you just won't have them because you've already overcame them. So we don't really get a lot of those objections um, yes, there is, Austin. Um, DavidDeFord.com forward slash scripts. Guys, if you want to get those scripts, the objection rebuttal scripts, the presentation, appointment setting, door knocking scripts, final expense cheat sheets, pre-qualifications, uh, resources and sales, completely free, nothing to buy. Go to DavidDeFord.com forward slash scripts. Um, the objections just don't come around usually as much. Okay. So um, bottom line, um, that's really all we ever really deal with is just what I mentioned there. But if you guys got some objections here, um, let me know what you think. And uh, I know there's a little bit of delay here on the live stream, so I'll kind of wait as you guys jump in. Okay, so um, other than that, um, oh yeah, just kind of a general, if somebody just like says, I need to think about it, or they're just hesitant, you really just got to go back to what their core reasons why were. And this is one of those things where it's hard to script every objection perfectly, but you got to have the kind of uh, foundation in, in place. We answer, acknowledge what their problems are. We sell them why they should do it anyway today, and then we close. So if somebody, you, you know, somebody says, oh, I don't know, I usually pray about the stuff where I do it, then I'll say, hey, I totally understand. I get it. But here's the thing, Mrs. Prospect. You and I both know that this is something you need. 
you wouldn't have spent this time with me so far unless you knew that this was important. And I'm saying this because you told me your mom didn't have coverage. You told me how much of a burden it was on you. And I know you love your children. And based on what I've discovered from you so far in this time we've spent, you don't want to pass that burden on to them. Am I right? So here's what we're going to do. Let's take out this plan. Let's take out the least expensive plan if you're not sure. But let's get you the peace of mind that you and your children deserve so they don't ever have to deal with the fallout and the tragedy you did trying to squander or trying to get all the money as much as you could to pay for your final expenses. Let's relieve them of that today. So which one of these programs do you want to start today? So that's kind of how you handle it on the spot. Again, remembering the strategy of ASC and kind of applying the principles and using what they told you is the most powerful way to overcome some of that hesitancy or complacency. Ah, here we go. Insurance minutes. Do you use the 30-day free look? Thank you for asking that question. Why do I hate the 30-day free look? Does anybody want to cover why closing an insurance sales with a 30-day free look is the absolute worst strategy to use? I'll let you kind of think about it and contemplate. And while you do, I will tell you. The problem with the 30-day free look is this. You're asking a world-class procrastinating prospect, final expense, to, to off load their decision making into into the future well they do that for everything and a person doesn't make a decision today with you in the house will not make a decision to buy with you out of the house 30 days from now so what happens is they're not sold on the product they're not sold they're they're not completely committed they'll they'll say that they'll buy to just cancel it later because that's all they can do to get rid of you what you should be thinking strategically as a salesperson instead when you're closing is how can I get them bought in to buy this product today? That is what matters. How do I get them to buy the product today, not put off the buying decision till later, which really doesn't ever happen. They don't buy when you put it off. So what I like to appeal to is not, you don't have to worry about this. You got 30 days to check it out. What I like to appeal to is why they would buy it today and what motivation emotionally is going to push them over the edge. And that's why I go back to the reasons why. This is why pre-qualifying is so substantially important. We want, to, we want to figure out what makes these people move because when it comes to making a decision, having those inflection points and experiences in life is what gets them across the finish line. Getting them to buy in that they don't know when they're going to die, that they don't want to burn their loved ones because they already have been in that position from their loved ones prior who died like a mother who didn't have a policy is the last thing they want to do. So knowing that, that is why today you're going to buy because it's the best thing to do because we don't know what tomorrow brings. And you know people have died that didn't expect to. So this is all kind of like going back to the fundamentals and, and, and their why. And we got to personalize that objection rebuttal so we hit that and avoid kind of tempting them with a non-decision option, if that makes sense, because that is a, uh, a, a real bad option. It just doesn't work. Yeah, asking for a chargeback. That's kind of what you're looking at. And now it's I call it the Hail Mary uh, close. If you've closed in every other way, fa shape, or fashion, sure, go for it at that point. But that's the last option, like the last option. First option is to close them, to get them to believe and sold and bought in. That's what we want our close based off of. Okay, great. Thanks for bringing that up, insurance minutes. A lot of people use a 30 day free look. It drives me nuts. Um, no offense. I'm glad you brought it up because it needs to go away. It's, it's a terrible close. It doesn't convince anybody of anything. Okay. All right. Any questions on objections? Just feel free to point it out. Again, these questions that are not about closing or the subject at hand, just save those for later if you don't mind. Okay. All right. Yeah, no problem. That's that's why you're here today, Hydrix, is to give you something to focus on and to work on. So a couple other things here, uh, just kind of script related, semi sorta. What do you do after they say yes? You, you like freak out. It's like, oh my gosh, I do want to buy. <laughs> what do you do? Um, let's talk about that. Um, First of all, y'all got to spend some time uh, planning ahead of time on what bookmarks to have up, how to have applications ready, and making sure before you start selling that you have a general understanding of how to navigate the electronic application and verbal application processes. This is not the training to do that. But what I will speak to here is that you got to be prepared for it. Okay, A lot of agents, they do 
uh, and, and they know it's important to do the sales training, but you have to have a rudimentary understanding of how to access the applications and processes to get appointments completed. So here's what you guys need to do. Whether you work with, if you work with me, if you check the cheat sheet, you'll hear see some trainings on how to do that. But you also need, as you get appointed, to call each carrier, specifically call Salesport and say, hey, I want to send you business. Can you send me material that will allow me and teach me how to do an application online or over the phone? The sales support staff at each carrier, their job is to help and facilitate you, okay? Because you're the front people or front man or front woman that's designed to go find business and close it. But you've got to approach them and uh, tell them what to expect and tell them to give you the information necessary to make that happen. That is critical, okay? So make sure you're aware of that. Bookmark all of the EAP pages. Bookmark the agent guides. Review those, guys. A lot of the times, that's where your answers are for the application questions. It's going to be overwhelming. Everything that's worth doing is to begin with. But as you repeat the process a multiple multitude of times, I promise it does get easier. And you'll find more in similarity between each process than difference. And it tends to be a little bit easier as time progresses. But there is going to be that learning curve. Okay, um, Look and read through the agent guides as well as the videos that many of these carriers have to help you understand what to expect when you do an e-app and whether or not and what to expect if there is a phone interview requirement okay a couple of tips on the phone interview requirement this is this is imperative it's an easy simple process okay the good news is there's no medical underwriting there's nobody's going to stick you with a pen or needle or make you pee in a cup all we got to do is a simple easy 10 minute phone interview with the home office to finalize your application Okay, here's what to expect. Make sure you explain to your prospects what to expect. Some people get nervous about doing phone interviews, right? So I, t I and I make it as simple sounding as possible. First, they're going to get your basic info from me. Then they will talk to you, get your permission to check your health history. Then they'll ask the exact same questions I did. All you gotta do is listen closely. And as they finish each question, if, if it is a no, answer to no. If it is a yes, answer to yes, based on what I've seen here. The, there's no questions that'll be answered uh, yes. They should all be no, but you know, answer it honestly. Um, and then once they finish with you, I'll get back on the phone and we'll be good to go. It's a simple process. It'll take you probably five to 10 minutes for what you need to do, but just understand no stress. Any questions about that? So make sure you sell them on how simple and easy that process is, okay? Um, and then you gotta get on the phone and do the interview part if that's what you're gonna do, of course. Um, after that, we're now to the transition to the cool down. So uh, your prospects are, are not going to remember. We don't remember facts as much as we do emotions. I mean, I can remember a few emotional parts in my time, you know, my life. Like, you know, I can think about when my dad was supposed to pick me up when I was like 12. I don't know what happened. I don't know the facts behind it, but I remember the feeling of defeat that my father was not picking me up again. And he was busy with business and doing other things and just a feeling of just feeling like crap. Um, point is, I don't remember what it was specifically that caused him to do that, but I remember the feeling of how it felt to be rejected, right, from my father. So, um, sorry for the serious example, but it kind of proves the point. Your client's not going to remember a lot of facts about you. They're going to remember probably 20% of what you told them, probably less. But what they will remember is how you made them feel, how you were honest, how you were direct, how you helped them with their questions. And they're going to feel good that they trust you and like you. And we want to leave them on a good note. So after we go through and get them approved, we congratulate them. They're approved for coverage. I like to leave a consumer brochure. I like to leave the amount of coverage they have, the details of the policy, the rates, uh, first day full coverage if it is, how it never goes up in price, how it can't cancel due to age or health. I put my name and my phone number down there. And I let them know I am your agent moving forward. If I can help you any way, form, shape possible, you call me, I'm here to serve you. And then at that point, I ask them, how do you feel about this? Do you feel good about this? Is this for you? You're totally sold on this. This is, you're gonna keep this. So I, I go that last little mile to make sure they're completely sold and completely in belief that this is for them and they're gonna keep it. And then at that point in the cool down, I talk about anything else other than what we've done. So I go back to talking about their favorite hobby, grandkids, something else for a couple of minutes, and then thank them for their time, and then I leave the appointment. And um, 
I've got the deal closed. And that is it. And uh, we want to do that again because, uh, whoops, sorry. We want to do that again because, um, you know, we want to leave on a good note so they remember good stuff about us and that they're in a position to where uh, they will, um, bottom line, uh, stick with us after we leave, right? Very good. Tele-apps are easiest for me getting started and I'm face-to-face. -face. Yeah, tele-apps are in a sense easy. They take a lot of time to do them, but um, you know, hey, at least it gets done and approved. That's one of the things uh, good. I get the clients prep before calling. Hey, Joe, what's up? 100%. They know what to expect. It's easy. It's simple. I can't emphasize enough to make sure to say it's easy. It's simple. Okay. Legally, do I have to disclose the option of a 30-day look? Kim, no, we don't. Um, I don't remember. Um, if they do, it's probably signed somewhere in there that they have it, so it's part of the signature process, so they sign off that they were aware of it, right? Okay. So that's how selling final expense works, but wait, there's more. Of course, we're going to cover a little bit more here as we kind of round out the training here. Uh, thanks for all of you who are sticking with us. Um, I think if you follow that link that's at the end of the video, um, you're going to um, be in a position where you can get that discount. If you guys are looking for the discount for iLife, just shoot me an email. I'll correspond with you. Uh, go to davidduford.com forward slash contact. I'll send it to you directly. Okay. All right. So let's talk about some uh, other things. We're going to, in a little while, we're going to have uh, Trinity Family Benefit come on and do a uh, synopsis of their final expense product. Excellent carrier. One of my favorites. Um, if you're not writing them, you need to. So more on that shortly. But let's um, step, take a step back here. We've, co we've covered the entire presentation. We've covered how to get in the door and the importance of that. Let's cover some other ways to kind of strategically sell more insurance and some kind of good strategies and, and, and selling more and keeping more of what it is that you sell. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about um, replacement training. So very important as we get into uh, replacement training. By the way, thanks to our sponsors, iLife, Trinity Family Benefit Life, and Security National for sponsoring this event. Um, as we get into uh, discussing replacement, very important. Replacement's one of those uh, tricky scenarios where um, just because you can replace doesn't mean you should. So the general advice here is to make sure any replacements that you do is you do it ethically that it is ultimately in the best interest of the prod prospect, and you make sure to fully disclose exactly what's going on. If you replace coverage and you're screwing people, you will end your days as an insurance agent. There was an agent out of Indiana that was a top producer many years ago. She was replacing wholesale, first day full coverage policies with Gerber, and she got termed because she was screwing people, you know, figuratively. Um, don't be that guy or gal. Uh, if you are going to replace, only do it when it's ethical. And that to me means you're helping the client improve uh, and you're not causing them issues or pain uh, and, and putting them in a worse position. Okay, so let's talk about though how to do it because a lot of agents, uh, there is a huge opportunity for new business sales off of replacements. I've seen agents who make 40% of their sales based off of replacements. That's a huge number. My number was never that high. As an agent, over the thousands of appointments I wrote, probably 20 to 25% of my sales were replacements. So knowing how to replace, what to look for, and how to position the replacement is, is very imperative. So I want to spend some time kind of setting this up to best prepare and equip you in order to replace uh, ethically yet effectively. So first of all, how do we get to a replacement conversation? Well, if you we remember earlier back in the sales presentation, what we want to do is ask the client, what are you doing right now for your existing life insurance coverage? And if they answer, well, I got XYZ company. At this point, you need to fact find. Ask some questions about the amount of coverage it is, how much it costs, how long they've had it for. Um, is it term or whole life? And um, at that point, say, tell the client, well, why don't we do this? Go grab your policy. Part of my service to you is to review it to make sure you got exactly what you need and to make sure what your situation is. So go grab that, I'll wait for you. So tell them to go get it. They'll get it 80% of the time. And then go ahead and sit down and review it with you. The good news is most people have never reviewed their policy. It just gets shoved in you know, a bookshelf somewhere until you ask about it. So, And they're curious too because they don't quite remember all the details. I mean, I've got life insurance. I run a life insurance agency. I'm an influencer. And I don't know if I, how much I've got. It's funny, I've been thinking about adding more 
for a while, of course, um, just like her damn prospects. And, you know, just wait, thinking about it. Uh, but I don't, I don't know exactly how much I have, and I don't know how much long in the term I have. You know, so it's it's just funny. Like like this is just the nature, but this is a, an instructive point, teachable moment. Um, policy reviews are good, and you should help your clients. It's a service to them because they don't probably remember all the details. So. Um, get that policy, bring it out, and the po what you need to be doing is reviewing a few key, key pieces on the policy. First of all, you want to review the summary statement, usually the first, second, or third page in. It's going to tell you how much coverage it is, how, what type it is, how much it costs, and give you whether or not it's a smoker or non-smoker rating class. If there's any dissonance or difference in what the client told you versus what is said there, now you can show them what it says versus uh, versus what they say. And this causes, in many cases, concern in the client's mind. Did the agent actually tell me the truth? And therein lies a new opportunity. We'll get to that. That's kind of painted across all of this. The second thing we need to look at is a few pages in, especially if this is whole life or permanent coverage, is to look at the table of values or summary statement. Um, this tells you how much coverage the client has each year, the cash value as well. What we're looking for is to confirm that the client actually is first day full coverage, if that's what they believe, and then show how the, the coverage is actual full coverage or it isn't. Some people might think they have a full coverage policy from the first day, but it's to your weight. And then you can go show them in the back where it says ROP plus 10% or it says a smaller number than the face amount they thought they have. And then they realize I'm not covered. I thought I was. Those people lied to me. Okay. Also, I'm going to look for, if it's a term plan, look for that term, show them the term. I'm going to show them the fine print on how it cancels, goes up in price, that kind of thing. Um, and then the last place I'm going to look is in the actual copy of the application in the back of the policy. Now, the back of the policy, every single policy has an application copy that was done at the time of sale. And that copy of the application tells you a lot of good information on the, um, the policy that the client not be, might not be aware of. There are um, lots of issues uh, that could formulate that you can uncover doing your detective work here. I'll give you a couple here. Um, one thing, again, that, that there are a lot of agents out there that, that do what's called clean sheeting. They put down information different than what the client does. Sometimes the client's in on the scam too, okay? It's not like uh, all agents or all clients are, you know, angels as well. Uh, sometimes it's a mutual effort to defraud the insurance company. So we're looking for those discrepancies. So where are the most common discrepancies on the application as it was submitted versus reality? Um, smoking. A lot of our clients who are on their second pack of uh, menthols by 11 a.m. are rated non-smoker. <laughs> and uh, they were either in on it or not. Um, but the agent recorded it as something other than a smoker rate, okay? So we're looking for that. And if they've got smoker rates, and they should have smoker rates, and they don't, there's a problem of will the client be pay out the amount that it should? Height, weight discrepancies. I've seen agents who've recorded clients at 5'8", 220 pounds that were really 5'3", 300 pounds. And uh, whatever, the company didn't pick it up. And so now they're in this position of, oh, their height weight discrepancy, which may preclude them from getting full coverage if they died, right? Because they really shouldn't have been in it because the height weight charts got to be concerned with. Um, and then also, of course, the, um, the questions on the application themselves, the ones that were answered no, that should have been answered yes. There's lots of people out there that use oxygen that answer no on the app that should have answered yes or have COPD. They answered no, it should have answered yes and so on and so forth. So doing good detective work on these policies is going to give you an opportunity to not just say that you need to get rid of this plan, but to show them that what they have is inferior and is going to cause significant problems. By the way, what kind of problems are we looking at? Well, if they have first day full coverage and the policy is less than two years old and they kick the bucket, every company contests claims. They're going to say, wait a minute, before we pay this out, let's just make sure that we actually should pay this out. So we're going to request information from current doctors to make sure what the client alleged to be their health actually stands up against the truth. And if they find out, you know, they've smoked two packs a day and have for all 75 years of their lives and they answered non-smoker, well, they're going to get declined or they may get a very decreased payout. But what is going to happen is going to be a problem. Now, beyond two years, misrepresentation 
is something they can't contest anymore, right? So if the client fraudulently or didn't fraudulently misrepresent, it doesn't matter. It has to pay unless they can prove it, but the companies aren't going to usually spend the time and money to do that, to investigate that. Uh, so it's that first two years that are the most prevalent where we see this problem, then therein lies the opportunity. If you can identify the problems on the application that were misrepresented, possibly fraudulently by the agent or the client, then you can suggest, hey, here's what's going to happen if you die and let me fix this by getting you this company instead. That is the right and earnest pathway, but also gives you first day full coverage. So then this opens up the opportunity to, again, sell the right policy and probably to sell more than just the second policy because you did the extra legwork to uncover what the client had and to show them the problems with it. Of course, not everything that you replace is going to be misrepresentation or fraud. Sometimes you'll run into deals. It's just a two-year wait policy when they can get first day full coverage, or it's a term to 80 product that they didn't know it was term, and now you can replace it and get it first day full coverage. So you're going to run into that, Stu, but all, all, all the same kind of methodology here applies. You're going to look through this policy, work through it, and show them the details. Now, again, as a new agent, all of this is going to be overwhelming. It's normal. Uh, but you'll eventually develop an understanding of the different companies that are out there and kind of their play, what they do. And even to the point where you get to see the same agents over and over and kind of know which ones are honest and which ones are unethical. Um, I definitely saw my fair share of that uh, in my years running appointments and selling insurance. So kind of know on the lay of the land. But it takes time to develop that kind of understanding and perspective. Uh, Ken asked a good question. Often they say, I don't know where the policy is. Um, then I would say, hey, no problem. I'll wait while you go get it. So if that doesn't convince them and they're like, no, really, it's buried in the hoard pile in the back, then my response would be like, hey, okay, well, let's do this. Um, uh, what was your company name again? Okay, so it's XYZ. Let's call them up and three-way it and get confirmation exactly what you have. I need to know what I'm dealing with here before I can proceed. So then go ahead and call the company up. Have a conversation with the person that's running, uh, you know, the, the customer service person, and then ask them all the same questions you would try to uncover. Is this whole life term life? Is, there, is it, What's the premium? Is this person covered fully for the full face amount? You mean, is this, uh, and then how much coverage is it? Uh, so on and so forth. So you kind of can piecemeal the facts together to, in order to make a firm recommendation based off of what the client actually has. If the client doesn't know what policy name or the, the company name is, tell them to go pull up their bank information on their phone or to get a recent bank statement and then help them look through the statement to see what you know debit balance or, or debit against their account looks like a bank withdrawal. Okay, you're going to be able to find that out and then you can kind of just reverse engineer it to figure out what they have. Okay, but this is how we're going to uh, uncover replacement opportunities and this is how we're going to convince them. Again, it's not that hard, okay? It really isn't. Once you know how to find it and uncover it, nobody wants crap for insurance. And if you show them they got crap and you can show them something better, you got to be a real idiot, a real moron not to do that. And most of our clients may not be the smartest people ever, but they're not idiots. Most of them say, yeah, I want what's in my best interest. I'm paying this thing till I kick the bucket. Of course I want something better. So it kind of just sells itself. But the key thing here is we want to definitely know how to do the uh, grunt work in order to under, under, uh, uh, find this stuff and then uncover it, reveal it to the client, and then show them this and then let them make their decision if this is something that would benefit them by changing it out and being a better deal. Okay. Any questions on replacements here before we get going? Again, to kind of summarize this up, replacements, keep it ethical, keep it client-centric. If this is your mother... Would you replace this? It should be a common question that you ask. Um, make sure that you are doing the best by your client. Um, look and learn how to navigate through an insurance policy to find this information. Again, the deck page, first couple of pages, summary of benefits, the application in the back. Call the company directly if you're in a position where you have to... Um, you have to, uh, you don't have the information readily available, okay? Let them sell or tell the client why the incumbent policy is terrible. And then after you gather this information, you should be in a very good position to where a lot of people will buy from you simply because you've shown them what they have, told them things they didn't realize, and they distrust that other agent, and now will buy from you because you did the work necessary to uncover 
and find them the best combination of price and coverage with a plan that actually works well. Okay, <clears throat> so that's replacement. So now let us continue uh, with the next one here. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, business retention strategy. Then we're going to have Trinity Family Benefit on for uh, training. And then we'll round it out talking about leads, scaling, and then open Q&A probably until about 6 o'clock. So we should end right about 6 o'clock. So let's talk about business retention. This will be a quick one. Business retention. How do I prevent chargebacks? Let's face it. I know a lot of agents are concerned about this. This is a common topic uh, for a lot of agents. By the way, thank you, iLife, Trinity Life, Family Benefit, and Security National for the sponsorship today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, but chargebacks are a real thing. They're all of us are something that we all have to deal with, that we will all experience. And the thing that we have to realize is that we can't prevent them all, at least. Some of them we can. But the truth is, is that chargebacks are just part of our business. There's nothing we can do to overcome them. They're just going to be a reality of this business. But what we can do is take steps and certain elements of our presentation and how we conduct ourselves as agents to minimize chargebacks. Um, I believe uh, many agents ask, well, how, many, how much is the normal chargeback percentage? Probably about 20% of your business in the first year will charge back. I think better agents tend to have 85% to 90% first year persistency, meaning that 85 to 95% stick past the first year. But a 20% drop off is what I would say is good, but not great, but definitely not below average. Okay. Uh, so what do we need to do to maintain a high persistency and keep the business that we sell? It's pretty simple here. It all comes down to what you sell and how you sell. So again, it's what products you sell and have options and as selections, as well as how you decide to sell. So if you're a broker on the call here, understand that you are in a position naturally with the access to a multitude of carriers to be able to offer your clients different options that hopefully provide the best combination of price and underwriting. This is going to put you in a position to where you are going to retain more business more often than say somebody who represents one product or, or, or preferentially pushes an overpriced product. So making sure that you have options is really a great way to replace replacements. For example, I had a client I sat down with in Gadsden, Alabama years ago, and he was interested in getting a better deal. He had, interestingly enough, a plan with Trinity Family Benefit, and it was very competitively priced, maybe a year or two old, you know, sold the correct way. I could not save him any money. He wanted a better plan price-wise. I couldn't do it. This guy was ready to buy, and I would have made $1,000 plus commission but he didn't have the capability to get a better deal than what he had. And it's not that the lowest price always wins per se, but part of the strategy is if you sell a competitive price, you don't have the same kind of problems like what we're describing. So this is why, again, having options uh, in underwriting quality and pricing make a huge difference in making sure that you keep more of the business you sell. And the last point of this is how you sell. And hopefully if you just follow my script that we've taught today, you will find that how you sell is going to greatly reduce and marginalize the potential for chargebacks. Don't be a pushy salesperson. Sell consultatively. Listen to the client. See what their needs and desires are. Match their problem with a solution that makes sense to them. Don't push something upon them that they don't need or want or is a misalignment. Okay. Ask really good open-ended questions to figure out what their why is. Again, uh, just freaking follow the script. <laughs> it's funny, right? But if you get all high pressure and you push and you only sell one product or two, that's where the problems come in with persistency. And you'd never really hear about this stuff, guys, when you're out there and you're looking to get into this business. Nobody ever tells you about kept business. They tell you about submitted business. They don't tell you about the shortcomings of their product, especially the one trick pony companies that sell one product. It's not that their company's bad or their product's even bad. It's just not suitable for everybody. And so now you run the position of pushing product, uh, even though it may not be the best for the client. And now we're in that position of setting yourself up potential for chargebacks, okay? Other things you can do too to prevent chargebacks, always follow up with any NSFs, uh, you know, cancellation requests, missed payments. Half the time our clients are just ignorant 
in the sense that I don't recognize that their client, that they've missed a payment. And I mean that with all due respect, they just don't know. And when you call them up, they find out, oh, I've missed a payment. So you just double draft it the following month or take it out again. Worst case, you cancel the plan they have if they can't catch it up and then write them a new one. But half of the plans that you get that cancel or seemingly cancel or uh, can't afford it, um, they just didn't realize that they missed their payments by a day or two, okay? And the last thing I'll mention here before we go over to Trinity Family Benefit and, and review their content is go wide and deep. So of course, this whole training is about final expense. I'm selling final expense exclusively. But if you guys have followed my content enough, one of the things that helps persistency is selling more policies into a home and different types of policies into a home. One of the things we talk about, of course, is getting into the Medicare game. If you can acquire a client and sell them a Medicare Advantage plan, a hospital indemnity plan, and a final expense plan, it's very, very less likely, it is very not likely that they're going to replace any of that because you are really their agent. There's a lot on the line from a relational standpoint that it's going to be hard for them to convince them to move that business elsewhere a little bit. It's going to be harder enough on, on, on average. So that means more of that business is going to stick, especially if you've done a good job by them completely through and through. So consider selling other stuff long term. It will overall help with persistency as well. Yeah, in a sense, final expense is transactional, but it is, it's not like transactional, like buying a loaf of bread. They got to like you. They got to trust you. They got to see the value. It's got to make sense for them. So there's definitely sales element to it. And remember, final expense is an intangible product. You have to die to get it. It's not like you can drive final expense down the street, like a new car or experience it. Like it's not tangible. So you've got to have the capability to describe this abstract product in a way that gets people to buy today. And that's kind of why we take all these steps to pre-qualify and, and do all this stuff because it's 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 absolutely required to get people to convince to buy because otherwise it's like, ah, you know, there's always tomorrow. Is there? Not always. Um, you know, you need to be prepared and that's kind of what we're selling. All right. So now let's switch over. We're going to uh, watch uh, the video that uh, Trinity Family Benefit has put together. If you don't know much about Trinity Family Benefit, excellent final expense program. They've been in the business uh, uh, for many a years. I've written them a lot. So have my agencies. Our persistency with Trinity Family Benefit is probably uh, one of the best in my agency, like mid-90s. No, no, no joke. Um, where, you know, like 95% of our age, that's the average persistency thereabouts and in, in business that sticks with them. So they're a great product that helps reduce chargebacks. Um, one of my favorite carriers. So I'm going to turn this over uh, to Alvin. There are several advantages to working with Trinity Life and Family Benefit Life Insurance Companies. But one of the biggest is building a great relationship because we view you, the agent, as our client. Therefore, we always strive to be an easy company to do business with. Some of the additional reasons to build a great working relationship with us is we have very competitive pricing. This means that your policies with us would be harder to replace by another agent. You have three options to submit final expense business, whether it's paper, paperless, or an e-application. We offer point of sale approval. You will have higher persistency with us due to the competitive premiums and true social security benefit billing. We allow a 45 day requested future effective date. We pride ourselves on friendly personal service. You have direct access to marketing, contracting, commissions, and underwriting. Our website offers you access to all forms and the agent portal not only provides premium quotes, but you have access to your issued and lapsed policies, as well as your past commission statements. Our agent trips are known for three things. They're either easier to qualify for, or they're a lot higher caliber of a trip. But in my opinion, one of the biggest is we do not 1099 the agents on our trip because the company pays the taxes for you. Some examples of our past trips have included trips to Hawaii, Alaska, a Mediterranean cruise, and even a European river cruise. We also offer a lead bonus program that if an agent qualifies, they can receive a 5% bonus per month to help them purchase their leads.
We will now discuss Trinity Life and Family Benefit Life Insurance Company's Golden Eagle Final Expense product to help you get familiar with the application, underwriting, and its features. The Golden Eagle Final Expense can be issued with a day one death benefit for applicants ages 50 to 85 and face amounts from $2,500 to $25,000, or it can be issued as a graded death benefit for ages 50 to 80 and face amounts from $2,000 to $10,000. For the graded benefit, if they die in the first 12 months, the death benefit is calculated by a factor. The factor is based on age, male or female, and tobacco use. You simply take this factor times the ultimate death benefit. For example, the factor for a 65-year-old male tobacco is 0.162. If the ultimate death benefit was $10,000, 0.162 times 10,000 is a $1,620 death benefit in the first year. If they were to die in months 12 through 24, you would take the second year factor at the bottom of the page times the ultimate face amount. Then, beginning in the 25th month, it would be the full death benefit. You can find this information for calculating the first and second year death benefit on page 12 of the agent guide. In this next section, we will break down the Accelerated Living Benefit Rider and the bank authorization form. Most final expense policies have a rider. The Golden Eagle comes with a built-in Accelerated Living Benefit Rider. This rider is automatically included with all final expense policies and there's no additional premium. There are two ways to trigger this rider. The first is if the insured becomes diagnosed with a terminal illness of 12 months or less. And the second way the death benefit can be accelerated is if the insured's doctor certifies that they are continuously confined to a qualified nursing home for the rest of their life. Again, there's no upfront cost for the accelerated living benefit rider. The owner will only pay for it if they decide to use it later. If the owner decides to accelerate the death benefit, we determine the amount by starting off with 100% of the face amount. And as you know, insurance companies make money on interest earnings. So if we're going to pay a claim on average one year in advance, we're going to lose interest on that money. So we charge 7.4% of the face amount that we are accelerating. Next, we're going to subtract any outstanding policy loans. And finally, the doctor is going to charge us for their time and a copy of the medical records. So we charge a flat $250 administrative fee. For example, if there were no loans and the death benefit was $10,000, we would subtract $740 and the $250 administrative fee. Your client then would receive $9,010 and they could use that money to go and prepay for their funeral, which is probably why they bought the policy to begin with anyways. Without this writer, if your client was to go to a nursing home for the balance of their lives and can't afford the premiums anymore, what options would they have? This is a very valuable rider to offer your clients that many will actually use. Please note the disclosure statement. It does need to be signed and dated at the time of application. However, the form does stay with your client. It does not get submitted with the application. On the back of the application, there's a box you check that acknowledges that the client has received the disclosure statement. One of the best advantages of doing business with Trinity Life and Family Benefit is your persistency should be higher than most of the other companies you do business with for two reasons. One is our premiums are more competitive than a lot of other final expense carriers, which makes it a lot harder for another agent to come in and replace your policy. When our agents get a replacement notification for another policies, it's fairly easy for our agent to conserve because after all, why would they want to pay a higher premium for the same death benefit? The second reason your persistency should be higher is our ability to accurately time your client's premium payment to match the day the government deposits money into their bank account. As you probably know, Social Security and Disability Income recipients only get paid on the first of the month, third of the month, or second, third, and fourth Wednesdays of the month. Premium payments that are drafted on the Wednesdays are good because banks and insurance companies are usually open. However, the first and the third of the month are terrible. 
You have Saturdays and Sundays, and then what I call the party weekends, New Year's, Fourth of July, and Labor Day. When the first or third falls on a weekend or holiday, the government deposits money into their accounts on the Friday before the weekend. So if you tell us your client's premiums are to be timed to Social Security payday, if the first or third falls on the weekend, we will draft their account on the Friday. If you tell us it's not timed to Social Security, then like many other companies, we have to wait until Monday, three days late, and often the client has spent their money. So again, lower premiums, which make it easier to sell and harder to replace, plus accurately timing their premium payments to the day they get paid will increase your persistency with us, making you more money over time. This is our monthly bank draft form, or what we call the pre-authorized transfer form. It's pretty self-explanatory. You simply fill in all the sections. If your client wants their premium payments to be timed to the day the government deposits money into their bank account, check yes for Social Security benefit deposit. Then select what day their payments are. As mentioned prior, these dates can only be the first of the month, third of the month, or the second, third, and fourth Wednesday of each month. If the applicant does not want their premium payments to be timed to Social Security benefit payday, then simply check no and continue to fill out the rest of the bank information. Please mark at the top of the form if it is Trinity Life or Family Benefit. This form will need to be submitted with the application for all bank drafts. Now let's take a look at the application. Section 1, which is the front page of the application, it consists of the insured's information, who the owner and payer of the policy will be, what they're applying for, existing coverage and replacement information, who their current doctor is, and who do they want their beneficiaries to be. Question 1 is asking for the insured's personal information, such as name, date of birth, social security number, address, etc. Question 2 asks if the insured is a U.S. citizen. If they are, then simply check yes. If the insured is not a U.S. citizen, then they must be a legal permanent resident and provide their permanent resident ID number. If the applicant is not a U.S. citizen nor a permanent legal U.S. resident, then unfortunately we will not be able to provide coverage. If the insured and owner are not the same person, you will gather the policy owner's information. And if they are going to pay their premiums annually, semi-annually, or quarterly, please let us know who we are to mail the premium notices to. Question 5 is the plan applied for section. Please mark whether the application is simplified or graded benefit, and whether the rate is tobacco or non-tobacco. Please note that the tobacco includes all forms of tobacco and all forms of nicotine products of all types, whether patches, electronic cigarettes, vaping pens or devices, and also marijuana and THC products. With marijuana being legal in many states, we price and issue marijuana and THC consumers at the tobacco rate. If any form of products used within the past 12 months, it will be priced as tobacco. In cases where your client's banking information might have changed and they forgot to tell us, or maybe they end up in the hospital for an extended period of time that might cause them to miss a payment, the last thing they would want is for their policy to lapse. If automatic premium loan is checked yes, and the policy has been enforced long enough to generate a cash value, we will then borrow the monthly premium from the cash value to ensure that the policy stays in force. Then later, your client can make the premium back up if they choose. Taking a look at the payment section, we allow annual, semi-annual, quarterly, and monthly. Please select only one mode of payment. And it's important to note that if your client is paying annually, semi-annually, or quarterly, it is the responsibility of the payer and the agent to submit the first payment to the administrative office in Frankfort, Kentucky. If your client is wanting to pay with a debit or credit card, we do accept Visa, MasterCard, and the Direct Express debit card. Card information is only taken at the time of the phone interview. Please do not submit any forms with card information. Do not fax or upload into your agent portal any card information. First year commissions will be reduced by 5% and renewal commissions will be reduced by 1% for all card paying policies. Card paying policies are paid as earned, meaning we do not advance commissions for card paying policies. And please note that your agent guide does read that no more than 20% of an agent's submitted business can be card paying policies. Then enter in the face amount and modal premium. If you collect a check or a money order, state the amount collected. 
If you do not collect a check or a money order, then mark the box None Draft First Payment. This means that we, the company, will automatically draft their first and ongoing premiums. Please make sure you complete the bank authorization or what we call the PAT form. If your client is submitting money with the application, checks and money orders must be made payable to Trinity Life Insurance or Family Benefit Life Insurance, and you need to mail that check or money order to the administrative office in Frankfort, Kentucky. Now we'll move on to the issue date. You will write down the issue month, then select which date the premium is to be drafted. These dates can only be the 1st through the 28th of the month or 2nd, 3rd, or 4th Wednesday of the month. Let's look at some examples how to fill out this section. Let's say we have a 60-year-old female applicant that smokes tobacco and is applying for simplified issue policy. In the first example, she wants an automatically monthly draft out of her bank account. You would write $10,000 as the face amount. Her monthly modal premium would be $45.87 a month. She decides that she wants the company to draft her first premium, and she does not want to align her premium payments with Social Security. She wants all premiums to be the 22nd of each month starting in November. Therefore, the issue date of her policy is November 22nd. Now, let's look at an example if the same applicant wants to align their premium payments with Social Security. You would still write $10,000 as a face amount, and the modal premium would still be $45.87 a month. We are still going to draft the first premium, which, by the way, I normally suggest let us draft the initial premium. However, now she wishes to align her premiums with her Social Security benefits. She advises you she receives her Social Security on the third Wednesday of the month. You will then write the issue month, leave the 1st through the 28th blank, and then check the third Wednesday box. A great benefit of doing business with Trinity Life and Family Benefit is we allow up to a 45-day requested issue date. Being an agent myself, when it came to Thanksgiving time, people would sometimes say, come back and see me after the first of the year. Well, the great thing about Trinity and Family Benefit is the first and third of January are always within 45 days of Thanksgiving. So go ahead and write them up. They won't have the coverage until then. We won't draft their account until then. They would have already received their policy and everything is ready to go. You simply fill in January the 3rd and then indicate on the bank authorization form if it is to be time to Social Security or not. What if your client wants to start their coverage immediately? Perhaps they have a birthday coming up, but also wants to align their future premium payments to be time to their Social Security deposit on the 3rd of every month. In this example, let's say you completed the interview on November the 4th and again, the client wants immediate coverage. For the immediate draft, you would write November as the issue month, write the issue date as the 4th, and then at the bottom of the application, you will write, please draft upon issue with all future drafts to occur on the 3rd of the month beginning December 3rd, 2021. This will let the company know that the client would like us to issue and draft her account upon approval. Then future drafts will be the third of the month. And again, indicate on the bank authorization form if the third of the month premium payments are to be timed to Social Security or not. Now that we've covered question five, let's move on to six and seven. Question six asks if the insured has any existing coverage, and if so, will the new policy be replacing this coverage? If replacement is involved, we will need the company name, policy number, coverage amount, and the year issued. We cannot issue a policy if replacement is involved and your client does not know the name of the company and coverage amount they are replacing. Plus, if you don't know that information, how would you know if it's in the client's best interest if you don't know what they are replacing? Question 7 asks for the applicant's primary care physician or facility. This can include doctors, practitioners, or a health care facility. We will need to know the name, address, approximate month and year last seen, and the contact information. The reason we are asking this information at the time of application isn't to be used when they are applying, but it is to help us process contestable claims in a timely manner. Too often, beneficiaries such as a son or daughter do not know this information. 
And when their parent dies during the contestability period, the kids don't know who mom or dad's doctor was when the policy was issued. Knowing this information up front will help your client's families receive the life insurance money in a timely manner, which is what your client would want to begin with, right? Section 8 is where you'll list all beneficiaries. We will need to know their names, the percentages, their relationship to the proposed insured, their date of birth, and their social security numbers. We will issue a policy without the beneficiary's date of birth and social security number. However, this information will help us locate the beneficiaries at the time of death, especially when it's a common name. In this example, the applicant has one primary and two contingent beneficiaries. You will first put the primary beneficiary's information. Primary beneficiaries must be over age 18. The reason for that is companies will not pay a death benefit to a beneficiary who is not of age. On this example, since there is only one primary, the total percentage would be 100% for that primary beneficiary. Now we will add the contingent beneficiaries. It's important to remember that if the proposed insured has more than one primary or more than one contingent, each category must total 100%. Since the applicant wants two contingent beneficiaries, you will select contingent and then fill in the information. In this example, the client decided that the contingent beneficiaries will be split between the two grandchildren. This means that you would write 50% for each grandchild. Now we'll move on to section two, the back of the application. Let's break it down. In order to be approved, the proposed insured must meet our height and weight requirements. The build chart can be found on page 11 of the agent guide. We will also need to know if the proposed insured has gained or lost any weight in the past year. If they did, mark the box accordingly and then add the total amount of pounds that they have lost or gained. Next, we will need to know if the proposed insured has used any form of tobacco or nicotine products of any kind, and that also includes patches, electronic cigarettes, vaping pens or devices. This question should also be marked yes if they have consumed marijuana or THC products of any form in the past 12 months. If they have used any of the listed, then you will mark yes and price at the tobacco rate. Questions 3 through 12 ask about the proposed insured's medical history. If the applicant answers yes to any of these questions, then they will not be eligible for any coverage. Questions 13 through 15 continue to ask about the proposed insured's medical history. However, if they answer yes to questions 13, 14, or 15, then the proposed insured may only qualify for the graded death benefit. If either of these questions are answered yes, please specify the specific impairment or disease and provide details if needed. Both the proposed insured and or the proposed owner will need to thoroughly read, sign, and date the acknowledgement section. If a check or money order was collected, then insert the amount. Only fill and sign the conditional receipt if there was money collected. When a check or money order is submitted, you will leave the conditional receipt with the client and then mail the check or money order to the administrative office in Frankfort, Kentucky. It is important to remember that you will also have to leave the accelerated benefit rider summary and disclosure statement with the applicant and mark the box yes to confirm that your client received the form. And an area that is commonly missed on a paper app is the signed at line. Please write in the city and state in which the application was signed by the applicant. In the agent certification section, you will need to confirm if replacement of existing insurance or an annuity is involved and mark yes or no if you or a splitting agent is related to the applicant and please indicate the relationship. We will also need to know where to send the policy. If the policy is sent to the agent, Note that you have 30 days from the date received to deliver the policy. If neither box is marked, the policy will be mailed to the agent. Please make sure to print your name, provide your agent code, and sign the application. If the commission will be split between agents, mark the split percentage for each agent. Let's discuss important information about the underwriting, interview process, and the materials you will need to leave with the client. Our final expense application process has been designed that if your client is perfectly honest with you at the time of application, even prior to our required telephone interview, 
you have a pretty good idea how the policy should be issued. That way you're not wasting your time. One tool we have to help with field underwriting is our prescription checklist, which is color-coded to help you determine how the policy will be issued. For example, hydroxyurea is a medication that is in red. Hydroxyurea is prescribed for treating cancer or sickle cell anemia. If this medication appears on the insured's prescription check, they will be declined coverage. Next, if a medication in yellow appears, like isosorbide, and it was filled in the past 12 months, the client will be declined coverage. If it was last filled in the past 12 to 24 months, the client will be offered the graded death benefit. If a medication is in green, like loxapine, appears on the prescription check and it has been filled in the past two years, the applicant would be offered the graded death benefit. Finally, if the proposed insured filled a medication that is in blue, like lisinopril, we consider these medications alert or evaluated drugs. If the prescription check shows a medication in blue, your client will be asked questions about why it was prescribed and they could be issued as simplified, graded, or declined. Please note that this prescription checklist is a guideline to help you with field underwriting. This list is not 100% comprehensive because medications are always changing and new medications often enter the market. We'll do our best to keep this list updated. However, please be aware there are many medications out there that can still cause your client to be declined or offered a graded benefit that are not on our list. Note that any medications asked about the applicant's medications will only be the blue or evaluation medications. The medications that fall under the red, yellow, or green categories are automatically underwritten and evaluated. We do require a phone interview with all final expense applications. You'll find we actually get as much information from you, the agent, as we do the applicant. Therefore, you, the agent, must complete the phone interview with the applicant. Management Research Services, or MRS, is who conducts our telephone interviews, and their telephone number is in the top right corner of the application, as well as in your agent guide. Our goal is point of sale approval. At the end of the phone interview, most often you and your client will find out whether they've been approved, denied, or graded. In rare cases, if further underwriting is needed, we will respond via email with a decision in a timely manner. You have three options as an agent to complete the Golden Eagle final expense application. You can choose between a short paper application, a paperless application, or an e-application. All three options do require a phone interview. But please keep in mind that one of the purposes of these phone interviews is that they can help protect you, the agent, if a question later arises. The paper application requires you, the agent, to fill out the required information on the application, the bank authorization form, and replacement form depending on your state requirements. The phone interview for the paper application is an average of 15 minutes. Once the phone interview is completed, you will need to submit the application packet either by faxing it directly to MRS or through your agent portal. The paperless application does not require any documentation to be submitted to the company. Instead, the information needed will be asked and recorded during the phone interview process and the interviewer will complete the application for you. You don't have to worry about submitting any forms, no errors on any application, and the policy is usually mailed out in two business days. The only disadvantage on the paperless application process over the paper app is the average phone interview is 10 minutes longer than the paper application phone interview. However, you don't have to worry about submitting any forms, no errors on any application, and again, the policy is usually mailed out in two business days. Our final option is our e-application. You'll log into your agent portal, select e-apps, and then click on the link for Golden Eagle Final Expense. This will then take you to the e-application portal. You will need to answer questions for the required information, then you will be prompted to call the phone interview line. The average phone interview is five to seven minutes. Once the interview is complete, you will need to fill out the rest of the information and then submit the application electronically to the company. Let's break down the phone interview process of the paper application. We'll first start by asking you your agent information and then follow with the applicant's information. The applicant will then confirm the information that was provided is correct 
and the applicant gives their MIB and HIPAA authorizations. We then ask the medical questions on the application. If there were any alert or evaluated drugs in blue that need to be evaluated, we will ask the applicant questions about that medication. If your client is approved for simplified or the graded death benefit, we will ask for the plan being applied for and confirm the premium with you. As stated earlier, once the interview is complete, it is the responsibility of the agent to submit the application paperwork to the company and you can either fax or upload the application packet through your agent portal. If you're submitting the application via fax, we've provided a fax cover sheet for you. You can find this in your new agent kit or in the agent form section of the website. If submitting a check or a money order for the first premium, please see the highlighted address for the administrative office in Frankfort, Kentucky. You can also find this address in your agent guide. The paperless application interview is very similar to the paper application interview, and if approved, once the premium quote is confirmed, we will then get from you, the agent, the payment information, the beneficiary information, and replacement information if needed. Once these are obtained, we will gather voice signatures from the applicant, owner, and payer if different from the applicant, and then from you, the agent. We recommend that you gather the application, beneficiary, replacement, and payment information prior to the telephone interview as not to be caught off guard or unaware of the types of questions you and the applicant will be asked. The e-application process will consist of three parts. You will need to log into your agent portal and select Golden Eagle Final Expense under the e-app tab. This will bring you to the MRS e-app website. From there, you will select Start Interview and click Trinity and Family Benefit Final Expense. Part one of the e-application, you will need to input your agent information and the applicant's information. Then you will read all medical questions to the applicant and select the answers accordingly. If you are face-to-face -face with the applicant, you will need to review the medical and consumer authorizations and have the applicant agree to the authorizations by typing to sign. Once all of the required information is entered, you will then call the interview line at 888-995-7722. The interviewer will confirm the applicant's information first. If you are not face-to-face -face with the applicant, then the interviewer will record the medical and consumer authorization next. Once we have received the authorizations, the interviewer will verify the health history of the applicant. Similar to the paper and paperless applications, we could possibly inquire about medications that the applicant is taking or has been prescribed. Then, once we have the information needed, you should receive an underwriting decision right then and there. Once the interview is completed, you will then access the application via My Cases in the MRS eApp website. You will then continue to collect the plan information, payment information, requested issue date, and beneficiary information. Depending on the state requirements, we will also collect any replacement information. Remember, we do not accept replacements in Kansas, Kentucky, and West Virginia. Finally, we collect signatures using DocuSign. If you are face-to-face -face with the applicant, owner, and or payer, you will have all parties signed electronically in the application. If one or more parties is not present at the time of the application, you may choose to send a signing link either via email or text. From there, the signee will click the provided link. They will need the last four digits of their social security number and the PIN that was provided. Once all signatures are obtained, you will select Next. Once you are back on your case profile, this means that we have received the application. For paper applications, you will need to leave the following with the applicant the Accelerated Benefit Rider Summary and Disclosure Statement, because remember on the back of the application you marked a box that you left this form with the applicant. You will also leave the Important Notice section located on the inside back cover of the Golden Eagle Final Expense Packet, as this includes the Fair Credit Reporting Act and the MIB disclosures. A copy of the replacement form if and when it is required by the applicant's state, and the conditional receipt is completed and left with the applicant but that is only if premium is being submitted with the application. For Pennsylvania agents, there is also your state required cash value disclosure form. You will need to provide the following materials prior to the phone interview if you are completing a paperless or any application. For paperless, 
you will need to provide the applicant with the accelerated benefit rider summary and disclosure statement, the important notices, which is the Fair Credit Reporting Act and the MIB disclosures, and the replacement form, depending on state requirements. For the e-application, you will need to provide the applicant with a copy of the application, the accelerated benefit rider summary and disclosure statement, the replacement form, depending on state requirements, the important notices, which again is the Fair Credit Reporting Act and the MIB disclosures, and if writing in Pennsylvania, you will need to provide the Pennsylvania Cash Value Disclosure Form. Once the application has been submitted, you will receive email notifications informing you of the status of the application and policy. If you are doing a paper application, you will receive a courtesy email letting you know we have received the app, another email if there are any requirements such as an error on the application, and a third email when your application packet has been sent to the Administrative Office for Policy Issuance, and then a final email letting you know the policy has been mailed. For both the paperless and the e-applications, you will receive an email when your application packet has been sent to the Administrative Office for Policy Issuance, and then a second email letting you know the policy has been mailed, which is usually within two business days of the phone interview. Please be advised that if the owner is anyone other than the insured, insurable interest must apply. This is in addition to the beneficiary's insurable interest requirement when the owner, payer, and or insured are not one and the same person. The following relationships are deemed to be insurable interest. Spouse, sibling, parent and child, grandparent and grandchild. If the owner and or payer do not have one of these above mentioned relationships to the insured, you will have to submit a paper application and documentation of the insurable interest. Please note, fiancés, boyfriend, girlfriends, or in-law relationships do not constitute as insurable interest. In addition, if the owner and or payer are different from the insured, all parties must be present during the telephone interview if utilizing the paperless application process. If you have any questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to contact our home office at 866-211-0811. You may also call this number if you need a risk assessment for the Golden Eagle Final Expense product. If you or your client needs to update, change, or inquire about their policy after it has been issued, please call our administrative office at 866-440-1357 with the extension 4002. This will bring you to a live representative to help you with your needs. In closing, I would like to thank you for your time and attention. If you've already written with Trinity Life and Family Benefit, thank you for your business. If you haven't yet, then my suggestion would be to write about a half dozen apps so that way you can decide for yourself about Trinity and Family Benefit being easy companies to do business with. Thank you. And all right, we are back. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to the continuation, the final round the third run. We're almost here at the end of our final expense sales and marketing mastery with a focus in face-to-face -face training. Thank you so much for being here, ladies and gentlemen. Some of you have been here the whole time. I commend you for your patience and your commitment to the cause. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you so much. Appreciate it very much. A special thanks, of course, to Trinity Family Benefit. Alvin, thanks so much for hosting that for us. To tell us more about Trinity Family Benefit uh, as a final expense product. Definitely recommend it. Excellent product. Also recommend uh, Security National Life, another one of our sponsors, and thank you iLife as well for graciously sponsoring this event. So we're rounding the corner here, getting ready for the final uh, few uh, bit of trainings here and want to make sure that um, we cover those before we wrap it up. So let me give you a little bit of uh, what to expect. Number one, we're going to talk about, for a moment, uh, leads for final expense. So if you've got questions about leads for final expense, this is a great opportunity to throw them into the chat. And uh, we're going to cover your questions about leads, uh, what work well for the face-to-face -face agent. I'm going to kind of give you a general overview there and then kind of open it up to your questions. Then we're going to talk about scaling this business of which we've learned from A to Z today, how to scale it up to $10,000 in production a week. We'll talk briefly about some numbers in order to accomplish just that. And then last but not least, I'm going to pull this forward a little bit. There you go. Uh, we're going to take your questions and then just basically 
the questions that um, you've had that maybe I've dismissed because they were just not timely is a great opportunity to ask that. And I'll spend, probably start that about five o'clock earlier if there's um, not much questions with the other stuff. And then we'll run up to about six o'clock or so, and then we'll call it a day. A great accomplishment. Okay. So leads, leads are important here. So if you're new here to the broadcast, if you're new to the channel, final expense is all about buying leads. We rarely do any kind of cold calling whatsoever, uh, thankfully, because most people wouldn't do this business if they had to go cold door to door. It's too much of a grind for most people and it is pretty tough. And especially when you can just invest money into leads that actually are interested, it kind of changes the game on um, how this business is run and kind of what the benefits are. So the question becomes, what leads are the best to use? I'm going to give you my perspective on final expense leads and what are the best to use based off of years of selling final expense personally, years of training thousands of agents in my national final expense agency. And I'm going to give you really uh, what I believe are the only few choices you should use. So number one is direct mail. Uh, I know if you've been around long enough, it's like, geez, Dave, do you say anything differently? No because direct mail still today is the best form of lead generation that a face-to-face -face agent can use. If you're unfamiliar as to what direct mail is, it's pretty simple. Uh, your clients every week are getting uh, letters in the mail about new important information about funeral expense programs. And then they open the envelope to find more in information and details, and then request sometimes fill out the form, in this case a postcard, and then put it in their mailbox to request information back. And then you get it as the agent and then you work that person like we talked about door knocking them or setting the appointment up over the phone to see them. Direct mail is king for a number of reasons. First of all, the recall rate on direct mail is tremendous. People remember filling out cards more than they remember answering a telemarketed call or a Facebook lead. So there's usually a lot more engagement into what it's about. Second of all, the shelf life for direct mail is just way better than uh, what you would see with other forms of lead generation. I have an agent named Mindy in my agency who I remember last year bought a bunch of leads. Apparently, I didn't realize this, never did much with them, and then worked them about a year later up to this point. So a year later, she goes out and she writes like five times the amount of her investment. It may be even more. And that was leads that were sitting out there for literally a year. Uh, you don't get that same kind of impact working aged uh, Facebook leads. That's just those are are really picked over in many cases, and somebody usually buys a lot faster on those than direct mail. So direct mail is more sticky in its recall rate and its effectiveness in getting sales, not just immediately but into the future. And uh, truth be told, the quality is just that much better than most lead sources with direct mail. You have a lot more uh, p propensity to saturate a market and get more leads back per square mile than you do digital leads. A lot of the time with Facebook leads, let's say, or even telemarketing, you're gonna cover a larger geography. You're gonna cover a lot more ground. You're gonna be behind the wheel longer. Whereas even with a rural area, you can drop direct mail and get leads pretty consolidated in a rural area, much less Metro, and uh, stay busier more often uh, with the leads tightly packed in one geographic area versus other options. And then plus you have the physicality of the lead itself, which is great. You get to show that person what they actually did and that helps them get gain leverage for you to get in the door and then to pitch them. So these are all the reasons I love direct mail and they just work. If you talk to top producers, most of them face-to-face -face still do direct mail. Uh, even with the prices going up, even with the response rates going down, direct mail still does better work than really any form of lead generation that I know of. And if I knew of something scalable and better, then I would definitely recommend it. And let me speak to that uh, kind of um, objection that I'm getting from a lot of people. I, I get this sometimes in my comments, uh, on my uh, Q&A calls, but also on my um, uh, just, just comments is that, oh, direct mail is getting more expensive, Post, uh, postal rates have gone up, uh, response rates have gone down because the market is saturated, it's becoming a worser form of lead by the day. And my argument is good, I'm glad you think that because I want you to think that direct mail is too expensive. I want you to think that the response rates suck and for some reason that's warranting not to use them. Are all these things a concern? Absolutely. 
But what happens with a price going up on the lead is that less of your competition gets it. And I have a theory here in this business that there's not so much competition amongst agents as there is amongst lead sources. And as prices go up, it doesn't have an effect on the supply of agents willing to purchase those leads. Uh, for example, that used to be Facebook leads three or four years ago were half the price as they are now, but there's so much more agents buying into them that the bid price on the average lead has gone up because of the saturation effect. Um, and the same impact has been had on direct mail, but really has slowly kind of been increasing over time too. But if I have a new agent in, or a new agent comes in the business and they see the price of direct mail versus Facebook and other options, which are cheaper, the ones who are uninformed and uneducated will think, and this is the wrong thinking, will think that the cheaper option is the better option. But you get what you pay for in this business. And invariably what happens is that there are less people now because of the price going up for direct mail to actually people end up using it. So all of this is the same. Those people who are doing direct mail, I think, are in a better position than they were two, three, four years ago. Yeah, it's more expensive, but the acquisition costs are still low enough for a good agent that you should be returning minimum $3 for every dollar in revenue, if not closer to $4 and beyond. A good agent should still perform very well, even though the acquisition cost has gotten higher on those leads. Plus, I would argue you're not going to be up against nearly as much competition within that segment of marketing because what prospects do is they tend to, to prefer one form of marketing over another. They tend to just respond to digital ads or they tend to respond to just uh, uh, postcard ads and that kind of thing. So you're competing with a group of people in the, in the response world in, in, in mail that simply you're going to have less prospects because of, of agents sourcing those leads because they're not going to be able to afford them or the price point is scary enough that that's going to scare a lot of people away that otherwise wouldn't have got into it. So supply and demand tend to focus and, and, and things into effect. They tend to balance themselves out. And my recommendation is don't be scared by the price difference. You should be happy. If you really are concerned about getting the best source of leads in this business, then you really need to be fixated on getting direct mail and making sure that you pay the price necessary in order to get the best. So again, you're making an investment in your business and the leads are 95% of your overhead costs in this business. It's a direct sales business. So why wouldn't you invest in the best options for success? That's my argument. You need to figure out a way to do it. That's what I did when I got started. I invested in direct mail. It was the best decision I ever made. Um, now, there are other options. I'm not here to just basically just tell you how great direct mail is and how everything else is trash. There are plenty of agents that do very well working Facebook leads. That is a second choice option, and that is a good choice that I believe works to get up and running to develop cash flow to then reinvest into some kind of direct mail lead. Um, Facebook leads are very good if you buy from a vetted vendor that knows what they're talking about, that's honest, that's straightforward, that will do the job correctly. Um, you definitely want to find those that are, are going to fit that bill. Um, you it can expect to uh, work a higher or larger geographical area. This is more problematic if you're working a large metro area like Atlanta. You'll be north and south of the city and have to deal with traffic, and that can be frustrating. Uh, I found more success doing Facebook leads myself as an agent working the rural areas uh, and kind of smaller town areas where, yes, there was some geography, but agents are kind of lazy. They'd rather work their backyard. So having to drive out a little bit to see people in smaller town America, I found there was less resistance and issues to that. And I would have really good success working Facebook leads. So um, it is something that I think works very well. You tend to have to buy more Facebook uh, leads than you would direct mail, uh, just because there is definitely gonna be a quality difference. You have to work your Facebook leads faster than you would with direct mail, because again, they don't have as much shelf life. I remember buying a bunch of leads, sitting on them for like six to eight weeks, and then we started calling them. And this was years ago when there wasn't as much saturation. And like six of them, six of them told me they already bought. And that's like facepalm. You know, those were sales had I been first in line. And uh, had I worked them faster, would have gotten them. So you got to move fast on Facebook leads if you're going to use them. The last type of lead that I would use as a face-to-face -face agent would be, in a sense, a free lead. And this is using what's called seminar marketing. So we teach this for agents that join our agency for free. I've got a course you can buy. It's like 500 bucks, um, but it's pretty simple. The idea is, is, is simple. You go into uh, senior living facilities like HUD facilities, 
pitch the activity director to do an educational seminar and you come back, spend 10, 15 minutes speaking, develop and cultivate leads. And the goal is to close a lead or two into sales. The benefit of this strategy is there's no acquisite, well, there's no um, lead cost, very little lead cost, because you're giving seminars and developing leads without having to buy them. And it's a high return on investment activity. It's a great way to start the business, to develop cash flow and to build a bankroll. I don't see it as a long-term proposition for most agents because you have to start really expanding your horizons and traveling to different cities to keep the seminars going because there's only so many senior HUD facilities that are out there. But that is a great way to get up and running. It's a great way to get started. And you can interweave that strategy with Facebook leads or direct mail. It all works very, very well. And, and honestly, beyond that, guys, I really wouldn't work any other kind of lead. Um, there's uh, there You could work some kind of aged lead. That's fine to start with. But what you run up against uh, the problem with with aged leads is this idea that... Um, you know, you fall into the it's cheap trap and you get what you pay for in leads in this business. If there's, again, one thing on leads I could leave you with is it's an investment. And don't be surprised when your cheap investment results in cheap returns. Now, age leads can work. I'm not saying they can. I've had success with them. So have other good agents. But using them as a core strategy is going to have a lot of shortcomings. What you want to work towards are, the, are those fresh lead sources like direct mail and go all in and triple down on what really works and what is, again, proven to work in this business, which in most markets is direct mail all day long. So direct mail is king. That's what you should be working towards. Everything else pales in comparison, even some of the alternatives. They are helpful to have, but they're definitely not the equivalent of direct mail. Uh, so again, kind of helpfully uh, uh, clarified the importance of direct mail. It is very important to have, and it really does make all the difference, I think. Telemarketed leads, not hot on telemarketed leads anymore. There's just too much compliance issues out there. A lot of these call centers are international. They don't follow uh, TCPA rules, do not call uh, rules. You end up holding the bag if they don't do the right job and are honest in how they, um, you know, uh, generate the leads. And it's just not worth, this juice isn't worth the squeeze anymore on those. Um, I only would look at direct mail Facebook leads, and then cultivating some kind of business with seminar marketing. Any questions on leads? This is the time to ask. Um, again, as I wait for kind of some responses here, please, please, please don't be cheap on leads. One of the biggest reasons people fail this business <clears throat> is because they go cheap on leads. They're told that these, these wonderful leads in a CRM that cost the IMO 25 cents, they were sold for 10 and sold to five other uh, agencies are just as good as any other lead. They're not. They're trash. Uh, they're making somebody, not you, a lot of money. Um, <laughs> and um, and you're working people who, you know, had no idea what it was about. They're just terrible. So my advice is to avoid that crap and just stick to what works well. Again, see what the top people do. What do the top people do? Most of them do direct mail. Um, you don't need to figure anything out. Just Duplicate what works. It's really that simple. Live transfer leads are great if you're doing telesales. Again, this is a face-to-face -face focused call, so I won't really talk about live transfer leads as, as much, but those can work well if you've got a good vendor on a telesales basis. Um, I don't know much about Senior Life's uh, commercial leads and how those work. I mean, TV leads are good, again, if you're doing telesales. Um, I think they're one of the better forms of lead generation for sure, again, for telesales. Problem, you can't do it for face to face because if you take, usually you have to take a multitude of states uh, to just get enough leads as a telesales agent, must much less one. Yeah, so uh, I, that's a good point, uh, Lewis. I left out referrals because one of the things, and, and you would know, referrals are excellent. They're the best form of leads. I don't do much in the way of referrals, and and never did. And and the reason why is because, and it's it's a fault. It really is. When you are getting tons of leads every single week from paid sources like direct mail, and you're barely doing well enough to keep up with that, <laughs> it's, it's hard to justify asking for referrals, which may not be in the same town where you currently are with your leads, which may be a couple of towns over. They start to turn into a distraction more than a benefit. But that's if you're really scaled up and you got more people than you can uh, have time to talk to. But referrals, nevertheless, like you said, are the best form of leads. 
And you really should be, especially in the beginning, asking for this. And if you happen to be doing telesales, like that geographical travel concern, going from one area to another is um, not as much of an issue. So, um, so yeah, uh, you should definitely be asked. We do now have training with referrals and it should be something you should do. Do you have recommend lead generation company? Yeah, uh, I'll give you a couple here that I like. For direct mail, I like needalead.com. I like leadconcepts.com. For um, uh, digital leads, I like uh, gametimeleads.com ttcleads.com and happyagentleads.com. So I'm sure there's other good ones out there, but you know, the leads business is kind of uh, like the used car sales business. You got to be careful where you put your money. Everybody tells you what you want to hear, you know, but you want to make sure that you're working with businesses that are validated, that agents have shown and proved that actually work. So uh, that's leads. Don't be cheap. Actually, you know, do the work, find a good vendor and go all in. Do you need to diversify your lead sources? No, just, you know, if all you do is direct mail and you can buy enough to stay busy, just do direct mail. Don't worry about diversification. That's a principle that works in most other businesses that is important, but here, find what works and triple down on it. Pretty simple. Now, now all of this information, how do you scale to $10,000 in production a week? So in short, this is a short little training here. It's pretty simple. You just do more of what works. Again, this is one of the beautiful things about the final expense business is that once you have a strategy and once you're up and running, the business of final expense is pretty simple. You just run a lot of appointments. Your first goal in final expense should be to hit 15 completed appointments a week. Okay, That's probably going to take 25 to 30 direct mail leads in case you're wondering. But once you're into the flow of that, the easiest way to make more money isn't to figure out how you can increase your conversion rate. It's how do you, it's, it's figuring out how can you run more appointments. And the easiest way to run more appointments is to just buy more leads and to book more appointments. And then therefore you've now got the activity set up to run more appointments. So everybody who's doing 10,000 plus, they're not running in most cases, just 15 appointments a week. They're usually doing a lot more. For example, uh, Richard last week, um, a newer agent that joined us, he wrote 10,700 in premium off of 50 direct mail leads. So he bought 50 of them. He sat down with 23 appointments out of the tw out of the 50 and closed 10 policies. His average case size was just shy of 1,100, which is really good. So long story short, um, thank you, Pitch. I uh, appreciate that. He's got four appointments in the last half hour using my script. Thank somebody's using this stuff. Thank you very much. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, go make some money. Help some people. So, um, but the point is with Richard, you know, he's going in in a big way on the marketing and that's really the thing that you have to do. It's scary putting down the kind of money that it takes to get 50 leads. For him, it's about seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars $1,800 a week. And you gotta wait four or five weeks before those direct mail leads come back. But as they come back and you run appointments, bottom line, what happens is you've got the opportunity in front of you to book what you need to close that kind of business. So it really becomes a function of activity it becomes a function of running the appointments and seeing the people. And really, it goes back to that hard work ethic out there. And uh, bottom line, that's what we care about, is um, if you want to do a lot of business in this in final expense, it's all about seeing the people at scale. One of the things that I learned um, early on and where I basically realized this concept was early on in the insurance forum days, back where that was kind of the center of topics online about insurance sales, final expense specifically. Doug Massey, who's got his own channel too, uh, check him out if you haven't. Uh, Doug talked about writing, I think like $400,000 in 2014 or 15. And what he was doing was just totally different from everybody else. He wasn't closing 35, 40% of his direct mail leads. He was closing 20, 25% of his leads, but he was buying 80 a week or something like that, seeing 40 and closing half. And it was just a shocker. I was like, how is he doing this? And then I realized, oh, he, what he's doing is just more of what works. And he's just got the guts to go all in because he's confident in his presentation and the strategy that he can scale it higher. So the long story short to this is, that's what it's really about is once you've established yourself, so if you're new here, once you establish yourself in final expense, you feel comfortable every week you're gonna make money, the, next, the best way to increase your income is just to buy more leads and run more appointments. It's very hard to go from a 25% lead or application to lead conversion to a 
it's like in baseball, you know, somebody who has a 250 batting average to get the 300 batting average, that's a Herculean effort. But if he doubles the amount of at bats he has, he's probably, and compared to the 300 batting average, he's probably going to have more success than the guy who has a 300 batting average. Does that make sense? Because he's just swinging the bat more. If you swing the bat more, if you run more appointments, that is really the best surefire methodology to get more sales and make more money in this business. And that's one of the things in this business that just is awesome about it is that that's, that's what it really comes down to. It's just, it's just work. It's, it's seeing more people. And what's cool is if you're running 30 plus appointments a week, the work and the presentation itself is, is exactly 95% the same as what you would do at 15 appointments or even 10 appointments a week. So there's not a lot of change between what it takes to run appointments at scale, even in the presentation. So a couple of things here, um, uh, repeat the lead gen. So that would be leadconcepts.com, needalead.com, gametimeleads.com, happyagentleads.com, and ttcleads.com. Just, this is recorded, so just go back and play it if you want to. Um, how far would you travel to see a prospect? By the way, this is a great time. We're about to get into the Q&A segment of the training, and we'll run at least till 6 o'clock. I might end it earlier. It just depends on what questions you have. So if you've got any questions right now about anything at all about final expense, it doesn't have to be face-to-face -face even. Just throw them in the chat. Uh, this is the opportunity to load it up, and then we'll kind of round it out here uh, with your questions as we take this to uh, the end. Um, how far would you travel to see a prospect? So uh, two hours is my maximum distance. I didn't like ever spending the night anywhere. I always like to be at home in my own bed and I would travel at least two hours. So like for me, I would go, you know, just short of Knoxville. I live in Chattanooga, two hour drive, just short of Nashville, two hour drive. But I wouldn't be in a position to where, you know, um, I'm going two and a half, three hours out because then you got to stay in a hotel and that was extra cost and that gets old after a while. So it's stuff that I try to avoid. Um, is 2000 a month enough to start with direct mail? On a part-time basis, it would. Maybe 15 to 20 direct mail pieces if you're in a low or higher response area. You really need closer to 25 to 3000 for it to make sense. At 2000 a month, I'd probably stick you personally as an agent on Facebook leads instead um, as opposed to, um, you know, the digital kind. Hold on one second, guys. Let me get this other camera fired up here. One of the things you do when you're an influencer is you got to repurpose your content. So I'm going to be filming uh, future shorts off of this too. So I can put this on Facebook and uh, Instagram. Uh, let's see here again. Um, how much do direct mail leads cost for final expense? Pretty simple. Uh, in most markets, you're looking at $35 to $40 a lead, maybe upwards to $45 a lead. It is something that price-wise has continued to go up. But the acquisition costs, again, when you look at what it costs to acquire a client and you compare the revenue to the expense to acquire that client, it should be well north of three to one if you're good at this business, if not higher than four to one. And that's a good metric to keep. So one of the things you got to remember, it's not so much what it costs to get, it's what your return potential is. And if you can put $50,000 into a final expense lead system and pull back $200,000 and net $150,000 before taxes, I'd say that's a pretty good system, especially if you can scale it higher than that, as I think it's possible and what makes final expense a really lucrative opportunity. Crap. Okay. Let's see here. Let me go down the list here. Again, start loading up your questions for me as we get into the Q&A portion of the exam. I am glad you added in what an agent earns on average off of writing a certain amount of premium. Yeah, you're welcome. So I would say to it, it's going to depend. So average commissions depend upon the agency you're with. It depends on the age of the client. It depends on the uh, product itself, standard, preferred, modified, graded, guaranteed issue. Um, if you're like with the Ford Insurance Group, if you're a new agent, 100 110% is the average of the annual premium. If you're an experienced agent, it's 110 120%. Experienced agents up to 130%. Uh, productive agencies up to 140%. Um, but averaging for commission makes a difference because, you know, um, some business models pay less and make you pay for leads. Some pay you less, but don't make you pay for leads. So you got to look at that full financial picture to get the full thing. And if I can expand on that, let me know. Uh, let's see here. All right. 
Ban that account. It's a bot. Look at the fly they already did. I Man, I've, that's all I've been doing all day. John, jeez. Uh, yeah, I know. We get that all day. How do direct mail leads work? So direct mail is pretty simple and final expense. You go to one of those vendors we mentioned. You tell them to drop mail in certain zip codes or counties. And then from there, uh, you wait three, four, maybe five weeks before returns start coming in. Um, it takes that long because that's how long it takes to print, to mail out, to mail back. It's a process. But in return, you get the best leads that I think are available to face-to-face -face agents. Prices are $35 to $45 a lead. And there are several companies like what we mentioned earlier that sell them. So just check out the uh, uh, what was mentioned prior uh, to get some more information. So final qu call for questions here uh, as we kind of wait for your questions to come in. Let me uh, scroll to uh, some of these up here that we may have missed. What premium amount would you consider a good amount that has the best coverage, 70, 80, 90? Um, or companies with the best coverage and prices, I should say. That's gonna be totally dependent on the client. I don't know which companies are best until I understand their health, what they're looking to accomplish and what's important to them. So I can't arbitrarily tell you the $70 price range this, this client's going to be best suited by this company because what if they're 85 versus somebody who's 65, right? So carriers are just ends or means to an end. What I need to know is what the client's health is, what they want to accomplish, what's important to them, and then factor that all into an underwriting assessment to figure out which options are best. And then I'll pick from my selection of carriers that I feel is the best combination of price or coverage. That's how I figure out what's best suited. And then it will be, it will be that one company that's best suited usually for all of those price ranges as well. Yeah, I agree, Kahuna. Hope you enjoyed it. All right, looking through here for more questions to answer. Have you seen a big difference in chargebacks on telesales versus face-to-face? -face? The truth is I haven't. I have not seen big chargeback issues with telesales agents as I originally once thought. I really thought that agents would have more chargebacks with telesales and face-to-face -face because you're simply not there connecting with the client uh, in a way that's, I think, as good as face-to-face. -face. I have heard of organizations in the business that have a 70% persistency rate that are one carrier carriers on telesales and a 70% per per placement rate, which means they keep half the business after the first year they place, which to me is crazy, or at least they write or submit. Um, so I was a little worried about that originally, but bottom line, that just hasn't happened that way. Um, we sell and broker uh, with multiple carriers, and I think that's made the telesales business persistency-wise a lot better. Um, I have not seen the persistency problem that I suspected three or four years ago, considering the telesales business, and it's been pretty good. Uh, let's see here. Do you usually send a text to avoid the potential spam name on phone when calling? No, I don't like sending text messages at all until I have tried to call them a couple of times because I feel like any form of communication outside of a door knock or a phone call is inferior because they control the interaction with the, the, with the process of the sale. If I text them something, then they can think about what to reply or just ignore it altogether. I would rather get them on the phone and in an engagement where I can have more direction and control. So I look at text message as something that I do if I can't get the other person to pick up. I will try to get them to pick up on the phone. I will try to get them to do that before I text. And then when I text them, I'll text their first name with a question mark to basically bait them to call me back or at least text me back. And then I'll call them because now their suspicions have arisen and curiosity is high enough that I think their uh, likelihood of answering will be a lot better. So that's how I use text. All right, let's see here. Again, just cycling back some of these training. Uh, do you have training on what is in your bag when you go to the door? What do you take on an appointment? Very simple. I have a clipboard. I have my leads. I have pens. I have a calculator just in case technology fails when it's most needed. I have a laptop with bookmarks to all my major uh, application engines. The cheat sheet we talked about earlier, the quoter, um, you know, uh, the, that kind of stuff. I have spare paper applications in the back of my car. I have a an, uh, an accordion binder that I put applications, rate guides, uh, underwriting guides, replacement forms, anything that I need as a backup in case tech fails at its worst possible moment. And that's pretty much the extent of it. It is not much that you carry, but just enough to get the job done and backups just in case I need them is what is with me. All right, let's see here. 
I've heard about software that actually gives best available carriers for final expense based on inputs like age, health, etc. Guess it saves time and money, especially early on. It's in the $50 range. Is it worth it? So yeah, this is insurancetoolkits.com. I highly recommend them. If you put in DeFord or DeFord 15, you'll get 15% off. It should take it to the 30s, maybe mid 40s range, depending on what kind of uh, quoter that you get. They do an excellent job. They're best in class on their quoter. I highly recommend them. They're a great alternate to the cheat cheat strategy that I have. Um, I have nothing but good things to say about them. So if you feel like an automated kind of like quoter solution that will also underwrite would be good for you, you should check them out. And I'm not paid anything to say that. I have no affiliate arrangement with them. All right, again, keep your questions coming in. We're now to the Q&A side of the business and I'm just going through um, some of these past questions here before I get to your new questions, just to give you some time to load them up. Um, let's see here. How does an insurance company pay a non-contracted agent? They don't. You have to be appointed with a carrier in order to get paid. Does a contracted agent make more commission than a non? Unless you're talking about captive, the payout's the same. Either the agency pays the, the uh, agent or the carrier pays the agent. Now, one thing in final expense, ladies and gentlemen, that you want to make sure you have set up is it's preferable to have the carrier pay you, not the agency. Why is that? If the agency pays you, you probably don't own your book of business. You're on what's called a line of authority contract. So if you leave the company, you're not going to be paid residuals. You're making the owner rich, not yourself. If you're paid directly from the carrier, you're probably what's called 100% vested. You own your book of business. You can call your book of business and you'll continue to get paid on your book of business and residuals, assuming it stays on the books. It's better to be vested and directly paid from a company in most cases than paid directly from an agency. All right. Again, if you got questions, please throw them in the chat. Going back here a good bit here. Uh, which carriers for final expense are good for direct express? I personally like using Prosperity in most cases. Why? Because Prosperity pays a full advance on direct express business where the vast majority of others don't. They've had great success on collecting uh, business that is uh, direct express on a persistent basis so you don't get chargebacks. Um, also Transamerica I've heard is good. We don't write a lot of business with them for a lot of reasons. Also Great Western takes them. Also Security National as well as Trinity as well. But most of those are other than Prosperity are gonna pay as earned. And that's kind of the main reason why for Prosperity, cash flow is king in this business and getting advances is important. Okay, going back through these questions here. All right. I think there's a max amount of questions here, so if it's any later than that, I apologize. All right. Okay. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. How much production does an agent need to get to your top comp of 130%? We want to see 270 applications written within a six month period of time or less. So it's kind of an app count goal more than anything. Uh, to get 125 with most carriers, it's 170 apps in a six month period of time, look back. If you want more information on how commissions work with us, go to davidduford.com forward slash commissions, and then you can investigate more there. Is it hard to not hold captive, or to not be held captive, or do most companies not want you to sell for others? Um, I guess it depends on the structure. Like if you go work for a Lincoln Heritage or Senior Life, uh, they're going to want you to do all your business with them. Although some arrangements they'll let you are okay with you selling outside of them. But the main benefit to working with a a one carrier agency is is they'll probably provide training and support and lead programs. And in exchange, they want you to do all that business with them. So I think what it comes down to is that if you're going to go in the captive world, you got to be all in. That's the way I look at it. Um, otherwise, if you're independent and you believe in the independent model, you know, you want to have options. So it's one of those things where it's like, you know, pick your poison. All right, last call for questions one more time. So just as a reminder here before we wrap this up, again, number one, uh, this will all be recorded. You can come back and watch the entirety of this training at a later date. Um, well, really like right away, once YouTube gets done processing this training, then um, you'll be able to access it and then watch it. And then what we'll go back and do 
is I'll get my assistant to go back and look at the timestamps on this, and then we'll put some timestamps in the comments. I'll post them uh, up later, and then um, that way you can go watch different segments of the training and kind of get to what it is that you actually want to see. Uh, let's see what else here. I think I covered most of the questions, and then we're going to be wrapping it up here. Um, what states would you recommend? And keep those qu guys. As soon as I run out of questions at this point, we'll have to wrap it up. So if you got them, let them let them out. Uh, what states would you recommend being licensed for telesales these days? So, you know, uh, I think not New York. New York has no carriers that are really functionally any good up there. So just scratch that from the list. Some say Florida is tough to do outbound calls in. Um, the problem with outbound is that um, in Florida is that a lot of them get outbound and they're just a harder group of people to deal with because everybody knows seniors live there. So some people say scratch Florida. I generally tell people if you're going to do telesales, you want to work with a more lower income state. So I like the Southeast. I also like the Midwest. Pretty much pick whatever states that sound good to you there. And I think you'll do just fine. I live in Florida. Should I start there or add off right at the bat? Really your decision. You could work Florida just fine, but if you wanted to try a southeastern state, try Tennessee or Kentucky or Arkansas, something like that. Uh, how would commission work if doing some business through iLife? It looks exactly the same. iLife is just a, a way to streamline the business. Um, it's not going to take away from commission or anything like that. It just, it's, it's a sales uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A sales fulfillment type of business. It makes sales easier. A sales, I forget, I'm, I'm, my brain is fried, but there's a word that describes it, but it doesn't do anything or get in the way. If you died, would your wife take over? No. Uh, probably what would happen is I would uh, have some type of succession plan in place uh, for somebody to come in and take over to execute the business strategy. Uh, most likely... Uh, something I'm actually looking at. I think you left that question for us, I think for our husband-wife uh, video that my wife and I are going to do here soon. And it's a great question. Um, have some kind of succession plan in place in order to take over uh, and maintain that asset with probably an end game to sell it, is what I would say. Um, one of the things in my business model, Time Creator, was I, I wanted to separate business from pleasure. Um, I did not want to bring my wife into this business. I just had zero interest in um, creating a family business in the sense that my, my wife would be intimately involved. Um, part of the reason why is I saw my dad and my stepmother, they ran the chemical business and they kind of turned more into brother, sister versus lovers. And so I, again, whether that's right or wrong, plenty of people do it fine. But my, my take on it was I just didn't want to... Um, you know, uh, blend the lines between work and play. So, um, and I always wanted a wife that would help stay home, raise the kids. Um, that's what we do now and have accomplished it. And, you know, it's, it's our vision has kind of been realized. So, you know, um, we're glad the way it turned out. Okay. Can you explain true social security billing? I can. Um, by the way, thank you, Mary. Uh, social security billing. Uh, imagine your clients getting their check from Uncle Sugar right? It's the third of the month. Um, however, sometimes our draft is at, at, at ideally going to be draft on the same day that Uncle Sam pays Social Security. But sometimes when the pay is paid out, our draft comes later. For example, on a Saturday, if the third falls on a Saturday, which is the most common date people get their check from the government, um, Uncle Sam pays a day early on Friday, the second. But if you don't have Social Security billing set up, you don't get paid till Monday because drafts are set up normally numerically. They're set up on a date, not a day. And if the day falls off on a day where the banks are closed and don't process transactions like the weekend, it's the soonest available day, which is Monday. So your client gets paid on the second. You get the draft sent out on the 5th. They've had a whole weekend to blow their money on smokes and booze, as I like to say. So the more time between the draft deposit and the draft that you take the money out, the higher likelihood there's going to be chargebacks. This is more of an issue. It's definitely an issue on checking and savings accounts, but it's more of an issue on debit cards like Direct Express. So true Social Security billing came out. Transamerica invented the concept, released it in 2014. And the concept is simple. Instead of a numerical date draft, it is a moving target based off of what the actual deposit date is for the Social Security bill or Social Security uh, income payment. 
And so what happens is in this example, since the third fall on in this hypothetical example fall on a Saturday and the client got paid on Friday, our draft comes out on that Friday because it's a moving target associated with the deposit date. So we beat the client to the ATM. We get their money before they get it. And that really increases the persistency level. You should, by default, only sell companies that have Social Security deposit billing for that reason completely. That just gives you a lot more life and a lot more capability to keep the business that you sell. Uh, Texas is good. Yeah, Texas is fine. Great value today. You're welcome, Mark. I own and operate a call center and only sell final expense. Do you think it's a good idea if I get my license, just run my own leads? They close 10 policies a day. Yeah, I, that's kind of the um, realization a lot of call centers realize. Like, I don't know how you guys make any money. But honestly, I'm sure some of you guys do. But the real money in this business is made on the, the sales side, not the lead generation side. And if you're good at generating leads, and you, you're probably going to be pretty good at closing them, and why not take that process in for yourself and now realize the amount of huge money the, the carriers pay? So I think it's a good idea to consider uh, insourcing the sales side so that you can realize both ends of the deal. And the nice thing is you're gener generating the leads at cost, not at you know retail. So there's extra savings there. Hey, Dave, how do you handle the conversations after a seminar at a HUD facility? I mean, do you plan of... Uh, do you plan of, on following the script or is it more a case, case by case basis? Um, yeah. Okay. So if I do my seminar and then I'm talking to prospects, Marty, like how do I handle it? It's definitely a different presentation than what we did. You know, by the time you talk to them, it's like a little chit chat. Why am I here? What can I do for you? They already kind of know who you are and develop trust and that kind of sticky until you get to the presentation. The presentation, stage three, stage four is the same for the most part. Stage two is kind of the same. The rapport building stage is kind of truncated though, for sure. So just because you've just pitched them and they like you and they know what you're about while you're there. Karen, I just jumped back on after a call. Do you have any good lead sources for annuity leads? Does your agent that does a lot of annuity business use a particular lead source. We really just teach agents to cross sell existing final expense leads, Medicare leads in their book of business. That's the issue with annuity is if you've ever investigated the annuity business to get leads, like most of them are like three, four, five hundred dollars uh, for digital leads where they're actually still like shopping and comparing you amongst others. It's a different business model. There's not a lot of middle ground on leads. It's very expensive to acquire them, although obviously the, the outcome could be very good. Um, so no, we really don't. For telesales agents, do you recommend having a goal of so many presentations per day? Yeah, well, I like to look at telesales agents as talk time. I want you to have talk time somewhere around eight hours. You don't really need to be doing anything or worrying about anything than making sure that you're working as much as possible talking to people and pitching them, okay? Some days you'll have a lot of pitches, some days you'll have a little. Some days everybody picks up the phone, some days nobody picks up the phone. But it all starts with your outbound effort to dial the number. So from the time that you start to the time that you're finished, you need to be dialing and talking to people. Because if you do enough of that, eventually you'll run across somebody who's interested. So keep it, your, I think keep your focus more on just getting the dials in and, and using your time effectively, dialing as much as humanly possible. Is it okay to door knock to age leads? Absolutely is. Um, just treat them exactly the same like they're fresh and you won't have any problems whatsoever with the um, outcome of them. Don't show them that the date on their, don't mention their age as being, you know, years younger than they are now. That might be a problem. Uh, but um, definitely use them just like you would. Treat them like they're a fresh lead. Thank you, uh, no name. How's the Florida market for face-to-face? -face? Um, fine. I think it's fine. I prefer Central Florida. West Florida and the Panhandle and kind of upstate uh, Florida to the southeast. Um, that's a tougher market for sure. I've had agents for years tell me kind of the Miami Boca area is tough, you know. So it's just lots of lots of gated communities, more moneyed seniors, you know, not necessarily low income. You're welcome, Marty. May for telesales with voice signature. To have continuous coverage, can payment be collected the same day? Yes, you can, but the problem is, May, if you collect and insist on collecting money today, you will miss out on deals. We did a training 
uh, on our on our training site if you want to check it out with uh, Melissa Barrett. If you go look for her um, her call she did, um, this the second part. She had rebuttaled like 15, 20 dot times on the close and the client was not budging. And the point that she budged was when she said, hey, we don't have to take the money today. Let's just set it up for next month when you get your social security check. And then she said, okay, that sounds fine. So it's going to be a sticky point if you if you force them to collect today. I don't teach agents to collect money up front on the beginning of a sales presentation uh, or at the close. I, it's a buy now, pay later business. I want to get them approved, but not worrying about the money. Will they not be covered until the money's collected? Sure, but you will run across people who won't take the deal because they just don't have the money or their fear of not having the money to pay it. And plus, you need to time the premium to when they actually get their money every month. Not, you know, uh, like you said on the 19th, you know, days after their check hits on the 3rd. It's, that's going to cause a lot of problems in the future. I am licensed with other company. Hey, Janice, how can you join you on Medicare? DavidDeFord.com forward slash start. Um, actually, forward slash FAQ. Learn about Medicare. We do accept agents that do Medicare with us, but life insurance elsewhere. If you like what you see, I do Q&A calls Mondays and Wednesdays, and you're welcome to join those. And then we'll show you how to join. Uh, and all the subsequent payments be drafted on the Social Security date. So the problem with that, I see what you're saying now. If you take money today and then draft it on the 3rd, well, that's effectively two weeks later. And what a lot of people will think is, why are, there, why are they taking two payments out in two weeks? It's going to make a lot of people angry. And the problem becomes like they start to get paranoid, especially if you're in like a, a telesales position, but definitely face-to-face -to -face too where if you take their money frequently or more frequently than expected, they're going to like get into a tizzy and think that this is some kind of scam operation. I can tell you this, guys. It's just better if you just approve them today and set up the draft to come out on their next payment date because it avoids that whole, you double drafted me um, uh, act, uh, uh, you know, thing uh, and, and avoids the potential for a risk that the policy may lapse. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, you mentioned scheduling one day out. So in theory, a six day week, call three days and run three days. Yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. So sit down Monday, call for Tuesday, sit down Wednesday, call for Thursday. And by the time you get to the last half of Thursday and the Friday and the Saturday, you're usually at the bottom of your lead. So expect to do more door knocks those days, uh, because a lot of those leads that haven't answered, won't answered, and they're going to be kind of running out of leads. So there's going to be more door knocks on half of Thursday and definitely on Saturday. Okay. Yeah, definitely a better strategy just to pay later. That's how our clients are. I mean, think about the car sales place. You know, buy now, pay later. That's how they, our people operate. You might as well play to their preconceived, you know, way that they do money. How do you feel about having an appointment setter? Really good. It is a great strategy to have a couple of references. MondayMorningMichelles.com. Check them out. If you put it into YouTube, you'll see the interview I did with them. I trained Michelle back in 2014. She's got a great operation now of appointment setters. They do a good job. Also go to upwork.com. If you go to davidafordcom forward slash appointment hyphen setters, uh, I've got a great resource on how to find people on Upwork and how to kind of some tips to recruit the better opportunities out there. I think it's best to hire your own person and train them. Um, ultimately, if you're looking for the best, and you can find people on Upwork that are good telemarketers that would love to work warm leads and that are reasonably priced, um, offshored and onshored. Thank you, Clint. Appreciate it. Which companies sell age leads? I don't know of any direct mail vendors that do that aren't associated with an IMO. Um, if they weren't, I'd love to buy their leads, uh, but unfortunately I don't. My concern is if they die tomorrow in 820, they don't have coverage. My concern is that if, if they take money twice, that they'll cancel their policy. So <laughs> we're running up against two different issues. And for me personally, I think that the payment issue after doing this business for 10 plus years is the bigger issue. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. Um, it's just that you will probably cause more problems to happen on par if you insist to take the money up front. Um, but it, you want to, you can. I just don't think it's a wiser strategy. That's my personal opinion. Uh, let's see here. I had that happen, and that's where I learned to draft later. Thank you, Kelly. Do you have any suggestions for a hybrid agent? Don't be a hybrid agent. Um, that's what I would say. Pick your poison. Are you either going to be all in on face-to-face -face or you're going to be all in on telesales? And this is specifically for final expense. If you're new to this business, 
uh, new to anything in life, if you want to do well and perform well, you've got to focus. You've got to put blinders on and say no to everything except this one thing that you say yes to, and you've got to consistently do that. And part of that is also making sure that you pick a strategy and follow it, not just one product, but one approach. So I'm not a fan of the hybrid approach. I think it weakens your capability on the phone and in person to book appointments and to deal with objections. It's two different skill sets. A lot of it's similar, but a lot of it's different. I think it's better just to go all in on one or the other and kind of just not feel like you can hybridize. You kind of give yourself excuses to not follow the script to its full effectiveness if you're hybridization. Like, oh, he didn't want to see me. He objected to me coming over the phone, so I pitched it over the phone. Well, that wasn't really a true objection to a presentation. That was just kind of a knee-jerk objection, and you, you didn't deal with it the right way. So, and you gave yourself a, a lower opportunity uh, to, to close the person over the phone than you had in person. Uh, so that's my kind of opinion on it. I don't like the hybrid stuff. I think it's just, it's it's what people want to hear, not what they should hear. You know, hey, you can join my MO. You can sell everything. and You can do both. You can do anything you want to. Well, yeah, it sounds good. But I, I want to know what works, not what sounds good. There's a difference. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I'm only telesales though. I don't know what you're referencing though. Can't be in the field. I need reputable telesales leads. Okay. Uh, digital leads can be good. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to wrap it up there. I hope you enjoyed today's outstanding monumental training uh, and absorbed all of this. Obviously, there's lots of information, lots that we covered, lots that you probably have forgotten, but that's why this is easily accessible. It's recorded after all. And I will be time stamping this so you can go back, look at the information, and review over and over again. I do hope that you take this business and this training that we have today and actually put it into uh, effect. Uh, this is the exact training that I train my agents on in the Ford Insurance Group. There's nothing different of what I taught today. This is what works. This is what gets results. And all you have to do now is just actually put it into action. Uh, I don't mind you, of course, you can do what you want to, but um, you don't need any other strategy besides what it is that we're talking about today. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do business and they all work. You just need one way that's proven to work. Um, and this is it. Uh, this is the exact thing I've done to a certain extent. I've certainly modified some of this myself as I have improved personally and have observed others to help them grow and get better. And this is the culmination of a decade plus year of work, years of work as a personal agent and uh, nearly a decade's worth of work training and coaching agents face-to-face, -face, thousands upon thousands now. And I hope you take this and use it and uh, get the best life you can out of it. There's a lot of people out there that need your help. And with the sales and marketing strategy, you really can help a lot of people and help yourself and get good results. Thank you very much, y'all. I will be in Dallas on September 23rd at our Elite Agent Summit. You can learn more about that at EliteAgentSummit.com. Um, also, if you want the scripts and any of the resources we have, go to davidduford.com forward slash scripts to download those. If you can't access them, go to davidduford.com forward slash contacts. I'll get to you and send it out to you as well. Thank you, Jennifer, Dion, Guided Plans, Jay, all of you. Appreciate you so much for your nice words and thing. Great, great things. I appreciate that very, very much. Um, and um, if I can do anything else for you, please reach out. If you want to learn more about joining my agency, davidduford.com forward slash FAQ. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate it. You got out of yard work. Good for you. And if you're watching this recording, post your questions in the uh, comment section. I will personally answer them. Y'all have a good rest of your weekend, and we'll see you around. See ya.